ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Hello everyone and welcome to another day of the ESL SCT Masters Regionals for the spring season. And we're already joined by Demi today as we get it going for week two of Asia and Europe. Dan, how are we feeling, mate? I'm good, you know. I, I mean, like, when we get to this stage where it's like, players are making it through, players are potentially getting knocked out as well. I just think StarCraft 2, it becomes so intense, doesn't it? And mm -hmm. yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, no, it's going to be a lot of fun. And of course, here today we're joined by our beautiful sponsors, which are Blizzard Entertainment, Monster Energy, United States Air Force, and ESL Shop. And of course, this whole thing is a big build-up to the offline event in Dallas this time around. That's going to be happening end of May, start of June. You can get your tickets right now if you want to be there at dreamhack.com forward slash Dallas forward slash tickets. You get 15% off with the code StarCraft. The American events are usually an absolute blast, so make sure you get your ticket now. Get there for the event. It should be a whole lot of fun. What's also going to be a whole lot of fun is today's games. We're starting off in Asia, Ben. It's round three. We've got a couple people at 2-0, a couple people at 0-2, and, and a whole bunch of players are going to be playing today at 1-1. One and one. This Asia bracket has been as intense as ever. Yeah, absolutely. Like, some of the names today. Uh, so the first match is XY versus Nanami. Nanami was kind of a little bit of a surprise last season, or maybe the season before. I remember he ended up taking a series off somebody like Coffee, and like, <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that name. Uh, but no, he, he ended up like kind of surprising a little bit, but then, you know, with the surprise, it was like, ah, okay, things are back to normal. But yeah, the fact that he's one woman in this group, he beat Jim 2-0, and Jim's actually a really solid Protoss in this region. XY, a Terran? I mean, XY is a doable opponent for him, but he's also a veteran of this region, I feel. Yeah, no, this is a, a very good point, right, where XY is very, very good. You've seen him play for a very long time at this point. It's going to be kind of fascinating to see just how it goes and see how it goes down for Nanami, who absolutely is going to be in my eyes. Like, in my head, the underdog, but in terms of performance, may actually be the favorite. Uh, we'll see what happens as we kick this off into TVP action to start the day. It's going to be four matches from Asia today. We'll look at the full schedule exactly a bit later on. But four matches from Asia and then uh, eight best of threes from Europe. And again, I think everything in Asia are the matches at one and one. So nobody makes playoffs today. No one gets eliminated today. That's going to save that for tomorrow. Um, but still, obviously, a whole bunch of fun games coming up. And it's going to start right here as we dive on into map number one. But we are going to be in the bottom left-hand corner with the Red Terran player representing Invictus Gaming. It is XY. And spawning over in the top right, bit of a cheeky, cheeky Protoss over here. The blue player, it is Nanami. Now, I don't have your fancy overlay on Wardy. What team is he playing for right now? He's on the Mystery Gaming. It's uh, we're, we're just coming up to WTL season, so everyone's kind of so been like doing Shin some... and stuff. Yeah, I, don't, I think Shin's still. Oh, no, no, I think Shin, Shin, joined... Shin joined Gaming. Yeah, the Gladiators. No, was it Gladiators? Yeah, Gaming, Gla Gaming Gladiators. Yeah. Yeah. So Shin joined them. Really but, good uh... Dota team that team has. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like to see people getting picked up by teams like that. Of course, still. But yeah, it's pre-WTL season, so everyone's like swapping teams. It's a good thing I have the overlay because, honestly, <laughs> I, I've lost track of who swapped what team. Especially teams like Mystery Gaming and some of the other like Chinese teams like SSLT or Starlight Twinkle. I feel like these guys swap players every six months. So it's always fun to see who ends up where for the upcoming season. Again, World Team League because that's typically what they're, uh, these teams are picking up players for. Absolutely, absolutely. All righty. So, so far... Pretty regular openings by both of them. Nanami hasn't gone for a probe scout straight across the map. Now, if I'm the Terran player, I'm like, all right, this guy, this guy's a greedy, greedy sod. But Nanami, he's just scouted around the map for proxies. So fully aware that Terran can do some cheeky stuff. And we've seen a lot of cheek from Terrans recently with proxies on the map. But probe eventually comes up, gets to see exactly what's going down, gets to see the Marine as well, and the reactor, I do believe, if I just check from his vision. Oh, no, no, didn't get to just see the reactor, so at least gets to know that it is indeed a marine opening so it doesn't have to worry about that pesky little reaper early on yeah no reaper just means that i mean he's got a reaper wall anyways but it can just mean that you can send units across the map as well right without the reaper coming back over you don't perhaps need a battery in the mineral line sometimes they do that if they want to send their units across so yeah it's just that marine into the reactor this of course does speed up the kind of the, the gas income because you don't have the money spent on the reaper so you can go reactor factory pretty quickly I thought that was going to be the case for XY. He actually waxes down a third CC immediately. So he's going to float a bit of gas here. 
but have a super quick economy set up with that third command center coming into place. And meanwhile, we're seeing an army setting up that Twilight Council. This is actually very cool. Like this is this is a build that I think one of the first players I saw doing things like this was Inno. Uh, innovation that is mm. so a, a real blast from the past i know it's one of those builds that terrans have in their arsenal that they can throw out and depending on what he follows up with it can be just like i'm gonna stick on like 50 SCVs and do a hey i do have a third but it's gonna be a massive pressure attack or obviously a big old macro game and right now nanami totally blind he's going for a blink opening so we'll be able to deal damage later on but XYXY, this is a big investment. Like, he, he wants to be left alone for as long as possible for this to pay off. Yeah, he just wants to play a very peaceful game. He's going to be going to barracks as well, right? So there's no immediate, like, factory unit to help you defend. This is really praying that you get to stim pack without being touched because there's a very good chance you die if this is some very committed 4 gate pressure. Robo's coming up, currently sitting on the two gateways here of Nanami. So we'll see just how many gates we add on. Are we going to add the extra two? No, we're going to drop down the third Nexus, which is exactly what XY wants. He's going to get away with this greed. The stalk pressure that comes, if any comes at all, it's going to be extremely light, very manageable by a bunker and a couple of bio units. This is honestly looking pretty good for XY. He's getting the opening that he wants here. He, he certainly is. And he's getting an engineering bay as well before the factory and whatnot. So we're going to probably start off that plus one weapons very quickly as well. And with that third being positioned all the way over there, Wardy, I would not be surprised if he just floats that bad boy six on over. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that would be super cheeky. It would be also be crazy just because blink, you can go between the minerals and stuff. So maybe a bit too risque. But if you don't see, you know, the minerals are mined out, like, why would you ever go on over there? But this scout from Nanami will end up happening now that he has an observer out on the map. And he will finally get to know what he's up against if he scouts correctly. Yeah, the OBS has the potential to give him all the information here, but too late to really utilize that information in any sort of useful way. You know, he's adding on extra gateways now, but the third's already built. Five Stalkers are still sat at home. By the time he gets here and realizes what's up, then sends Stalkers across the map. We're talking about Stim being finished, so the, the chance of putting any pressure on at all really is gone already. He's going to clean out the Watchtower as XY, hold that with one Marine and otherwise pull back. And yeah, the OBS in the main base is about to get full confirmation of what's going on here. Third CC is scouted. So yeah, Nanami knows, but he's going to be kicking himself a little bit because his build has done nothing to pressure this, nothing to do anything about it. And that Marine <laughs> is just chilling on the line of sight blocker. And these Stalkers are having a bad time. Finally, we get the cleanup. <laughs> you know, I think I think it was watching this Chinese region last time where it was one of the first times I saw people using the Cyclones, yeah. putting it in that gas and being such a nuisance. But yeah, Nanami is now fully aware of what his opponent's doing. And Nanami also revealed Blink, but I mean, that's not too much a surprise. XY getting a little bit of scouting info here, just being like, all right, all right, what's exactly going on here? Actually, that Marine has made it incredibly deep over here. Yeah, he just walks straight into the main base. He's going to get a good bit of scouting done. And uh, yeah, gets shot down by a stalker. He's like, okay, well, nothing looks too weird. I think he saw a good chunk of the gateways, right? So you're getting that information of, hey, look, you know, there's gateways coming up. It looks like he's going to stick very much to the gateway army for the moment as well. So just finding that out is obviously pretty neat. As we do have the uh, well, stalkers here firing up on this orbital. The rest of the bio coming over. And that orbital is going to get Ooh. through and push away. As a few stalkers going to go onto these SCVs. This was actually really nicely done by Nanami. Like, you could kind of see that he was waiting for this army to move out. He had all that vision with that observer over there. Now, XY does react fairly quickly. Did he get the observer as well? Mm -hmm. I think that's what Mappa was yeah. showing us here. So, Stalker and Observer didn't go as well as it could have gone for Nanami. But I tell you what, XY, he's going to be happy with this situation. And Nanami, given that he feels like, hey, you know, macro-wise, like he made a big investment, I'm going to have to leapfrog him here. Takes a very fast fourth here in a nice location. But XY, he's on the map with two medevacs, I believe. Fully loaded over there. Yep, sending them up that right-hand side. There is a fourth base building here, but there's no protection around it or near it. So that fourth is looking like it's going to be in a bunch of trouble. Or you fly past the 4th and head into the main base, which is probably a bit greedy if you just see the 4th building right now. I don't want to hate just the unload there and deal some damage to it. He's actually going to float by, so he's going to go straight in towards the main. And, well, the warping comes in over here. There is that single pylon powering 4 gates and the forge. It's a beautiful target, Ben. Because if you get rid of that, you get rid of so much of the production. We're also trying to attack in at the front. So we actually traded with a couple of zealots there already. And in the main base, XY is still trading decently too. The warpings have not been enough so far. 
You know, if he knew about that forge being just seconds away from finishing that plus one armor, he'd have probably gone for it, you know. It was such a valuable target, like you mentioned, but so far, damage being done on both sides. There was a warp prism on the other side as well, dealing a little bit of counter SCV damage. But I feel that this is where the Terran would like the game. Like the Protoss, low tech. The Terran, he's been on the map, he's got damage done. Medivac's behind the base as well. It's just a gnarly spot to be in now. That wall prism, it's not done just yet. We'll come back again. And these zealots are greeted by a pretty damn decent block of bio here. But Vikings will be out shortly. Yep. No, I mean, Vikings uh, Ghost as well, right? We're starting to tech up big time here. So we're going to be able to kind of get into all of the tech that we need to play in the future. This is what typically happens when the Terran reaches three bases. They start thinking about a fourth, but they also get their double tech units on the way. Ghost Vikings, you get that up and running. That's what you need to play the longer game with here. So that's the general goal. This is a nice catch. You get both those medivacs. Now the drop in the top right is going to come back into the main. It's going to force the probes to pull one more time. And... We have a full medivac that is not unloaded there, but looks as though XY will leave before he fixes that. As he still also has a few units on the right side. XY doing a lot of what kind of I expect XY to do, which is to be all over the map, to be very busy, just be kind of a, a busy, active player. That's the one thing I think he really excels at. That alongside some of his crazy builds. Well, this build wasn't so crazy, but it does give him a lot of economy to then, like I say, throw units around the map as he gets a few probes here. It is cleaned up, but still just keeping this game at uh, level status. Yeah, tech-wise, Nami is moving into Colossus here, and he's still pumping out four probes at a time. Like, upgrade-wise, he's hitting that plus one attack after hitting plus one armor already. Gonna go for a second forge as well, so he's gearing on up. And XY on his side of things, I don't see, like, an armory down. He does have a Ghost Academy, I believe, so he is ready to add mm -hmm. some tech of his own, but... It really feels like Nanami is now the one that wants to survive and stabilize a little bit, just so XY doesn't kind of bulldoze him over. But XY, he, he's got a really big window here where he can get a lot of damage done. Oh, absolutely. He is, uh, his army supply is looking good, and he's got his army coming through to the center. His armory very late. Again, you do typically decide to skip upgrades for a while to get Vikings to get ghosts. I think that's his first ghost coming up, right? So if he does get those ghosts out and then goes, I kind of like the timing of this. It would be before 2-2 of his opponent, before those upgrades kick in. So that would be nice, although he does get his fourth base cancelled. And moves like that might just slow XY down, which is exactly what Nanami wants. Nanami wants time, upgrades, you know, more tech units. Those are the things that are going to benefit him in a big way. Because he's actually going to push and hold the center of the map after pushing his opponent back a little. Yeah, I mean, one of the best defenses is a good offense, isn't it? And that's where he's keeping XY on the other side of the map. And... Dealing damage here, there, and everywhere. Resources lost have also. It's kind of starting to level out a little bit. Nice focus fire on these Sorkers. Trying to keep that medevac very alive. And he does just that, but not for too long. And XY's main army is on the other side of the map. Like, he has to go, go, go. Those two, too. It's very close to getting going. Yep. I mean, once those upgrades are done, you, you would imagine an army's ready to take a bigger fight because by then he's had all this splash damage build up. He's still adding another Colossus. Potential to obviously just start building disruptors at some point too and just really kind of, you know, fan out this army in terms of options within it, in terms of the tech available. Obviously having disruptors and Colossi, just two different ways to deal splash damage is generally a nice uh, way of playing it. As I see those Colossi going to work right now. Well, the Vikings can get rid of the Colossi quickly, Ben. The Stalker model on the ground is doing pretty darn well. The Bioforce was getting chipped away, but with the Vikings landing, it's going to get a little bit more intriguing because now we have a bit more force to push with, and XY is going to be able to keep coming forwards for at least a couple moments. I mean, 2-2 literally finishes as that fight goes off, right? I mean, plus two armor still not online yet, but Nanami's really throwing everything here, and those Stalkers all absolutely battered and bruised, and these Vikings are actually incredibly decent against Stalkers in this situation. Gold base has been absolutely blasted with probes that are on the wrong side of the mural field, but Nanami, if he can hold here, he's actually going to be looking quite fresh, and it looks like he is. No fourth base on the go for XY. He's even going to chase him down here, taking a sixth base behind this as well. Yeah, I really think the Nami was like, oh yeah, most of this is just Vikings, so if I just bring my Stalkers in and have a few Zelda tank, this should get cleaned up no problem. It just took a little while, but he did get there in the end. He wasn't wrong in thinking he was very close to shutting down this army and kind of chasing it off, and now he gets rid of a couple more units before these Stalkers back away, and like you say, the economy behind this is huge. Taking another base, the Terran is only just established base number four that's only just now building into a planetary, so... You've not been mining off this base this entire time, so Nanami's economy has been absolutely pristine in comparison to XY's. And now he's going to come over here, knock a sensor tower down, and as he continues to tech up, Nanami, I think, is very well set for the future. Don't mind him taking a moment here, just back off. He's got a 20 worker leave, let that economy sink in. 
build a few units with it, and then go with the larger army a minute or two down the line. You know, when you're 12 minutes into a game and you see six probes in production on the production tab, and he's already at 89 probes here, Wardy. 3-3 three, three on the way, getting the disruptors out as well. I mean, he's only on one rover at this point and 10 gateways. I, I definitely feel like his production, his infrastructure can go up a little bit, and second robo is about to be done now. But I tell you what, XY, this is not a position you want to find yourself in. Like, 95 probes. He's still making probes here, Wardy. This is one rich, <laughs> rich fella. I mean, he's going to be able to throw units, you know, in every direction at XY very soon. With that amount of probes, yeah, okay, you can't have one massive standing army. But if you just fight in so many places, it's so tough for the Terran to keep up with that. And, of course, you can trade slightly inefficiently, too, because you'll have the money to rebuild it. As long as at some point you can take on the big Terran army, if it shows up on your front doorstep, if it makes a larger push, that's the only challenge that an army might face. But I honestly don't think XY is ever going to get to that point. I think the army is going to be starting to fight right now. As he maxes out, he's going to have disruptors. He's got potential to counterattack in different places because he's just got so much of the map under his control. He's opening rocks and so on, so he has an easier time of it as well. It does look pretty darn good for Nanami, and all the trouble is on the shoulders of XY right now. Yeah, XY, he's got upgrades incoming here, lots of Marauders in production as well, but even if all those units were to come out right away, dealing with this Protoss army is tricky. Just split up into two little squads here, and honestly, the defense so far from him, nice, but Nanami, he's not just about that big fight on the map, he's constantly doing Zealot run bys and really, really stretching XY thin. Yep, and, that, and that's the big part of it, right? That these zealots can just go and spread out and hit one base and pull the Terran around and all of that goodness as the bio comes through, grabs a couple more zealots. We'll be mulling up this base on the bottom side as well, so we get that on the go. And, uh, well, unfortunately, there's still a couple of zealots here, so damage is still being dealt. And XY, he's handling it then, but again, it's going to come at a big cost as these disruptors do actually get to land as well, so that works out. And again, it's just so difficult for XY to ever truly afford to stay in this game as the planter nearly went down we blinked back it didn't actually die because of the scv repair now it's too late to go for it apparently but maybe like to see some disruptors just to finish the planetary off but i mean i can't criticize nami because his position is still very very good i mean xy's holding on but i wouldn't say he's really better in his position and looking to be okay anytime soon you know what's very surprising about this game? The fact that Nanami has been, has oh, like only just added a fifth gas. Mm. I, I think on that very far right base, I see a lot of these bases without gas. Okay, okay, starting to add on a few more. He's got that rich gas at the top as well, actually, come to think of it. So yeah, lots of minerals to spend. Dark Shrine will be finishing up soon. XY's holding on like a trooper though. It feels like even though he's on 44 SVs versus 107 probes, he is still fighting. Yeah, I mean, again, it's the question of Nanami, again, being able to take a bigger fight, being able to take a fight that really dents into the army of XY, because XY will have that larger army at any point in time, can maybe trade better. That's why I would like to see Nanami do more of this kind of attack to the left, so that's on the right-hand side. But that said as well, maybe just taking one bigger fight and looking for those disruptor shots could be great. He's also going to have DTs now, so it's another good way to harass, it's another good way to pull his opponent about and really just stretch this Terran player thin, even though he's only on the four bases, it's not a lot to defend. No, I mean, like, Nanami's army is actually, in fact, let's have a look. It's actually smaller in value, which is kind of funny to think about. Like, the way that he's playing right now, it's it's Zerg-esque. It's like that first style that Hero returned with, where it's like PVZ, just gateway-centric, just mass amount of probes. 4.8k, 4.9k minerals a minute here. Like, you cannot spend that. Yeah, <laughs> the mineral income is actually ridiculous. You can make 50 zealots a minute. Isn't that a bit silly? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, he, he can literally make 100 supply of zealots per minute with, with the amount of income. And he's 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 expanded even more here. He, like, like, this is absolutely wild. I think 107 workers might actually be too many. When he was on, like, 90-something, I was like, okay, I can see it. But 107 might be a step too far as these stalkers... It's going to go through. Disruptor Shot is going to scare this army into a split. And we are getting surrounded, but the Disruptors will deal with that. Zealot's actually going to busy that surround. So actually, pretty darn good fight here for an army. Maybe one that wins him this game as he sits at this ramp. And XY will say it as well. He will say, GG, this one is done. And an army is going to end up with the first game of the day after a little bit of effort to get there, Ben. But uh, we did get there eventually.
that's one of those games where you know first, first game of the day first match of the day you're like you know what let's see let's let's flex our macro uh, button here and he, he absolutely did that didn't he very very yes. cool play out of him very unnecessary it's also one of those things where if i'm the terran player and you know game didn't start off too badly i actually felt xy's opening and stuff was definitely good for him and even the first drop did good damage but when you press that rewind button at the end there, because that's what all players will do, and you see, what? He has 8k minerals in the bank? You're like, all right, that was uh, way worse than I thought. Yeah, no, absolutely. That was one of those situations where you're just like, you kind of think you're holding on, you're like, I haven't taken good enough trades. Maybe eventually I get a fight that can really send this home and, you know, bring me truly back into it. And it's like, no, actually, that ain't going to happen, by the way. <laughs> so... Yeah, something a little bit different there, unless we get ready for uh, the next game very shortly. Our next uh, game number two, as soon as these guys get it hosted up, so a moment or so, we'll get that on the, the way. I'm on the chat channel right now. Oh, I was just accepting a friend you invite from Mapu. Lovely. So may maybe something went a little awry, but... Mapu's on the case immediately. The eyes, the hawk of esports, you know. All right, well, we'll, uh, we'll take a couple moments to figure this out, guys. Um, you usually just get to go nice and quickly and smoothly, but I'll try and figure out if there's anything going on. I'll send a couple messages, see what's going on. Yeah, I got the whole, uh, you do not have permission. Yeah. For this channel, which, uh... I'll have you know, I do have permission. I'm I'm here right now, live on stream to do it. I know, that's what I thought, man. I, <laughs> we've been in this channel all week. Right, right, <laughs> we're going to invite, so... Uh, can't be too much of a problem, then. No, no, and I guess we can talk a little bit about uh, the maps today. Like, it will be Oceanborn coming up here. So, very nice to see, like, a lot of these... Uh, I, I almost want to say old-school maps at this point, but not quite old-school, just the maps that we've been playing on long some time here and this is like a good test this shows me that both these guys don't really want to divvy about in the uh the mm. new news because <laughs> you don't know what quite people are capable of just yet uh, especially if people have been keeping their practice very very private but yeah it will be fun no the the new maps are uh, actually very fun as well like um when we do get to see the new ones it's like oh cool like you're doing a bit of this you're doing a bit of that Obviously, these guys right now are just ocean-born, though. It's like, okay, guys, play the most standard map you can. Love that. <laughs> yeah, I, I I, mean, I, I do think Nanami has been quite good. And I, I, I almost want to go check who we did defeat last season. Because I think it was, like, one of the big dog Terrans where he got himself a nice little sitting in the tournament. Mm -hmm. But we will get the map on the go right away. Do you get a few spikes on this server, by the way, when you're yeah, watching the games? Yeah, all the time, mate. Asia oh, is, all right, all right. Uh, yeah, Korea server is a little bit funky. Like, some days your internet can be fine and your connection, to, even, like, map to map, it can change sometimes to being, like, super spiky to just, like, completely fine. Usually it doesn't affect the players, though. It's just... That's good. Yeah, it's, it's been a thing for a while. It's uh, a little frustrating, but not much you can do about it. Absolutely. All right, give me one right, sec, see. and I'll take a single Oh, game. okay. I uh, had a little fight with my uh, hotkeys, so I'm trying to uh, <laughs> refix Did you win? them. Um, I think I fixed it. Basically, whenever I pressed control earlier, for some reason, it would take us in onto the in-game screen. So like the pre-show was on, or, like the countdown, and then suddenly it was like in-game, and I was like, ah, <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> but uh, so that I didn't have it set up. I was just trying to fix it again for now because otherwise I'm going to forget to take us in-game at some point, and that's not going to be good. So, all right, we are good now though. So let's get this underway. As so we are going to start off in the top left with Mystery Gaming's Blue Protoss, who takes the first game of the series. It is Nanami. And spawning over in the bottom right hand side as the red turn, it is XYXY. I'm always one of these guys that I, even though I know APM is a fairly irrelevant metric at this point with all the rapid fire and stuff, XY has always been a slower, methodical player. Like he's always been sat around like the 180, 160 APM mark, whereas that whole last game, Nanami was at like 350 plus, which. If I just think about how they both played that game, like once it got bigger and later, Nanami just kind of sailed, right? Whereas XY was a bit like, all right, gonna hold on here. Like I'll try and defend this, like he micro totally fine and what have you, but 
when these drops got a little bit chaotic, it was like, all right, all right, okay, let's slow things down. Whereas that's where Nanami really, really took off. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's very true. And Nanami, once he got going, really, I mean, he obviously wanted to play this very aggro, like loads of units done. I feel like in a way it kind of got met by that fast third to CC at first. He was like, huh, you've actually got enough economy to match me early. So then he kind of slowed it down a bit. But like he said, he never really took a lot of gas. So he kind of tech, but still with the intention of not really playing that many tech units and mostly just massing gateway forces. And eventually XY maybe just stuck around too long in a fight, because I think that fight where he lost and got cleaned up and pushed back, he actually kind of won at first. He just needed to get the heck away because the sheer number of reinforcements available for his opponent was always going to make that a miserable affair. And uh, that's kind of what came out to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Like the first 50% of that game, it was kind of like on XY to just kind of win it out, right? Whereas yeah. after that, you're, you're absolutely right. That that fight where Nanami held, and it was kind of like just about holding, but then it was like, uh, it was all about him, really. And this game, we have a very different opening from XYXY. It was a barracks first, a Reaper. So totally different to the previous game, not even remotely as greedy here. Uh, very safe, actually, with a uh, second CC on the high ground. Yeah, that's going to be... Uh... A much more kind of, I mean, this is almost the more standard way of playing right now. A lot of Terrans go on high ground CC. They do not want to deal with the early units of the Protoss player. And uh, getting a Cyclone out and then kind of playing from there. Obviously, a Medivac is an option here because then you can kind of take a few Marines and a Cyclone across and be aggressive. Um, sometimes you get the tanks out early and we've been seeing some of those tank pushes alongside Liberators. Especially in the Asia region, we've been seeing a lot of that aggression kind of coming through. And XY was pretty fond of that the other day as well, where he'd be playing kind of a Marine tank push. Liberator at the same time, trying to get some value with an early aggression. He's going to start out here with the Medivac, like I mentioned. Potentially get across the map in general is good. And the Siege tank is good to follow. Yeah, and it's a Medivac without mines. So I think you're onto something that it will be just... A, a blob of power rather than like the, the cheeky shenanigans doing a finesse drop here and there it's it goes in waves doesn't it pvt where it's like the the protosses they'll be like more stalker colossus centric as the widow mine counts grow high then the terrans they're like you know what let's go to more tanks in the future and then that deals with that and then it's charge lots again and then it's the widow mine era like it's uh very very back and forth actually yeah uh, this matchup's fun there's a lot of uh, fun stuff that can happen as you do have the uh, boost across on the left-hand side of the map. About to hit the natural because it's medevac, so we'll try and get in here for a couple of probes of damage, and you do something good here. There's Libre on the way. You get that marine tank push coming after, and there's just a lot of potential. You get one probe. Obviously, lost mine time is nice. But, oh. I mean, first of all, I was going to say the probes went back too early, but then the medevac took a big hit. I was waiting to see if it died, but obviously it did not. It got away. That's good for XY, because he's going to need everything possible if he wants this push to be a success. Although it doesn't look like he's going to be that committed to it. He's just going to drop the third CC down at the front. How funny. Because, I mean, like, his tech on his units, there's there's no barracks with a tech lab. So, like, the commitment here to the amount of units he's pumping out is pretty damn high. Very often, I mean, I think every Terran player has watched a lot of Big Gabe stream at some point. Very often it's like, you know what, three barracks without the uh, tech labs get the units out, get the push going, and you can deal a lot of damage. It's obviously a lot better against Stargate openings, and maybe that's what XY is thinking here. Like, okay, okay, I'm against Blink again. Let's just get a higher tank count, go Maru style in the GSL, and let's see where we end up. Yeah, super tank heavy and just kind of playing that through. Use it defensively to take your third base. It's obviously scary as well, because, you know, I guess you've seen the third base here as an army, but there's always that potential of, hey, if these guys just get across the map and get sieged, it's always going to be something that's difficult to dislodge. So you've got to always be respecting this. He's going to stop an immortal off the robo right now, so he is going to get as many defensive Ooh. units as possible as this Liberator sets up in the side. Now, the Stalker's going to start fighting this, but these are Stalkers which are going to take a few hits, and they do have Blink. We do not Blink away initially. There we go. This time around, we do get away. So one Stalker goes down for the Lib. It keeps a few stalkers back, though, and it's allowed this push to come across the map. Do you like how aggressive he's been with the fact he's got that third CC at home? I I, I, I do, but I'm also like, you know, it, it's forcing a lot out of an army. Maybe making units that he doesn't want to be making right now that he puts into economy, and he's stopping the pro production a little bit. I feel, I mean, four tanks with nothing but stalkers and no charge on the horizon. I actually think this is kind of scary. Yeah. 
No, that, that's true. You're right. Charge is a long way away, and it is only the Stalkers. They're going to have to try and blink on top of that. XY just continues to rally across to this. I mean, he's going to have such a late stim and everything, though, because he still hasn't added on anything in that regard. So he is going to be so far behind on upgrades, which almost makes it so that he does need to find something with this right now, which... Yeah, he's forced some more units to now. He's going to respond with a whole chunk of extra gates. So very soon, he's going to be spamming zealots. It feels like one well, the timer is XY. Like, if he doesn't go sooner and if he doesn't find some more damage right now, once charge is done and there's, like, eight gateways on the map, it's going to be tough for him to win a fight. It's going to be super tough. I mean, Nami's ahead in supply, and I mean, he jumps on these tanks as they're all in siege, but a big shot. Even the one immortal, Big Daddy coming in behind here to clean this on up, and I tell you what, that went about as bad as it could for XY. Very nicely handled by Nanami so far, and no stim for literally weeks at this point. I mean, Nanami, he's cruising. That is cool with the Immortal, man. It actually took the tank fire away, so two of the tanks were siege. They just turned on to the Immortals, so the Stalkers were able to pick them off before really taking any damage, the other two tanks then were repositioning. So you just didn't take any damage on the way and see, right, really worst case scenario for XY. Immediately Nanami comes across the map, and this is why I'm worried for XY, because suddenly all your tanks are gone. You do not have follow-up tech, because you don't have stim ready or anything just yet. This is a great moment for Nanami. If he had something like a prism right now, it would be incredible. Imagine just being able to warp in Zealot on the front line. He would just send it into this fight, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, like... The thing is, he had his observers back at home, or rather, at the army of XY. He had two of them, one in front, one behind, and that's probably why he could situate himself to get that immortal in the right position, do all the damage. He's taken a fifth base as well. I don't think he has any idea what kind of tech is going on, because if he knew that there's literally no stim on the way, I think he could have literally blinked into that natural, done a lot of damage, and XY would have been looking very, very bleak in this game. Yeah. Oh, you're, you're right, as... He could, have, he could have lost a lot before he had any real, real way to fight it. I mean, the tanks were over to the third base right now. The tank count's gotten back up. Now upgrades are finishing. His Bioforce becomes a lot more playable again. And Nami is already up to 90 workers, so uh, it's still building forward at times. So it looks as though he's once again going to really accelerate the work count beyond any need. Um, as, yeah, first base coming up, and it seems like he's just going to play the exact same style as he did last game. Yeah, it's, it's greedy, but it's also, like, fairly safe, you know? It's just the two-gate blink at third base, but the follow-up is so, so PVZ-esque, where it's, like, so many gateway units, not that much tech. And if you pay attention to his gas count as well, like, the assimilator count, he's literally on three. Like, and when you're at almost 100... Pro it's going to be at 100 probes again here, Wardy, and he's got three forges as well. This lad is cooking. Yeah, no, he, he kind of is, man. He's just going triple upgrades. He's going for a ton of probes, ton of units. And XY, I mean, getting his fourth base. One thing he never did last game, right, was really get the fourth base properly established. So maybe that's an adjustment XY can make if you can just get the fourth base up and play a lot of, you know, much slower game. But he doesn't necessarily need to push out so much because his opponent is just spamming basic units. Maybe that's XY's route to having a much better fight. By the time XY is maxed, I mean, which is not very far away, He's going to have a better army and a larger army because he's on so many less workers. That's why he could really do very well. Let's see how he deals with the Prism Harass because an army is ready to start kind of pushing around in different places. That Prism hit the natural just as he gets pushed out the front. Oh, bit of F2 though, coming back here. Maybe, <laughs> I mean, there's a pile on where his fourth base is meant to be. This, I mean, okay, that War Prism was a, a sad War Prism, uh, yeah. has to be said, but Nami is on six bases behind this. His army is significantly worse in a straight-up engagement, unless it can catch all these siege tanks on siege, but 31 zealots. His only tech units beyond Gateway are four observers. I think this might be an army getting a little bit carried away. I, I think he's doomed, mate. Honestly, like, this is not a good army. It was good last time because he found a fight to get overwhelming initially, but he did that via some of the splash units. This game, he's just only gone for this, but then he never really pressured because, well, XY's setup never really let him pressure, I guess. And and because of that, now XY is just maxed on 50 more army supply, and the army doesn't look like he has half a chance in this battle. I mean, he jumps on the tanks here, but there's just so much bio. I don't even know if we need the siege tanks. No, I mean, Nanami, he needs to buy time, trade, send these units in, deal economic damage, something to keep that army away, but XY... He has poshed himself in between the reinforcements here. Zealot's running in single file. I, th I think Nanami's kind of done this game, man. He was way too greedy here. 
I can only agree with you, mate. I just don't see what you do right now as an army at all. I mean, yeah, just way too greedy. I, I mean, honestly, you had the opportunity as well, right? Like you said, like if you just gone on the natural, you could have done so much. And from there, maybe he does enough to actually keep on just spamming units and getting to the same spot as last time. But yeah, he, this is obviously very clearly XY's game to take because he just has so oh. many units. I mean, Zell's coming from the sides, and it feels like it doesn't even matter. The tanks are targeting Stalkers. They're not friendly firing via hitting the Zealots. This base goes down, and this is going to be base after base from here on out. Yeah, I mean, even if, even if he could spend his entire bank right now, maybe then he could do it, but the gateway count is at 15, to be fair, which is pretty high. It's just... XY's army right now, it's solid, man. That is a solid Terran army. Granted, it's all getting a bit red, but Nanami just hasn't been able to trade even remotely efficiently. Look at that resources lost have, actually. It's, it's twice as effective here for the Terran player. Yeah, I mean, it's it's absolutely disgusting, right? 9.2k to 18.2k. The numbers are all about XY. He's traded great. His army's just been straight up better. And uh, this is just waiting for Nanami to obviously kind of roll over and die because... It doesn't matter how many zealots you open right now, it ain't going to be enough to suddenly kind of fight this Terran force. And obviously, again, base by base, you're just losing out. You're missing out on what was meant to be the economy that props you up throughout this and makes this style somewhat feasible. As uh, zealots charge in once again, there's a probe stress around on the left side that gets rid of a couple of tanks due to friendly fire. But again, it's just not enough, man. The bio force is able to fight anything and everything. And again, the warp bins just are not enough. They're not enough at all. And I mean, he's still got 2k in the bank, you know, and he's producing two extra Nexus right now as time's going on. He's a wild boy. He is a wild boy. But here, I feel like he set himself a challenge. Like, can I win with mass gateway units against a full-blown Terran army here? And the answer is uh, no. But and he, he figured it out the hard way. And I mean, he's still fighting, giving him a bit of credit here. But bio with medevacs against nothing but gateway, that is a recipe for disaster. Yep. No, oh, absolutely. It's, uh, I mean, you look at Dex Y, he's like, oh, I'm going to get ghosts and a fusion core. Like, man, bro, your army's already good enough. Never mind what it's going to do now. It's going to delete the Protoss twice over. So that part of it's really going to be getting a whole bunch better as well for X Y. I mean, there's just no wrong turn you can take at this point. He is pushing once again. This army of Nanami is absolutely lackluster. He's going to try and come in from two angles, but the Terran, I don't even think, needs to stir a step. He could just probably stand and fight it. He will put the work in, so step back. A force wheel comes in. Now he's like, okay, I'm done with this. I'm just going to stand and fight. He actually lives into the Medivax too. Okay, that's <laughs> why. You keep micro your heart out, buddy. This game really is his, and it really is Nanami just trying to... to I, I don't know why, what he thinks is going to suddenly change, though. <laughs> this, is, this is one of those moments where... You can imagine Twitch chat if there was an emote for Protoss Brain. Like, you know, they'd all be spamming it, like... Why didn't he tech up? Why, why, why? I, I really feel like he was kind of cruising a little bit, just feeling quite quite content with what he was doing. Totally uh, underestimating how good that Terran squad was going to be. But how different game one and game two looked. Like, because game one, I felt XY was in a better position early on. This game, I felt Nanami was in a better position early on. And then the pendulum just swung. Like, both yeah. ways. XY got a hold of it. He was like, you know what? My economy's better this game. I'm more set up. You gave me time to breathe here. I didn't do that very early push out when you're just hitting 2-2. Two -two. Instead, I just waited for you to do it. And by the time that he did it, it was awful. It was absolutely awful. Like, 100-odd probes with three gases. That is mental, Wardy. I, uh, I doubt we'll see him do that again, but never, never doubt the Protoss. <laughs> Never doubt the pros. It is interesting because so far Nanami's only played PvP in this event as well. He went through Hass and uh, Jim so far. So it's kind of interesting to see him now in kind of playing this PvT and just seeing the style of his, which is obviously kind of interesting and very, you know, a little bit different. Um, and it's kind of a question of can it really keep on working? It's going to be fine now going into Gold Nora. One final chance. I mean, surely he has to do something a bit different because it feels like XY figured out that portion of the game at the very least. Just sit back, build a massive bio, and then I can trade, trade, trade. Just don't get too aggressive too soon. I mean, even this game, his aggression early kind of put him in a rough spot. Potentially could have been really, really bad for him. So possibilities there, but I guess didn't turn out too badly in the end. Um, but yeah, I, I can only imagine that XY is kind of starting to really feel out and figure out this 100 plus probe style that Nanami's trying to pull off. Yeah, just just wait it out, 
let him meet the wall that you're going to produce and you deal with it. Uh, third map between these two will be Golden Aura. And remember, both these players are 1-1 in the group so far, so this could bring them to a qualifying match and the loser, obviously, to a uh, elimination. Uh, an elimination match. So it's a it's a big deal, but you're right. Like Nanami's been doing the same build so far. And granted, it's just two games that we've seen, but it's the two-gate, greedy third, greedy fourth, greedy fifth, greedy sixth. Um, and yeah, XY, as long as he doesn't skip a beat and just keeps on dotting his eyes, crossing his T's. He's going to be looking pretty fresh. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you would think so. In the top left, I read Terran looking to dot the eyes, cross the T's, and take game three. It is XY. And spawning over in the bottom right, he is the crazy toss. He is Nanami. New nickname. How's off today? The crazy toss, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know how he's playing his PvP exactly, but that was... That was, <laughs> that, okay, I, he plays in a way that I like to play Protoss, you know, like, uh, <laughs> just fun, like, you get the rapid fire hotkey for your gateways, and you just kind of like, you know, zoom, it, it, it's almost Estrella-esque in a way, except Estrella mm. also had tech, um, yeah. but, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know, I, I enjoy it, I think maybe if he uh, settles on down a little bit, it'll be absolutely amazing, but, yeah, I, I, I've, I've liked what I've seen from both of them because you've seen it work, you've seen it not work, right? Which is, uh, yeah, that's always fun in a series. So hopefully both of them will uh, evolve and we'll see what happens when they both really hit their stride and hit one another. I, I do think Nanami overall has showcased some pretty solid play as long as he doesn't get too carried away, because I feel his was a bit more of a throw than uh, XY's first uh, game. Mm. Yeah. No, I, I'm with you, right? What he's shown us is good. It's just maybe the idea, which isn't so good, versus the execution is kind of there. But, uh, I mean, honestly, what he did would have been okay if he just added on, like, some disruptors or something too, right? Something that can force the Terran army to actually spit away, not just stand and fight the entire time. Because you just can't have that Terran Force stand there and deal damage to your gateway units like that. So that was what was really missing from game two. Let's see if he fixes it up this game three. Golden Aura as a map is fairly macro friendly. All the bases are up on a high ground. So it's very easy to expand to base three to base four. You can hold these locations on the choke points very comfortably. This Reaper this time from XY will catch the probe to start the game. And he hasn't built a Reaper every game as well. So something that he will utilize here as he goes to try and scout. Yeah, this game he actually went for a gas first, so it's going to be a very fast factory follow-up, and it's a CC on the low ground. So, XY has been showcasing very different builds. Nanami, I wouldn't be surprised if a second gateway drops down very soon, and he just goes to the same thing again, because it's been working for him. Like, he, he hasn't suffered from any sort of push early on or any cheeky shenanigans so far from XY dealing too much damage, right? But... And, and, and yeah, a Protoss that can get onto three bases nice and safe and get to their flow, their rhythm. Although, this is one game where he could very easily just throw down three gateways and go ham. We'll, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. It's pretty similar from XY in this game so far with the Cyclone, Marines, and a, a, a Starport coming up. So, expecting this opening to look similar to game two. Mm -hmm. An army just opening up. And it, it does look like it is just going to be... Yeah, it looks like Nanami's, um, I, I, I don't mean this in a bad way, but in fact, was that a second? Okay, okay, no, no, it's just the same thing. Two gateway, Robo, go for a third base. I mean, it feels like XY keeping his Reaper alive here is a nice start. Got to deal with that, uh, that Adept early on as well. And now he's even slightly aggressive with the Cyclone. And this is nice because he knows that his opponent has been playing the same way and already this feels like one of the more annoying openings that Nanami's had to deal with. Yeah, just the Cyclone showing up early, Reaper's in the base, and you got that Medivac pol uh, as a follow-up right now. So you get I'll get a Probat, Wardy. And, yeah, yeah he, he can't get a Probat to the third base currently with that Cyclone being where it is, and he will be able to now fending it off with this single Stalker here. But I dare say he'd have liked to get that up a little bit faster than he did, because Protosses can get it up before the four minute mark with this build, whereas he's four minute fifteen. Yeah, I think XY's he it feels like he's cooking this game. I, I this is one of those where I wouldn't be surprised 
I mean, I, I'm about to say something, but I think he's going to do totally opposite. If he threw down two extra barracks at this point and went a bit more ham, I think he's going to do the CC. Yeah, he does the CC. I think it would have been very viable for this game. Yeah. Again, that uh, place down. Tanky is going to defend. The Stalkers get pushed back. We're just going to be uh, sitting chilling. Here's the Medivac. It's eight Marines this time. So because the Cyclone was on the map initially, we do this a little bit differently. But the Stalker is going to make sure the Medivac gets pushed back away. And Nex is still coming through. Those couple probes coming up as well. And the pylons producing in from an army also. Oh, just really getting set. Yeah. Love the Immortal too. Again, just that defensive unit to help you against the initial push. Absolutely. Uh, now, will XYXY do the late stim and all that again? Because kind of worked out in that game, right? And Nanami, very quick with getting the charge online in this game. Very quick. The game before, he was late with it, but still held off the push. And yeah. right now, it doesn't look like XY is necessarily going to go for a push. I see a tech lab going down on something. Oh, it's actually on the starport for the barracks, most likely, but will be a lot of tanks in the mix for him. Yeah, super tank heavy. We'll have the barracks able to swap over to those tech labs and start upgrades pretty quickly as well. As the Liberator comes through the bottom side, it's going to be moving into a siege position on the third. There's the Cyclone, a few Marines and tanks. Just in general, making their way through the center, so they're going to continue to make their way across. The Liberator comes into that bottom side and is going to be sieging up on the natural very Ooh. shortly here, as this force so far is not going great for an army. He's going to be de wow. taking damage off the lib. The army is getting into position. The Immortal's barrier gets popped already as well. I think it's time to start sieging tanks, though. I mean, like XY could have had one, two tanks siege further back there and already been really pressuring through. Now he's actually going to back away from that main force and just let the lib do its thing. I tell you what, I like this from XY this game, man. Like this single liberator with the little push out here did quite a bit of damage. Definitely slowed down the Protoss a little bit. And the fact that he's going for this very tank heavy army, and it will be quite a lot of stalkers, that was a ballsy blink. He had no idea what lay behind that, but we'll get a tank for his troubles, plus one, plus one starting for XY, XY. So very, very, very much same build from game two, or at least the follow up of the initial build. And yeah, just getting a third base situated and Nanami, He's learned from his mistake, by the looks of it. Robo starts up very, and um, Robo Bay starts up very early this game, so not going to get caught out with the no splash build again. Nope, not going to get caught out with that. It's just going to be going straight into some actual tech years, something that can help him to play into the future. And that's that so far, pretty good, uh, pretty good matchup, man. It certainly does, like. One weakness, obviously, if you are going for this Robo Bay, is if you're going to Colossus and you're against so many tanks, we got to see it being like you're putting a lot into those Colossus, right? Like they're your MVPs of your army. He has to be careful, by the way. These tanks are beautifully placed. Does he have vision with an observer? Let's have a quick peep. He has no idea what's uh, lying beneath uh, that fog of war over there. And he has to be very careful. Does find a way kind of into this, though? We'll be able to maybe pick off a Marauder for his troubles. Not bad. Not bad at all, actually. Pretty reasonable as our Zolot's walking on the left-hand side. They will hop up into the prism. So into the prism they go. And they get ready to go harass. We're going to see our body upgrades all finishing now. So, you know, XY really hitting a power spike here. As we'll just move back home. It's really just this prism going to sit and wait. And yeah, it's even going to siege up so it doesn't get F2'd anywhere anytime soon. And then you can actually just unsiege it when he is ready to move in and drop those zealots off, which will probably be when the Terran shows some sign of moving out. Ghost Academy coming up, Vikings on the way, we're again seeing that big round attack. And this time, the Protoss upgrades aren't really there either, so Terran is ahead on upgrades and even getting away with then delaying his upgrades to move into the Ghost Viking combination. Yeah, this, this game feels like they've both learnt from the mistakes they made previously and getting on going. Like Nanami doing a good job with this warp prism. It's a small, I was going to say a small investment, a small commitment, but big old warping in the main, slowing all the Terran down while he's getting that Colossus switch going, getting the Thermal Lance online, getting to see everything that's being produced as well. I mean, the Zealots will be doomed over here, but they're kind of that unit to throw away and going to poke a little bit with the stalks at the front here but xy nicely positioned with his army xy's he's taken the punches wardy he absolutely has and now his army's actually very fierce to move out across the map yeah well, it's uh it's looking good right i mean just needs to find a you know chance to actually go which should be about now right prism gone the stalk is pushed back this is his opportunity there's already another counter-attack from the army setting up around the bottom left but 
That's something you just deal with on the guy at the time as well. Did he just pull some SCVs as well? Oh my oh. goodness. Yes, he did. XY is bringing the boys. They're going to run into a group of stalkers, and uh, then they're going to turn around, and meanwhile, we're actually going to stim up. We might actually get a free picking on that base. Everything's out of position from Nanami. It certainly is. Those Vikings are very, very Larry position there. We'll get picked off before the fight even truly begins. And Night all oh, the Disruptor kind of stopped there as it was about to detonate. And chaos ensuing on both sides. I think Nanami's handling the situation very well. Getting away with a lot of his workers here and just being like, okay, okay, let's chill, let's chill. I'm getting lots of eco damage done. You're on three bases. I know how committed you were because you pulled the boys. Let's slow this push down. Both Giga supply blocked at this point as well. Yep, hefty supply blocks. That was the uh, just chaotic uh, situation. That's a disruptive shot lands on just the tank, but there's so much biopower here. We're going to knock down the super battery. I'd love to see him just target that disruptor so he can't get a shot off again later. Disruptors now come in fresh from the bottom side. There's a couple of Vikings that have rejoined the fray. Initially, the Vikings really did not do well enough. However, now we get rid of the Colossi. Do we have enough left on the ground? It's just going to be tanks and a ghost. Probably not enough to really stand that ground here, although. If you're on Siege, you're probably going to lose out, so I guess you don't have anything else to do but to sit here and to try and pick up a decent fight somehow, let the tanks get some work done. Oh my goodness, I mean, here, Disruptors try and get the landing on, but those Zealots and Stalkers, finally, that Gateway-centric army coming into play. Double Disruptor production, Nanami survives, and all things said and done, he is still on four bases, Wardy, still with 73 probes on the field. He definitely definitely comes out ahead after all things said and done after the dust has settled and eco wise as well he's like almost doubling the eco of xy at this point he really did a lot of damage with the zealot counter attacks and while he lost one base he already had another base replaced so four base to three worker lead Nami is indeed uh, looking better as everything like you say settles down and he's about to finish two two upgrades too and that's something which xy is not being able to get to just now his armory halfway done so it's a massive upgrade timing window for an army where he's just going to have way better upgrades that's going to improve every fight he takes during this period and he was already set up to take the better fights so yeah the army's got to be loving this at the moment absolutely he's like a flower when spring is just beginning getting ready to flourish and bloom getting up the fifth base behind this and just constantly limiting what xy can do on the map and 10 more zealots coming out more probes obviously it is an army gonna be uh, fielding out colossus again very very shortly uh this is just a nightmare scenario and this is when an army wants his opponent man like he's just booming behind this he's got units here there and everywhere and xy he can't get a grip on the game anymore nope not really i mean zealots just run in and there's just such a slow cleanup slow pull away too so Another 19 workers killed. We're going to blink on top of one of these lives. The bio needs to move. Oh my god, the disruptor stuttered. Otherwise, it would have probably had a bigger connection. Even then, it was still pretty good. We forced to split away again. We allow ourselves to keep taking fights. We're winning on the bottom. Honestly, the top fight doesn't really happen. A few zealots there hold up, but I mean, the army just backs away again. He's got so much economy. He knows he's just done damage. Fall back. Let your economy sink in. Let it do the work to build more army and to come and overwhelm a few minutes from now. Yeah, these disruptors definitely not getting all the connections they're looking for. It feels like uh, the shots aren't managed afterwards, so like follow the units and stuff, but it doesn't matter. I think Nanami overall has played a very, very smart PVT. Like, he knows when to pull his probes away. Like, it's been all about the economy for him, hasn't it? Like, when to deal the damage to the economy, when to save his own economy. He's killed 55 SVs this game, only lost 14 Stalkers, and that was against that massive tank flood where he did lose a base and yeah just the constant tickling damage that he's getting done is it's been really smart protoss play yep well you see uh stalkers will continue to blink another marauder or two going down and i mean everything you bleed out right now is xy is just painful because it's already going to be tough to hold on your army supply is somewhat there you just don't have any way real way to rebuild it so you need a really miraculous fight and so anything you lose is going to take you one step away from that as he's also not quite 2-2 yet. So again, without those upgrades finished, if this fight happens now, this is absolutely doomed for XY, and it does seem like he's going to have to run in. He's going to target down a couple of disruptors. They didn't fire at all, so two disruptors fall, but obviously we're on top of this base, and that's the third now dropping. Reinforcements warping in at home just in case there's a counterattack. There is not everything else from XY is coming back to deal with this, but once more, Nanami has just done everything that he needs to to establish a lead and control, and so he's just going to be sitting pretty. 
Yeah, I mean, even if, even if this army gets cleaned up here, Nanami, just buy in time. Two more Nexus on the go here. But the thing is, he's got the economy, and while this army is going over here, another army's running into that fourth base, Wardy. Nanami's being yeah. a bit of a puppet master over here with it and playing with his food. Well, he does get surrounded, at least in the top right, but yeah, I think the fourth base might actually die, and it does die, so... Fourth goes down, that army actually has a recall away, but yeah, without the fourth base, we just lost the third, remember, so you are out of location to mine from his XY. And uh, again, eventually that means an army just builds up enough army to clean this up. I mean, we're also on very low medevac energy, so there's not a lot of healing, so these bio units, every time they stim, it's really becoming a bit of a problem. It's adding into something that you can't really afford to keep on top of. Uh, so that's uh, also a factor. I mean, just just very, very well situated out of Denami. Like, he, he's known how to play his opponent positionally. I mean, right now, 300 minerals per minute versus 3,000. Like, Nanami's investment, like, it hasn't looked the prettiest of StarCraft, just because he does lose armies here and there. But the way that he's situated himself, he's done a lot of trading for Eco. Very smart play, very good play. Such annoying play to go up against. And now, now he's just waiting for his opponent to come. And, I mean, you see that Protoss army, you're like, well, this is it for me. And, oh my goodness, insult to injury. Yeah, big disruptor shot there just to add to everything as XY trying to go for this final push. But it does look as though an army is going to continue. There has been quite a lot of Protoss domination in this region. Was, especially in PvT, Protoss have been doing pretty darn well. And an army will win this out. Finally switching up a little bit as it got to this uh, final game. Recognizing that the start from game one did not carry through well at all to game two. Uh, and he adjusted well because if he was going to do more of the same, we weren't going to enjoy that. We weren't feeling that at all. But an army does manage to uh, switch it up, fix it up. And uh, there we have it, Ben. We are set up with a uh, score in the favor of an army to start us off today. Yeah, I... I... I was kind of saying at the start there, I felt that Nanami, with the loss that he had, was more of a throw on his part, just because it was a bit wild. So I, I do think the right player today won. But yeah, just honestly, a, a quite a nice high-level TVP out of both of them. Like, you got to see where they found their grooves and where, in, in the final game there as well. Like, XY tried to do that push that worked so well in game two, but you saw the evolution of Nanami where he's like, you know what, I'm not going to just be on gateway units here. I'm going to absolutely fix that error and uh, yeah well played out of him for doing that yeah uh, so we're going to have a quick peek at the schedule here you can see xy he drops to one and two in the group while losing one and two in this specific series that means he's in an elimination match for round four we'll see that in a few days the army two and one will play in a qualification match in round four and up next as we continue this day of one one players playing up against each other in asia Oliveira, surprisingly at one and one he lost a lemon the last time we saw him play that was a little bit of a shocker but he gets to play some TVZ now against Silky. So we're going to be heading into that in just a moment. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, it's Oliveira and Silky taken to the stage.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, everybody. It's more StarCraft II action as the Oliveira matchup resumes here. It's Oliveira versus Silky. TVZ time and uh, just one of these matches, Ben, where all of a sudden we have got, you know, uh, one of the best, the best, the guy that's won this region so many times already. He's actually in a little spot of trouble simply for the fact that, you know, he's one and one. He lost to Lemon uh, and now he has to kind of try and fight his way back into this. Yeah, and Lemon, I, I saw people in Twitch chat a little while ago being like, hey, have you seen Lemon play? It was pretty good, actually. Like, yeah. uh, you know, genuine uh, Im impressed was, uh, with him. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, spotting over in the top left here to start things off, it will be the former world champion. It is Oliveira. Still is a world champion, Ben. Still is, yeah. That Oh, that is true, Wardy. That is yeah. true. I know. Yeah. Katowice is not the world championship this year, so Oliveira gets to keep his crown a couple more months. So, <laughs> good for him. Is in the bottom right from uh, SSLT. It is Silky, a very cheeky, aggressive Zerg player. Would not be surprised to see him do things that are a little bit off kind of the norm in this series, especially playing against someone who he knows is typically stronger than him. I expect things to perhaps go a bit crazy and bonkers on his side. I mean, already he has gone for something a bit, a bit weird. Like this is, uh, this wasn't a really sick drone count going into this. This was very yeah. much like hatch gas before an overlord. And yeah, that's uh, that's already a bit spicy. And I mean, if you are up against the guy, Oliveira, who, uh, let, let's be real, like throughout SC2's history, which is freak freakishly long, Oliveira's never been bad at this matchup. He's always been incredibly fast. He's one of the guys that practice with Serral a lot. And going up against him, do you want to play a late macro game if you know, you're not super comfortable with it? Like, absolutely hell no. Uh, so I'm already very excited what he's going to be throwing here. Gas has lined up very nicely to get a speed on the go very quickly. And six lings immediately. Yep, first lings already coming out. Eight lings now, so that's obviously aggression across the board. Um, obviously only a single queen, usually with hatchery first. You get two queens at the same time, but with the ability in the lings, you can't afford that. And now even more lings start up, so we're absolutely sending aggression here early on. And uh, we're still mining gas as well. So Silky, despite Link Speed starting, he's already back at 100 gas too, which already is suggestive of something, you know, another layer of aggression that's already come to fruition here. <laughs> this is so funny to see. Like, okay, okay. So the fact that you come here, there's no drones here, that you're not greeted by four Lings as per normal, and you don't see a queen in production there either, like, because you'd see that hatchery just blobbing them out of it. I mean, oh, <sighs> I, I say this, I saw that, and I'd be like, I'd be sweating if I was a Terran player already. Mm -hmm. I, I would, I would. But Oliveri's like, you know what? Third CC, let's freaking go. And he looks like he's been caught with his pants down here, Wardy. This is not the kind of start that you want. Nope. I mean, at least he did finish the CC on the low ground, so that is one benefit of this, that that CC is done. But the Bailing Nessus have had to be done. The Reaper is scouting about a little bit. Link Speed about to finish too. We can morph the Banes. The Bane bus is going to be ready. I mean, there's going to be, what, a single heli now because we've been reactor and marines now too, so that's not exactly ideal. We're going to keep uh, building just one heli at a time as well, so not putting that onto that reactor, which isn't a bad thing because, to be fair, that reactor is about to die. It is about to die. And it's, I mean, Oliveira, what does he do here? He's got minerals to try and construct like a bit of a bigger wall here to go on, but the Banelings are coming, and that's exactly what he starts doing here. There is still a gap to the north here. And that is a lot of units in this base already. This might be one of our fastest games today already. That being said, nice little split and divvy up by Oliveira. And you got to remember, if he holds against this, that is 3cc, Wardy. I don't think this was enough damage from Silky. GG. <laughs> <laughs> he knows it as well, man. He's like, no, that was not it. GG indeed. Um, you said it right. If he holds, this triple CC is great. And the thing is, the scary part of these builds is that first bust. When that first burst comes through, it needs to do everything. You need to stay around, get rid of units, and then if you can get rid of enough units, maybe the stream through continues. The moment it was cleaned up and there was units left, I'm like, oh, he didn't lose every SCV. I was like, oh, yeah, this looks pretty good. And then it really started to sink in, and obviously it sunk in on the Zerg side as well because Silky does not waste any time at all. And he says, GG. He's like, wait, guys, sorry, are we behind schedule a little bit? I've got you guys. I'll win this game real quick. Only it backfired, sorry. 
Uh, very, very slightly. I, I mean, I liked how it was all lining up, honestly, uh, for me. It, it looked kind of cool. Um, but when you need five bailings to blow up that that initial wall, and I think he really counted on delaying that first CC, you know, like just stopping it from being constructed entirely, because then it starts to get a bit wily. Like, does Oliveira then go for the big commitment to get it done, get it completed, maybe sacrificing more SOVs and things like that? Maybe being greedy, switching around the buildings as well, like you said, why do it when it's going to die? I think Oliveira made a lot of very decent calls that game that, you know, granted him the win there. Yeah, no, he uh, he definitely realized a little bit what was up. It maybe wasn't the perfect wall off in time, but he got the bunker in the back as well. He had the split ready. He can afford to take some damage to this as well, so. Works out beautifully, and we get ourselves ready now to go into uh, game number two of this best of three on Ghost River. So starting this off, getting this in game. Oliveira versus Silky, game number two. Absolutely, and this is one of the newer maps. Very cool to get into it, and spawning over in the top right as our blue cheeky Zerg player, it is Silky. Taking on the red Terran in the top left, this is going to be Oliveira. I've liked a lot of these new maps. Like, there's, they yeah, look good. smaller. They look smaller and tighter in, in some ways, but... The, the journey to the other base is still quite long, getting a, across the map and what have you, because it isn't super direct. Now, this map is definitely one of the smaller ones, I would say, because you can get across very quickly. Um, and, and within regards to what bases do you take, it's very, very obvious, right? So those builds from Marrow in the past where it's like, okay, I get SCP out on the map to scout. I, I block the third, maybe put a bunker there, uh, get the Reaper on the go. They, they can be very scary. Yeah, very annoying. And it also really benefits Terran late game because how do you ever take the plus one base as a Zerg that you're meant to have in like a long game in CVT? You kind of not. Mm -hmm. This map kind of works nicely, you know, as a, you know, for a Terran. Zerg still seem to like, I think the size of it, they actually like being able to put on some good aggression kind of saying, well, we think we don't think the Terran should be able to necessarily get to all six bases. Obviously, that's not always the case, but yeah, it's, I, I'm with you when you say that these maps are interesting. It's definitely a different vibe of map. They all came off of a, a freestyle TLMC, so where kind of map makers were allowed to be a bit crazier. There wasn't as many, like, hard and strict rules. I think that was just a, a really big plus because it, it's just added a whole bunch of creativity with these new maps, and we've kept some of the more standard maps just makes it a very fun map pool right now, very diverse. Of course, we can do this a bit more easily as well because there's nine maps now allowed, so there's a couple more vetoes each. It just allows each map to be a little bit more out there. You know, you're not punished competitively by one map being, like, kind of weird. So that just has to be an instant veto every time. So I think that has a, a big role to play as well. Definitely does. In this game, Oliveira will do the SCV scout because it's like... Okay, the map's a bit shorter, shorter of a rush distance, I do imagine. And given that you did literally go for one of the crazier Zerg builds out there, where you don't make an Overlord, but you make a Hatchery and a Gas before that, uh, I'm not surprised he goes for that. But Silky doing something far more standard here. Just four links to hold off the initial Reaper, which should be enough if micro correctly. And basically, the Zerg's hoping to not lose a drone. And hopefully not lose a Zergling either, but Oliveira does get away with a little bit of scouting, a little bit of uh, the skill check here. Tiny bit of a pause going on. Maybe Silky's like, damn it, lost a Zergling. Let me just cool down a little bit. Lost the link, smashed his key. He said, no, <laughs> my keys are everywhere. Uh, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> Maybe you just sound or Maybe a hotkey as well. Always a factor when these guys are playing on these accounts uh, that are specifically for this event. Could be anything. Anyways, it was a quick fix, and we're back to it, so Oliveira gonna end himself one ling early, and he's on his way to that starport. Of course, no triple CC this time, so just CC on the natural into the 1-1-1, and we'll allow him to put a little, a little bit more pressure in general now. Yeah, and I mean, why not? Like, even though you have that little bit of a, a swing around there in the middle where the land army gets across a little bit slower, doesn't mean the air units will, and getting out either a Banshee or we'll get to see, I think it's just going to be a Viking Liberator here. I mean, that would be mm -hmm. a pretty good call um, in, in a situation like this because Silky did scout with two Overlords, not just one on this map. So he has them both. This Ooh, Medivac, mm -hmm. Oliveira. I mean, this, this isn't super weird, right? But this can absolutely get a lot of damage done very quickly if, if, if left unchecked. 
Yeah, and all of Vera's opening series was actually of, of this tournament. It was actually just a couple of Hellbat all-ins back-to-back, so that army drops down. And he's just going to send some Hellbats here and say, well, Silk, if you're not being overly aggressive, I kind of expect you to be overly greedy, perhaps. And if, if that's his read, if that's his call, it's perfectly true so far. There's lots of drones on the way, very minimal units. I do get rid of an Overlord there, which is a problem. Supply blocked at pretty much the worst time as these units come across the map. And we have got a handful of Queens to try and fend off this entire Hellbat Marine push. Yeah, I mean, queens are damn good, but are they this good? That supply block is absolutely crucial here. I mean, this single overlord here buying a little bit of time will be a cloak banshee follow-up as well. And I mean, this, you might be like, hey, why isn't he attacking with those marines? He has to go, go, go. The army's not yet done. Now it's completed. Now the army will all get together. But I tell you what, this already hasn't done what I thought it was going to done. But yeah. the fact that Oliveira has teched out of it already, like even though the investment was there to deal a lot of damage, he's not all in with this by any means. Nice having Hellbats at the back here. Nice spawn crawlers as well, just to mitigate that damage. Ah, nice moves on uh, both fronts here. Yeah, Oliveira defends very well, and uh, Silky defends very well himself, minimizing what can be done. So very nicely handled. Lair is on the way up from Silky as well, so we just see that starting to come through. And the Balin Nest is going to be adjoining as well. So again, that Balin Nest on the way. A few more drones all coming out. And we have a couple more Marines just unloading it out of the medevac. We can get ready to push in from the front one more time. Yeah, I, I do like these Hellbat builds. Um, I mean, right now, the fact that there are no Balings out or at this point, there are 10 Queens, which is uh, maybe one or two more than you normally have. But Banshee does fly into the natural oh. here without Cloak, though. Oh, my. That is a blunder and a half. Cloak finishes as it died. That could have been so damn crucial. Yeah, because if that Banshee's cloaked right now, the Spore Crawler's not ready. So you would literally just be sat there killing drones. So Oliveira just pulls the trigger a moment too soon. That is a... Uh... I mean, that's just rough. That's a mistake as the Hellions, though, drop in. And Silky saw this coming. He just went right over a hatchery, but no response. It means that five drones going down already. Now he more from Hellbats. And in the corner, these Hellbats can just sit and fight for a little while longer as well. A bit of micro, oh, too. Lovely. Yeah, just getting absolute value out of this. I mean, all these links are going to go down. The Queens will be able to get the medevac, and this will be the end of it. But this was expensive. The drones, the links, the Queens having to be here. And now we've got Hellions over here that may try and hit this mineral line too because everything was in the main. The Banshee oh, forced the no. drones to pull as well. So we're going to just get in and some barbecue. They're all lined up. We split a couple away. Oliveira continues to hunt for the oh, line. No. Oh my God. Well, you know, it all started off really badly with that Banshee. About as badly as it could, but it all ends well. <laughs> 38 drones falling to these attacks. And I tell you what, when you see one Banshee fly in, Maybe that was the Giga master plan from Oliveira, <laughs> making him think that it was just a safety banshee, yeah. you know, without cloak. And then it's like, <laughs> you know, you, you're like, I don't need spores really, do I? And then you come in and then 38 drones die. I tell you, this this world champion over here, he's got the mind, he's got the speed, he's got it all. It's funny because the, the games he played in round one of this event was so fast as well, that this series is almost a little bit slower than it but like still pretty quick <laughs> so he's the, the matches he's winning he's winning extremely quickly but then he got pushed into a long three game series against lemon which he lost it was just kind of wild definitely not the storyline i thought i'd be telling of Oliveira this season oh, of course this is looking great for him and he's looking to basically spend this one out two to zero and obviously would then be two and one in this group a couple chances to make the playoffs with the next couple of rounds of action yeah, and I mean, over here, I, I love this little, like, position here. Like, it's it's not so close yeah. that it's super scary, but it does mean that Ling's getting on top of those Marines. It's not super nice, is it? And I mean, we'll start unseaging these tanks, trying to get as close as he possibly can, but I tell you what, that is a good army of Queens, man. I mean, they don't deal good damage, and we'll get <laughs> some Ling's round the back here. That is very nice by Silky, but this... The upgrade's kicking in now as well. I mean, Oliveira is... He's not making this look super easy. It's got to be said. It, it could definitely look a bit easier for him. I mean, that Banshee as well, still alive here. Going to start tickling these drones once more. Hydra's on the way for Silky, and that's a big Terran fit flock here. Yep, that is a lot of Terran moving through the center. The army coming over the right-hand side. Marine medevac tank going to come and... Uh push over and get onto the creep and obviously this is the kind of army with which which with an upgrade lead 
it's going to be terrifying to play against. We just finished Bane Speed. Do we actually get any of these Banes finishing up? They do, but the Marine firepower was enough. The Ling's on the left-hand side. Well, we need to target fire down the Banes as well, but the Banes get caught up a little bit, so we can target fire those down. That's good enough for Oliveira, right? Like, he's still trading well, and he's just reinforcing behind this, so he's just going to have more and more stuff coming. 2-2 two -two upgrades already starting where Silky's going to be trailing. I mean, Silky's going to get some Hydras out, but now I feel like he's got a lack of Bane Ling's. Yeah, I mean, this, This, if you were to tune in and see what kind of Zerg this was, you'd be like, is this me or Mika? It's just Ling Hydra, you know? But mm. Baylings are coming in, his eco is significantly worse than the Terra, and it's not where you want to be. And as soon as the rock starts tilting away from you, like kind of towards you in your direction, absolutely falling on you, the Zerg does not want to be in that position. And Oliveira getting the fourth base up and running. As you said, getting the upgrades as well, going up to eight barracks now as well. This is when the parade starts to really kick in and there's no hive on the way. There's just, it's hard to see a bright future if you're the Zerg fan here. Yeah, it's, um, it's tough. I mean, at least you didn't die to the first push after losing 40 workers, but yeah, it's, it's obviously not been anything that he's done. It's not like he's killed a mineral line during all of this, so he's kind of evened it out while surviving. Maybe that's his goal now. He is counterattacking, trying to run across. There are Marines here. Maybe not enough. Uh, upgrade leads about to kick in, but isn't ready yet. At the same time, we're also pushing, of course, with the larger army. So that's going to be here. Looks as though we're going to pull the trigger. It is going to be before the 2-2 of the Terran player. That might just not matter with this how much stuff there is. The tank's getting a lot of damage done initially. And these bands reach. Nope. Target fired beautifully. And now it's just Hydras. And Hydras on their own really don't do anything. No, they're so brittle, so flimsy. I mean, they pack a punch, but... This is now superior upgraded Terran and Banelings is trying to roll in. They have to fight off Creep. That one tank in a beautiful position back there as well. A single Queen will wrap around to take it out. The Queen flank. Um, but Oliveira, too much, too powerful. But I'll tell you what, coming back from losing 38 drones to a Hellion run by, ah, not bad stuff. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was going to be more kind of directly won by Oliveira. I mean, it pretty much was, right? But like even more heavily won by Oliveira based on what we saw mm. with that uh, with that initial damage being dealt. Uh, obviously not quite the case. It went on a little bit, but not too long at all. And Oliveira is now going to be able to put himself up to that 2-1 uh, scoreline. Obviously, we kind of expected Oliveira to be playing tomorrow when he plays, you know, play for a playoff position. He will not. He'll have to play in round four instead, but he will be playing for that playoff position when he plays again. So kind of fixing uh, his problems from last time. And uh, that will undo a little bit of our <laughs> schedule problem from having a very long first series today. And I'm not sure if we're necessarily going to have a long series of next event because we have got Nice versus Haas, the Taiwanese classic. Two crazy Protoss players going to play against each other. Then SCV takes on Coffee as well. That's our schedule for Asia. And we've got a whole bunch of action coming from Europe after that as well. So stay tuned. Plenty more IC2 to come. And it is going to be Nice and Haas, a banner of a PvP coming up next.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Uh, we are back again, and it is time for Hass vs. Nice, uh, a matchup that's happened so much in the past. They have played over 270 competitive maps against each other in the history of StarCraft II. Um, because they're both the best players in Taiwan, and they have been for a long time. Taiwan was its own uh, DreamHack region for a long time as well. It was always these two competing for the top spot there. Um, and kind of cool, man, to see, you know, players like Lemon also competing a little bit now as well, representing that Taiwanese region too, so... Awesome stuff, and we're going to see this. PvP, Taiwanese Classic now, Nice versus Haas, coming at you. Uh, we are literally loading in. Yeah, this is... I mean, it is a classic at this point. Like, for a long time, Haas ruled this region um and he was you know cheesy crazy he's definitely toned it down a little bit since then like it's not yeah. as shameless but he, he really kind of gatekeeped gatekeeped nice away from the international scene but then yeah. as soon as nice started like fighting back a little bit and we got to see what he was capable of nice definitely showcases some very solid uh protoss overall yep no well, that's um that's very true actually the Nice when he actually went to offline events or international events, so do very well. As did bring out a little bit of the DGen Protoss the other day as well in this PvP, so I'm kind of excited what we see here. Although it's just a panel and a low grab on both right now. In the bottom right, our blue Protoss player here is Haas. Wow, going for a gas first as well with it all. Um, and spawning over in the top left hand side as our red Protoss, it is nice. The gas first is interesting. Like, in my head, I have, like, Petit Drogo in my mind that's like, you know what, making a gas, going two gases, that is... I think he might be up to something a little bit cheeky here, Wardy. But I, I think of Petit Drogo back in the day, it's like, yeah, you might as well build a, a gas earlier, because if you have 17 out of 16 on your minerals, it's kind of worse, because it takes a while for the probes to settle where they are, even though it will eventually be better, just for that moment, the short term, it's, it's worse, but... Nice will be getting that Nexus nice and early, whereas Haas, yeah, I don't think he's too worried about getting it on the go as early as possible. I would not be surprised if he's up to no good at some point. Yeah, he's, um, I mean, he's obviously going to have more gas. He'll have more tech available to him sooner. Whatever he builds is going to be in base. He does not have a proxy out on the map. His probe that is on the map is being chased around in the main base of his opponent, so he's not going to be doing anything funky there. Uh, he does put that Nexus down, so a little bit later, has more access to gas or whatever, again, he does tech into, would come in sooner than expected, or sooner than it would be from Nice's side. And that's going to be the big difference between them right now. It's just a question of what exactly is this going to look like. Absolutely. Nice is now to his own two gases. We see different units right from the start here. will be a Stalker versus an Adept, which usually implies that Nice is the one that wants to be aggressive and has going for the more defensive option. But, I mean, so far, it's your standard gate on the low ground. I, I do like that pylon that Nice has just made here. It's, it's, it's annoying. Messes up the wall situation a little bit here for Haas. Ah, just, just a little cutesy. Oh, big old wall off here for Haas. Yeah, I'm going to get that full wall set up for the moment. So, I'm just going to get that uh, rounded out a little bit. As do you have the... He's got a lot of gas, by the way, Wardy. Like that, he's getting mm. up to 300 here before dropping the tech. No, he is. He's going to drop the Twilight and the Forge in sync as well, so it's a little bit of a different kind of, you know, different from expected kind of plan or so, but yeah, I mean, Twilight, I guess now he's just going to start spending his gas on Stalkers and just Gateway units for a little bit. Yeah, like I would have been thinking a, a Dark Shrine afterwards, but the fact that it's a Forge, that very much implies, okay, I'm going into Blink, I'm going into Stalkers, I'm going to get upgrades very quickly, and I'm going to win that kind of battle, hopefully. But it is unusual. It's not something you see every day of the week, um, the way that he's going about this. And Nice will have an Oracle soon to get that vision, because right now, both players will be fairly blind for the time being. But I, uh, an interesting one to start things off. You don't often see such a quick forge in this matchup. No, you don't. But usually you kind of get like the Twilight up first, you prioritize that blink, right? And then you kind of look into the future, then you look into the next step of it all, which is to then get obviously like the Forge up. And some players really delay the Forge a lot of the time as well, so that's generally a very intriguing uh, point as this uh, stalk will go down. The Oracle and the Adept able to win that part of the fight, so 
That is going to be a pickoff. Let me just have again plus one and blink continue to come through here. How's that blink starts up on the side of nice? So the blink time is going to be the same from both. It's just Hass is really on a faster upgrade. And when you look at the unit count, he's also on way more stalkers already. Yeah, like, okay, let's, let's, okay, he uses the little trick here to get his probe out the base. In fact, I think both players went for that. And where is this probe going? Because there was an adept blocking there. Starts killing his own Stargate as well, because he got the tech unit out that he wanted. And nice right now, he's like, okay, okay, I've got your, your third base is covered here. One with an adept, see if that goes down. One with the stasis. But there was a probe out on the map here to the top right. So uh, I do like Hass, man. I think he's cool. Yeah, man, Hass is, uh, Hass is fun. Like, I loved when he mellowed out because it was like you still saw like the hints of crazy without being like overly crazy. And this is kind of a bit of that, right? It's like this is like a hint of crazy. You're going to proxy a dark shrine five minutes of the game top, right? After going for a bit of a weird opening, so it's difficult for your opponent to kind of know exactly what's up, right? Because your opponent looks at this and you're like, okay, he has a good stalk account. He's got the forge quickly. To me, he's doing everything he should be. There's no reason to be worried or concerned. But then he sneaks the Dark Shrine in. So because he's not open normally, it's so difficult for Nice to realize that there's units missing or gas missing that's in a Dark Shrine. And I think it's that lack of information that's really going to have Nice fooled here. And this is the kind of game where you're just not going to build detection for a little while. I mean, the Robo Facility isn't coming up. We do have a forge, but to build a cannon is obviously very difficult. Uh, third base gets cancelled here for Haas. I mean, that is a nice win for Nice, but it ain't going to matter if DT show up and wreck his mineral lines. No, and obviously, I don't think you ever make a Nexus for it to get cancelled. But no. right now, maybe that's a certain element that's maybe working in Haas's favor here. Like, Maybe Nice just thinking, wow, this is going great for me, isn't it? In every way, like he's just behind and we'll be getting up his own units. Lots of shield battery. So Nice is gearing up because remember, in his mind, he's against a two base all in. Like right now, basically, with canceling that third. So for his opponent to situate the game somewhat f fairly or like, you know, get back into it, he has to deal damage. So that's what Nice has got in his head right now. His opponent has to deal damage to him to get back in. And so he's gearing up. He's actually getting a cannon in his natural as well. I think Nice is actually doing everything that he can right now, considering yep. the situation. Yeah, no, absolutely. The cannon is obviously going to be a big help. Um, just having some kind of detection is a big deal. And if he does just fend off DTs right now without taking too much damage, he's in a you know really good spot with that faster third base and everything. But here come the DTs. Oracle here is going to be available, and we will drop a revelation on one DT, but the DT in the main will still get through for a few probes. Yeah, I was, I was a bit surprised about how he did that, because he had this cannon in his natural yeah. already. That one gets dealt with. The one in the main will eventually get dealt with as well. Overall, not quite the damage Hass was looking for, but, I mean, this isn't the end of it yet. He's got to rely on that single Oracle here for a lot of detection. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Mm. Where are the... That cannon in the main. Okay, nice warp in here to kind of distract a little bit, but that's already... The damage is starting to mount up here quite considerably. Yeah, 10 probes, and, and that is pretty much the worker lead in the game for Haas as well, so that has been substantial. That has been important to note. And, uh, yeah, 10 workers go down. And it's absolutely a big deal as charge continues through. The extra gateway is coming up. A couple more probes coming in. The, the big issue is that Haas just needs to catch up on army now. If Nice finds a moment to get across the map, that would be brilliant. But, of course, that's very difficult when your only detection mobile is this Oracle, which uh, currently doesn't have energy for Revelation. It needs a couple more seconds. His DT should really try and split up before Revelation's available so they don't get caught in the same Revelation. That way, you would have been able to maintain pressure here. Uh, now it's not going to be the case. Ooh. And we do see both those DTs getting caught. Nice warp in to block it as well. Yeah, it's a sick warp in. I mean, it's quite important that he gets these DTs out because, again, they have a bit of free reign here. Lovely surround on this cannon that he's trying to get done and does eventually get it off as well. And Hass's work account is now significantly ahead here, Wardy. I mean, oh, release the surround on that cannon for a moment there, but looks like it will be going up eventually and getting the surround on that DT. I tell you what, if Hass can survive, and that's the big thing here, if he can survive and get together a huge, huge gateway army, he can obviously, you know, be, get out of trouble. But surviving against Nice, because now, remember, the rules of RTS, Nice is now the one that's taken considerable damage. He has to either leapfrog ahead in eco or deal damage himself. And it looks like 
With this big supply block, he feels like he can't run across the map here. Yeah, no, he's going to kind of slow himself down, which is a shame. Because it really feels as though he's got opportunities, right? I mean, Cass has gone for plus one armor grace. That will finish sooner, but just the supply of knights looking great. I mean, like I say, he's getting the prism up. When the prism finishes, he might go poking across, and that might be the moment where he tries to do something. So, see how that goes. Uh, Nexus dropping down on that bottom right side. Temple Archive is coming through as well. As we get has to continue to tech up himself. And if he can get some Archons out, that would help him a lot against the size of this kind of gateway force that Nice is running with at the moment. Yeah, it's very important that Nice gets his scout off, gets to see a Templar Archives, because that makes you think, like, all right, all right, can I go Giga Zealot Heavy here? And the answer is, uh, if you do, you're going to die, because, you know, in a few seconds, that Archon number will start raising uh, surprisingly fast. And Nice, he's going to take his moment here to charge on across the map, and he's got a pretty damn decent army uh, to boot. Yep. This uh, force is going to jump onto a force base immediately, so that's just going to go down. That's one thing Hask can't hold on to now. He actually blinks to try and come in and save it. Well, like I say, he needs to get those Archons onto the Zealots if he wants to realistically have a shot at this. Yeah, there's a lot of Zealots, Ooh. but the Archons are going to join the fray, and that splash damage will help. There is just numbers from Nice that are absolutely booming, and it is looking good as he is winning this out. His Zealots lasted a very long time. The other Archon will go down now, and that means that Hask is going to end up being pushed back, and Nice stays on the chase for a moment, isn't going to push too far, because again, he knows he's gotten rid of the fourth base, he's in no rush to do anything extra here, he's already four base versus three, and Nice can back away, take the advantage, add on the Temple Archives himself, get his own tech going, and go again later with a much more even footing in terms of tech, while still probably having the larger army supply. This is exactly how you'd imagine this game would go, isn't it? Like, Hass doing something a bit cheeky, a bit Larry, not going by the book, getting himself kind of in the game, but nice with just solid fundamentals, just paying attention. And if there's any progress on the planet that most likely has experience with Hass, I mean, it's going to be nice, isn't it, at this point? And nice is just playing a smooth, solid game, and now he's the one that's definitely got control of the game. Mm -hmm. No, he does. And he's got his third attack upgrade finished as well. He's on his way to the armor upgrades. He's maintaining that upgrade lead. Looking, uh, looking good. I mean, again, just taking a fifth base while his opponent takes a fourth. And he's just got the map control to maintain that. So if, unless that upper right uh, harassment from Haas is going to get something done. It really feels like oh, this is not good for Nice. He kind of moved commands there, but honestly... And it works out fine. Just got to be careful again of these Archons. These Zelds running into Archon Splash is not exactly super pretty. And, well, that's a one way to lose a lot of Zelds very quickly and maybe give your opponent a shot at this. The only problem that I see for Haas is getting up a fourth base. Like, nice. He's been very, very, very well situated base-wise. And Haas, he's struggling to keep a fourth base alive. And eventually, even if you are going to take nice fights in this matchup, numbers will reign supreme and right now nice's eco is just it's better he's got less gas income overall because Hass is absolutely gunning away with all six gases on those three bases he has whereas nice is very much about the in fact he's only on three gas four gases overall right now so gonna have less archons in the mix but way more zealots yeah way more uh zealots kind of available here throughout this so that's gonna be Already a pretty big deal. Let's just have a couple of zealots fighting against one another. Stalker's going to come blinking up. Cannon going down. We're going to turn and fight against this army. So nice again with the numbers. It's just those Archons, the more the tech units here that give you a chance as Hass, and that's why this army is not going to be a complete disaster of a fight. Meanwhile, it is still a few zealots in the minimal line of the natural, though. So Hass is losing some of this economy, and again, it's the numbers of nice are seemingly getting the job done. Archons are continuing to drop down here. A few zealots reinforcing, getting to the front lines now, eating up those immortal shots is huge, letting the stalkers put in the work. We are microing nicely with that prism, but the numbers have never left Nice's favor. And again, we're doing some economic damage during this. He's going to maintain a 20 worker lead, a base lead as well, remember. I mean, again, Hass has just struggled to get a fourth base up. If he ever had a fourth, I think Hass could have had a good time. But uh, without that, he just really struggled a little bit too much to match Nice in terms of what was on the map. And that gives Nice a victory and hence a 1-0 uh, lead in this best of three. Yeah, you said it. It was actually very nice micro with the warp prism from Hass there. And I mean, I think he took that fight about as good as he, good as he could. Like Nice's Archons were kind of fighting against Stalkers. His Stalkers wrapped around so they weren't getting smashed by the Zealots and stuff. 
any micro every time those archons got low he dropped them back into the battery overcharge so i mean has made the best out of a bad situation um but the thing is yeah just economically he was behind and nice just sealed the deal good solid play good fundamentals he was prepared for something happening from Hass. the dts came and overall they got good damage done but it was like i'm still 3k resource down versus killing like 2k so overall am i in the best shape i mean definitely cost something to get that done ah a, a nice pvp there's a couple of moments where if those dts are just split more apart and the oracle couldn't revelate you could have extended that damage even further and that could have maybe made a little bit of extra difference as well so you could also argue that the execution there from Hass was perhaps lacking that tiny little bit as we ready ourselves up for Oceanborn for game number two Oceanborn gets played all the heck in time so we are going to see this coming in right now and uh yeah no surprises in terms of the map choice for this pvp we'll see if Hass or Nice have any surprises for us because obviously in pvp you don't always need a funky map to play a funky game you definitely do not. And I mean, already with that first game, it was it, it was Hass up to his... Hass up to no good. And I, I like what you're saying, because he, he is kind of like a mad scientist that's on rehab, right? Like, he, he's not he's not sipping the, uh, <laughs> the madness juice so much anymore. He's, like, really trying to pull back a little bit. But still, those elements that come out, like, kind of faking a two-base stalker all in into a DT drop. It definitely caught Nice a little bit off guard, but there's only... I've always said this about Hass, like, how how does he keep getting away with it, you know? Like, it's it's a it's a tricky one, but yeah, I, I think Nice right now is just looking... He's looking solid, man. Like, if he, if he was in any other region, he'd absolutely be fighting for, like, one of the definitely more well-rounded Protosses out there. No, no, it's, uh, that's a very good point. All rounded. It's kind of crazy to think of, actually. <laughs> but uh, no, very true. As we get into this uh, second map, let's just see what the delay was. But we're good. We're heading into it. Our third matchup of Asia here. Nice leads one over Has SEV versus Coffee to go. And then a whole bunch of action coming up in Europe as well. So loads of games coming in. I'm going to kick off an Oceanborn right now to see whether Has can bring it back and tie us up. Or if Nice is going to be able to... Um win another game and just put himself at the 2-1 and one and compete for those playoffs as we are going to have in the upper left hand side to start things off the red brawlers player nice and spotting over in the bottom right with that cool funky protoss skin it is Hass. i'm very happy by the way wardy that we get to cast the one and only coffer today Coffer. i know i saw this and then i saw who has cast one of the like, what a great day what a beautiful day <laughs> i mean you know yeah, this region it, it is wild west right like having those names that you can kind of root for because you give them a slightly funny sounding name that's very pokemon inspired it's uh yeah it's just happy happy times how's the uh pokemon tournaments been treating you by the way <laughs> My, my, my most recent one was pretty pretty miserable, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. How'd it go? Like, um, imagine you spawn into a game of StarCraft, and you split your probes, and then you lose. <laughs> that, was what? that was basically four rounds of my tournament on uh, a couple weekends ago, so, yeah. Really? Yeah. So it went, like, 0-4? I, I went, like, one tie, three losses, and I dropped out because I was pretty much dead. So I, I literally played uh, about seven cards across six uh, across eight games, which is kind of crazy. So that's brutal. Yeah. Freaking A. Well, uh, you know, sorry to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, man. I, I get over it. You didn't know. No, no. I mean, uh, you know, I, I have uh, I'm still a competitive guy, you know. So when I play uh, StarCraft 2 and stuff or AOE 4, uh, most likely, I, I played some StarCraft 2 uh it was either yesterday or the day before, and I was like, yeah, no, well, let's see if I've still got it. I loaded up five games. I don't think one went beyond the five minute mark, and I lost <laughs> all of them. I was just like, oh my. I even got like Void Ray all in, and I was like, I <laughs> thought they removed this. Yeah. So, I mean, sometimes it's just like that, right? You know? So yeah. Some days ain't your day. I mean, some days ain't your day. I mean, that's the bright side or bright way of looking at it uh, I was, oh my god i'm giga trash like i i didn't know what to do with myself i just walked away from the pc because i was 
was like, you know, I've got like a good hour to spend here. Turns out I spent 30 minutes for those five games and I was like, I walked away just sad and like, oh my goodness. Oh, it's, okay. Hass doesn't let that finish, but the probe gets in. Gets to have a little bit of a scout around. Gets to see the Twilight Council here. Ah. One base, one base, PvP. I mean, what 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 can you do on a map like this if you don't go for a low ground gate? And going for a low ground gate on a map without a ramp, that's... I, I want to say that's fairly suicidal, unless your name begin or rhymes with axe. Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, anything's kind of on the table here, and as nice does expand. You've got Hass who's ready to play like a one base blink, and he can play very aggressively off of this and get so much done. It's important for him to deny this probe. He does not want this to be, you know, found out, basically. He does not want his opponent to be like, huh, why haven't you got an expand? He wants for as long as possible to kind of just kind of mask the stalkers, but he's going to realize that maybe it's figured out, so he's going to nexus anyway. Maybe this is also his plan, but he's still going to have very fast blink to pressure with. Certainly is. Like, nice is moving out across the map with... The same amount of stalkers that Hass has, but I mean, remember, blink can't be done just yet. And unless you make a massive misplay, you can't get super caught out. And that was pretty brazen moving up that ramp just to find out what's happening. But he gets to see that the Nexus is a bit slower than his. He's getting a robo down. He's also got a couple of sentries back at home, I believe, which would be very good for scouting. And Hass, would you imagine it's going to be a proxy gateway over there or something? Yeah, it is. So absolutely up to no good <gasps> this probe if he spots that probe coming from that direction mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah he's gonna look he's gonna look get the game away that is nice anticipation out of nice here and i gotta say has uh I, I would say uh getting a little bit too greedy with that probe scout there yep no uh just kind of uh giving it up and now you lose power to your gateway now you can't kind of do this as easily as you might have wanted to before so that's definitely going to be something of a factor as well. And uh, it kind of sucked for you if this, uh, well, was meant to kind of do a whole lot. Well, now it's not going to do anything. I can't imagine this is going to be so great, right? I mean, you got to repower the pylon. The mortal's already building from nice. It feels like the timing has gone completely. I mean, at least he's got the nexus, but he's dead six workers. This looks like one of your Pokemon games, Wardy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. How's actually got to, like, at least put a pylon down? <laughs> 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 and you, for a moment there you're like oh too true too true <laughs> ah even with the uh immortal here with hallucination mm. oh they actually trigger the barrier as well with hallucinations i didn't know that that's cool yep yeah it's uh does everything it can to fake you out man uh hallucinations are high tech nowadays that's freaking imba dude as if Protoss has needed more things going for them, you know, but right now Nice is slightly supply blocked. We'll be able to warp in more units, soon up to two Immortals. Hass behind this has been probing up, but I mean, it's going to be very hard for him to get out of this because right now Nice doesn't have Blink, so he can't do any chasing down. Is there a Warp Prism out for Hass? No, he can warp in aggressively on that gateway, but it's not close enough for it to be super reinforced and nice will be going for a warp prism of his own here this this is very tricky like nice with this observer as well gets to see absolutely everything that's going on outside his base lovely stuff yeah and a lot of information as a couple gates continue to uh come through that's three extra gateways from nice four extra gateways so he's really powering up meanwhile has gets that charge about a finish so he will have kind of it's kind of weird because you're going to be on charge with only four gateways. Like, charge isn't usually good with that number of zealots. Like, you usually want a lot of zealots, right, for charge to be worthwhile. So it's just kind of weird to get charged this soon. Obviously, I mean, he's got Blink already, so yes, the Twilight Council's just sitting there, but I just can't see him having the zealot count anytime soon to really make it worthwhile. Uh, meanwhile, I love Nice's army because obviously he's already two immortals deep, and he's about to have Blink. Yeah, and I mean... The charge lots are obviously what you want against Immortals, but Immortals aren't exactly bad against anything. Like, as long as they're one of these units that's just constantly pumping out damage, it's constantly difficult to take down. They're just always, they're never a bad thing to have. And nice, he's moving out, he's taking a third base earlier than his opponent, and he's got that aggressive warp prism that is, well, it's not just postured to deal damage, it is going to come and deal damage. And Warping? Ah, using the Adepts as well. I mean, I like Lovely. that. This is slowing down Hass a lot. Yep, the more you slow him down, the better off this is, especially as you're the one expanding, your opponent isn't. And uh, even just pulling the probes away, right? We may not have got many kills there. Shame to lose the prism oh, because yeah. that obviously makes you not have further aggression off of it, but 
yeah, overall, still feels good for uh, Nice because he's getting the third base up. His army count is looking good. He's going to go Glaives, which is such a fun way to play. Um, Glaives is always kind of an interesting one in PvP because it has like a very short window where it's really good. But I kind of like with what Nice's army currently looks like. Like a round of depths with Glaives will really deal with any charge lots that kind of Hass is trying to work with, which is exactly what he's doing right now. The problem is Adepts really drop off the moment Archons are in the game, and that's also already true of Hass. So, yeah, it, the Glaives is kind of a love and hate relationship for me right now. It, it, like, Stark, oh, PvP especially is one of those that works in weird ways. Like, Stalkers, inherently, they deal extra damage to Armored, but they're not like a massive damage dealer. But they work out pretty damn good against Archons, so picking them off can be done. The Adepts then are left free to deal with the Zealots, and then the Stalkers, well, they don't fare against the Immortals. So, I'm with you. Like, if if the stars align for Hass, then he can get stuff done, and it also Disruptors, which I think he's gunning for here, will be very good against the Adepts, but Nice definitely has a window with what he's working with here. Like, he has all the tools to absolutely split Hass apart. He just has to get across the map to do it, and that is easier said than done against a crazy Protoss like Hass. Yep. It is true, because Hass is the, the ability to absolutely just keep you back and keep you busy for a long time, but Nice is starting to get across now, and Hass hasn't even got the Stalkers out front to kind of meet this or anything, so we're going to get straight across. There's a couple of Adepts, though, so there is something, and ooh, ooh, nice quick warp in block for a second, but the Adepts got the insta-kill on the warp in in Adepts, so didn't do too much as nice will already be on high ground as well so attacking into this third does not seem problematic and that triple immortal seems terrifying remember that these adepts are going to melt the zealots too so huge moment here for nice no forge upgrades by the way for nice like this is so damn committed there will be one disruptor popping out but even with the third going down it's a little bit deceptive because Hass's army does have better upgrades and if he survives this wardy you, you know, we, we're, we're talking about a game here, but can he survive it? That is so much Red Protoss, and look at that. All the Adepts, all the Zealots hugging them, and they are going to get absolutely burnt. I'm a bit surprised he's let that shield battery work its magic there for the whole fight, and Disruptors pop out. It looks like this is too much, and those Stalkers... Oh, nice game out of Hass. Like, that was a very, very committed attack, and you talked about it. The window for Adepts is not huge, but he was like, you know what? That window ain't huge, but I'm going to absolutely smash it. And he was like, forgo the upgrades, forgo all that stuff. As soon as I get across the map, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slice you like butter. And yeah, well well done by Nice. Yeah, fantastic job. He just uh, played a very solid game. You know, again, realizing what was going on. I love the timing. You know, he realizes the opportunity of what Hass is doing. Like, hey, I can actually punish this with the Glaive's timing. Again, you've got to be very kind of on point with that. And that's exactly what this was as Nice goes 2-0. And now 2-1 and one in this group, Haas will be facing elimination in round 4, while Nice will be facing qualification, should he be able to get a win in round 4. He'll have at least two shots of it, because obviously he'll have a shot in round 5 as well, guaranteed. We've got one more matchup for Asia today, it's SEV versus Coffee. We're not going to waste too much time, because I know we're kind of, uh, we're about on schedule. We want to make sure that that stays true, because we've got tons of StarCraft. We've got 8 best of 3s in Europe coming up after SEV versus Coffee. So we're going to get into that TVP in just a couple minutes.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. One more matchup here in Asia. Our fourth best of three today is Kofu taking on SCV for a little bit of TVP action. I'm so glad you're here, Ben, because you and me, we talk about Kofu like nobody else. Yeah, and I love the SCV, even though that's a Terran unit. He now plays, or when I say now play, he plays Protoss. This kind of reminds me of um, Serral's brother back when he played. It was called Protosser, except he was a Zerg. <laughs> these, these guys are wild, man. Yeah. yeah it's, always, it's always a pleasure to cast Kofu. Because Kofu, as much as we meme a little bit with his name, he's actually genuinely quite damn good with Terran. Yeah, and he really, to me, peaked at least in the last couple of years, you know, and really kind of shone at the Katowice and so on. So it's been really cool to see that kind of happening as well as we do get into game number one of this matchup. So we're going to start it off in the bottom left-hand side with the red Protoss, SCV. And spawning over in the top right as our blue Terran, it is Kofu. This is a very early SCV, by the way, like very early. So this is before you'd usually put down an engineering bay. Uh, so most likely going to be some proxy rack shenanigans going down from Coffee here. And when I think about his playstyle, he's usually sort of a by the book Terran, like just solid fundamentals and what have you, and just plays a good game. So this already from him, it doesn't feel out of character, so to speak. It just feels good to do. Yep. No, it's, uh, it, you know, to me, Coffee is one of these players as well who is just always able to kind of do so many different things. And then you just double gas it up at the start. You get a proxy going. And it's just, it, it's just dangerous without being overly committed, right? We'll see what else he proxies. We'll see how hard he goes on it. There isn't a probe kind of taking a weird route across the map as well, by the way. So SCV maybe also having some plans here as his game finishes. He'll cybercore at home. But uh, uh, looks like that probe is just going to come across, just didn't want to be seen on the way over. And uh, is going to go in for the scout and realize that, hey, there's no barracks there. We've seen, <clears throat> like we've seen a bit of TVP today already. And this is already lining up to be a very different TVP, isn't it? Like Bunker coming down in the natural. We know that a Reaper will be joining that very quickly. And a Zealot hasn't been made against this proxy which is, uh, it's it's a choice that you make. And granted, this Reaper isn't, or rather Reaper Bunker, isn't going to be able to, by the way, nice dancing with this SCV. It's not going to be able to kill this Nexus, but it's definitely not something you want to be dealing with. Like he has to throw down a shield battery pretty quickly, which I think he's getting in position to do just that. Yep, he is. And honestly, this is just an irritating start if you're in SCV shoes. Yeah, no, I mean, you're under a lot of pressure. You're going to be taking damage. you got your Stalker out now. Your probes have already been pulling, though, and you're going to lose one probe here at the very least. This Reaper makes its getaway, and it will be able to outrun that Stalker to the bunker, so it gets to the bunker alive and healthy. And now you've got a Reaper in the bunker, the SCV here to do some repairing. And, of course, that bat uh, battery finishing up is going to now keep the Stalker alive so we can make this trade-out happen for the foreseeable future. I like that Coffee sent his second Reaper back home to deal with that scouting probe. Just to mm -hmm. get it off the map, deal your damage, yep. get get stuff done, and he will most likely lose out this bunker, but it's stopped the mining here for the time being. Will lose his own SCV as well, gets to salvage it as well just in time. I think this has went as good as you can hope if you're coffee. Yeah, honestly, this was this was great, right? Like you put some pressure on, you get a probe, you get a probe across the map as well. You still got both Reapers, you didn't pay for the bunker. Well, you paid 25 minerals for the bunker. Yeah, I mean, this is really spot on. He's now got a couple of Hellions building too. We'll see what the next stage of aggression comes uh, kind, of, kind of comes as from Coffee, Because he is getting those Hellions out. He's going to have the Starport as well. Two Hellions into Mines is quite popular. He's actually going to drop a Tech Lab, I believe, on that Starport immediately. So no Medivac as he just goes up to the four Hellions. Yeah, definitely interesting. And I mean, he is against the Stargate opening. Hasn't been able to scout that, I don't believe, because these Reapers have... Ah, they've, they've had other things on their mind. His mineral count was getting high. Oh, Banshee. Cloak could be super annoying if not found out. And normally with the Phoenix, I mean, I've played against Roddy a lot in my life. They want to get that Phoenix across the map just to find out what they're up against. 
but he's just kind of scouting around just to make sure that the proxy shenanigans aren't ongoing and just trying to try to make sure that okay i'm not against like some weird follow-up but it's a sort of weird follow-up isn't it two reapers here gonna run yeah. charge right into the main keeping I... those stalkers behind with the grenades very nice lovely grenades it allows the hellions to really come in and the phoenix was just a little out of position now they're gonna have to start lifting but we actually left three hellions on the ground so you still have one shot potential against the probes a couple of hp probes will go down at the end as well that's 10 workers killed successful attack in from coffee and uh, I love the fact that he's then going into the Cloak Banshee behind this, the Marine Tank. I love the units he's going to have on the follow-up for this. I feel like this is going to put uh, Coffee in a great spot. I think it is. It absolutely is, actually. I mean, don't get me wrong. This Stalker squad, if there isn't going to be a bunker, I mean, this tank already. I, he's looking quite pretty here. Going into three barracks as well. I like this opening a lot by him. It's just, it's groovy, isn't it? I mean, the Phoenix do have a lot of potential here to lift up the tank, and then the Stalkers can deal damage. But, very importantly here, he got sight of the cloak upgrade. Now, he does have a robo available, does have one observer. Now, that observer has a big, big, <laughs> big task here. Unfortunately, it's in the slight wrong location here, but it's still close enough that this Banshee shouldn't get too much done. Yep, the uh, ah, Phoenix turn great, around. Great play. Yeah. It's going to be able to shoot this down, so only a couple of probes falling. That's kind of what you need because you already took a bunch of damage, right? The last thing you wanted was to take even further damage from this. So uh, that is nice. The Marine tank setup was kind of poking forward. The Stalkers kind of traded with them ever so slightly. Not the biggest of deals. And that's where we're going to be chilling at the moment as we resettle back down onto this natural. Coffee is, you know, sieged his tanks. And as he moves into Stimming Plus One, it doesn't really seem as though he's got any real purpose to move onto the map anytime soon. No, definitely not. I mean... <clears throat> That cloak, for everybody watching, that's a massive commitment. Like, what he wanted out of that was, you know, another 10 probes or so, or, or at least time bought. Because, I mean, he even cancelled the second Banshee because the Phoenix got on top there just to see it happening. For two probes, a tiny bit of lost mining time, not what you're after. So we can definitely say that SUV is... Uh, more more than back in this game now not necessarily winning because he lost 10 workers earlier but he got himself out of a really bad situation yep yeah managed to drag himself out of that one and now here we go colossus extended thermal lens coming through the nexus building as well from uh, scv as he just texts then takes the third base i mean obviously still work account not brilliant and obviously having a late third is not ideal interesting to see what coffee does because obviously right now currently on that three rack setup is he going to drop a third cc is he going to fully send this with the three racks i mean it looks as though he was saving up money there so he could have afforded the third for a couple moments but then he added on some more production again as he does start to push out there's going to definitely be some aggression and I, I have to imagine there's still a third behind this because we are continuously going up towards 400 minerals being floated so i can imagine that's only a matter of time i mean he's going to have five tanks out soon like if he does go for a third, it's going to be... He's still going to bank on dealing a lot of damage with this push. And I mean, he, he's just going to make sure he's got solid production here. Like, really solid. And he's brought SUVs with this as well, Wally. I'm not sure if he is going to go for a third. He's, he's getting a Widow Mine as well behind this. But he knows what yeah. kind of army he's against now. And there's, there's no charge in sight. No blink in sight either. Like, Coffee's in great shape here. I love this drop as well. A big Gabe drop. Yeah, a little drop over to the side, and a couple of Phoenix actually going to have the super battery to help, but that means no super battery on the third base, so the tanks encroaching on that position are likely going to find a huge amount of success there. And obviously, you have the uh, tanks having to take it very slow, and I love the missile turrets too, just in case Phoenix try and come into this position. They're also going to help against Colossus, so missile turrets are not a bad thing, and that's where the extra money was going. I was continuously wondering where that you know mineral bank was going to head. That wasn't a huge one, but it had me thinking of the third. If you spend it on missile turrets, that's going to help you with this push and keep you committed here. The tank shots immediately do so much. Now the Phoenix do commit in. We're going to drop them pretty quickly, though. That means the tanks are back on the ground. And, man, this was oh. brutal. The Colossus going down in the process, and Coffee is on one heck of a position right now. Yeah, I mean, look at that. That is such a setup outside this base, and he is so damn committed to this push, but I think it's the right move here because that base is forfeit. And as SCV backs off, it's not as if his army's getting significantly better here. I mean, charge is so damn far away. Lost all those Phoenix, by the way. Like, his army is looking so bleak against these tanks. Yeah. Ooh, nice, nice fire on this uh, <laughs> SCV line. Uh, it really is. Coffee just needs to keep getting the tanks further, you know, closer and closer to range. A couple of times the SCV's getting ahead of themselves, as you just mentioned. 
Okay, if these tanks just keep pushing up, you can only imagine good things from them as the Marines drop off. A couple of probes begin to go down, so damage being done nicely here. That is going to be a dead battery as well. These tanks will siege up, and again, just in range of that Colossus for a couple moments is huge. We're going to see the opportunity to get this super battery. We don't mind the pylon, maybe depower that robo facility. Yeah, I mean, dropping the main base, dealing damage as well, and Coffee just keeps on adding it up right now as he's got a 20 supply lead. And I mean, he is now finally building a third back at home too, so he's moving into that. It's just this problem of these tanks can never be broken out from. It's just too much. There's just too many of them, and there's no way to kind of do it. I mean, I guess we're about to have charge. I guess that's the plan, but... Way too little, way too late. Way too late, yeah, indeed. I mean, oh, those zealots are so sad right now. This is moments before charge is done. I mean, that back line just getting absolutely melted here. Absolutely solid play out of Coffee here. And uh, yeah, that's what I like to see out of my boy Coffee. 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 Yeah, Coffee is super effective here against SCV. And he will take the 1 0 lead in the best of three. So. I mean, very Coffee-esque, right? Aggression from the start. He opens with that proxy, and he just doesn't stop. We know he loves his time and base builds. We know he loves his kind of weirdness in TVP. You know, very Hero Marine-esque. And, and that's exactly what he hits with here. Just super aggro. Pulls a few SCVs. Not afraid to double down and build the turrets and be like, yeah, this is the position I want to hold forevermore. Uh, and yeah, that puts us into... I mean, a very fun game to watch if you're a Coffee fan. A uh, rough one for SCV because it felt like the moment those tanks first got sieged, he was just he was just doomed like he, he had just no way to ever break out of that and again charge if charge finished like 20 seconds after their first siege maybe there's a chance but then charge finishing when like the game is ending already that was maybe his one chance that just never got the chance to come through it's also like that that opening with the two reaper and four hellions like the grenades to keep those initial stalkers away from his units dealing the damage was really clean out of coffee right like just a, a lot of setup and you can feel the the one, two, like it's a, a several step process to getting this tank push to work in, and it just all lined up beautifully. And you, you're looking at the game, it's like, is he going to go for a third? And then when you see it all accumulate like that, it's like, nah, he, he made all the right moves, didn't he? Yeah, yeah no, I, I, like I say, the third, you know, sometimes you kind of take the third behind a push like that, right? And you're like, cool, I get the economy, but he just wanted to build the turrets. Like, he was just going to double down on, like, I want this push to do a lot. And clearly knew that it could, and obviously went in and did as well. And it's off the back of killing 10 probes early, right? Those Hellions get in, they do a bunch of damage. You know it's a struggle for the probes to then afford everything they need to hold an attack like that. So you're right to then kind of go for the double down. And maybe if he didn't get that damage, maybe then he does say, okay, cool, I'm going to push, but I'm also going to have my third behind it. That's the kind of choice you can make from that point. So, uh, great game one from Coffee, and he's going to go into game two. Oceanborn, we keep seeing Oceanborn as game two today, Ben. Every single time. Uh, you know, it's a, it's 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 a good standard map, isn't it, Wardy? It, it really is. Like it's, so. it's been around for a while now, and the players like it. Again, not going too much to the crazy stuff, but ah, I, I like I like it. You you really get to test your metal. It's one of those as well where it's like no significant advantage on either side. Ah, good stuff, Wardy. Good stuff. All right, well, let's get into it as we have in the top left-hand corner the player who is up 1-0 to zero in this best of three, looking to improve to 2-1 and one in this Asia uh, Swiss group. It is coffee. <laughs> Can't not say it like that anymore, mate. No, I mean, I, I see his name now. I'm just like, freaking hell. I, I see this big, you know, unevolved wheezing, and I'm just like, yeah, that's you, mate. That's you. All right, spotting him the bottom right. As our red Protoss, it is SCV. I liked everything about that opening from Coffee. And here, he's sending out an SCV, but this one, it's after the gas has started, so a little bit later. This usually is very indicative of a engineering bay block. And I mean, Cyclones have changed. They're not as good at switching targets, but that doesn't mean they're not good initially on the single target they have. And also, have a bit more health as well. I would not be surprised if this just turns into a nice engineering bay block from Coffee, and you see that SCV is scouting around for that SCV, or at least something, and he does spot it nice and early, and he's pulling another S or probe as well, just to try and get things done over here. So, I mean, this, honestly, nice prep out of SCV, but that dancing, that RNG, yeah. is definitely on Coffee's side. I mean, Coffee. Tim, he is putting the evidence as well, like he's stopping build and restarting, which gives the SCV a chance to then move to a different build position. And that's exactly what's happening there, and it causes you to actually get, what, like, 
half the engineering bay up, whereas if you'd done nothing at all, this would have been like 10-20% of an engineering bay. So it's a big HP difference now for these probes to chew through. That's going to make a big difference for the next couple of moments. Absolutely is. Absolutely is. And I mean, I think SCV handled that all pretty well as well, you know? Like, scouted for it, got to see it coming into the base, pulled the probes pretty damn decently, but Coffee still made the most out of that and still back at home, getting everything sorted. I wonder what that SCV is coming down here for. I wonder if he's going to try and go for, like, Proxy another starboard? factory or well, a starport. Yeah, it could second be. factory be wild. Yeah. The, the way that he's positioned it, though, it could be either or. Maybe you're absolutely right with the starport. Goes for the command center as well. So, I mean, there are layers to this, which we see from uh, Kofu uh, in the first game. And so far, step one, it's kind of been accomplished. Yeah, and there's going to be that starport. I think also the fact he only has one gas. So double factory production would typically be for cyclones, right? And then it's hard to afford off one gas, even though cyclones mm. are cheap as chips nowadays. So, uh... Yeah, going to be seeing the, uh, the Hellion production instead, and obviously four Hellions and a proxied starport can be pretty darn deadly. We saw how good the Hellions were last time, and that was with no medevac at all, so potential is absolutely there. You cheap as chips, mate. I, I always like casting with you and Polaris, so like <laughs> yeah. the true the true northern the English northerners. coming out and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I, <laughs> I, was, I was reading a book to my little boy the other day, and there was like a, a it's a rhyming book, right? And it was like a wonder rhymed with anaconda. And <laughs> Alice, Alice looked at me and she was like, that is the most English rhyme I've ever heard. And I'm like, what, why? And she's like, because if an American said that, trying to rhyme wonder with anaconda, they couldn't do it, you know? Like that is, because we add an R to all the A's at the end, you know, yeah. kind of thing. But, but yeah, I, I, I always love the English English uh, out of you lads. And so far, SCV getting up this nice little wall at the front. Oh, Ooh. he misses it a little bit. I tell you what, that could have been real spicy. That could have been real spicy, but he's going to have the medevac. So I think he didn't even really want to go in anyways, right? Because he wants to drop no. into the main instead. Now, these units still have to guess where this uh, drop is coming from, and he is going to move <gasps> in position, so he's going to be in the right place. That's going to give him the defense here. It means he gets rid of one Hellion very quickly. We're still in one-shot range, though, so these Hellions will still get e some kills. We're going to get a couple, maybe even can lift into the Medivac to get away, remember? And then we can drop on the Natural and still get some kills slowly with the two Hellions over the next few moments. Or even just nine min mining time is obviously a big deal, too. So I would say not the most successful Hellion drop of all time, but it still gets the job done, especially with the additional uh, denied mining on the natural now. No, uh, yeah, I, all things said and done, I think SV has got away with murder this game. Like, uh, you know, uh, he's been very well prepared, but any one of these things could have resulted in, in him just losing the game. And that is one of the frustrating things about StarCraft, where in the blink of an eye, you know, you, you're just die everything dies but he had probes in the right positions to spot where things were uh coffee kind of mishit one of those shots there that didn't target the pro same probe it was all different ones and now we've got a game where if you were to just tune in and look at both these situations you'd be like oh yeah pretty standard uh tvp right and i mean it kind of is in a way because this kind of stuff has become far more normal but the way that they've got there not the most standard yeah no, it's definitely been a, a weird routing to get to this point, but yeah, from this point on, I mean, third Nexus finishes, the Stim coming up, we're still playing Marine Tank, and a Liberator to kind of harass with too. You're right, it does look pretty normal across the board, just was not the easiest and smoothest ways to get into this stage. Have that charge on the way from SCV, so just continue to kind of get his tech on the go, following up that blink with the charge is obviously never a bad thing. Um... Yeah, honestly looking fine. Even going to take map control of this Stalker army, which is good because Coffee's starting to push a little bit. And if you can greet this out on the map, that's great. He's pulling a few SCVs again. So you really want to stop this getting in position because once it's in position, we saw in the last game just how troublesome that can be. Absolutely. I, I love the fact that he came out to greet this with what he has. Hey, those oh. Hellions, man. They're back. They're back for seconds over here in three probes. This is just tasking the multitasking of his opponent. But that Stalker count is actually quite scary here like coffee has yeah. to be careful with this army and those poor hellions shooting the wrong target wardy they could have done so oh. much man like they had so much potential here as the stalkers want to go for the liberator but they take a big tank shot in the process which means that lib will survive the stalkers took a beating i'm just not sure if coffee has enough to really be here super battery already popped that feels very preemptive 
Unless we're going to go right now, we do just blink straight in. We get rid of the live. Oh, the time no. took a second volley, which is a big pain, as now we lose the Immortal as well. The battery was busy healing up Stalkers, and that was actually very good for Coffee. so that part of the fight way better for him. Yeah, and shield battery's be been used now. The overcharge, that is, and now he can start to solidify. That Marine count's getting higher as well. Charge is done, but one Zealot... I mean, those tanks need to shoot the Sorkers. That's exactly what they do. That Immortal being a little bit timid as well in the top there, running away. And Coffee, I tell you what, he is absolutely making the most out of this push because this looked like it was kind of, I don't want to say doomed to, to, to fail, but this has done a lot of damage. And look at this, very patient out of him, just being like, you know what? I think, I think I've done as much damage as I can get done. Yeah, he ends up pulling back, so heading to the upper left-hand side now instead. And uh, probably not a bad idea, especially with charge done, a couple more Zealot Warpins, and the tanks are just so much less effective against Zealots than they are the Stalkers. So I think that's absolutely us heading back in the, the right kind of direction now. As we have a couple more barracks coming up, plus one attack, combat shield all coming through that Robo Bay, and a couple extra gateways coming in as well. As we have our probes still producing, and it is a uh, second Robo Bay from SCV. Whoa, uh -oh, getting a little bit caught up in the game. That's a mistake. I mean, the game is close enough that the cost of an extra Robo Bay can absolutely have an impact on what you're doing. So Coffee, for all that pushing, he was only on two barracks, and he did get Stim fairly nice and early, and he's going up to five barracks now on two bases. So, I mean, these little mistakes where you have, like, double Robo Bay instead, these are crucial in this kind of situation. Losing lost mining time as well, because Coffee... He does not plan on making this a long one, Wardy. Like, Combat Shield has finished up. I mean, blinking into that medevac, he will deal with the medevac, but these, yeah, these are stim marines, man. They deal, they, they deal a lot of damage, yeah. Yeah, this should have been the kind of trade where you just didn't need to blink in, right? Because if you by blinking in, that's where these marines can actually finish off the stalkers. Otherwise, this was never going to be a factor. Five probes as well. I mean, that was actually so bad for SDV. Coffee somehow gets an amazing trade off of the tiniest of drops. He's already pulled the SCVs from the natural, so these zealots are going to be, yeah, holding up reinforcements. And actually, this uh, tank is not going to go down, is it? No, it survives too, so it might get to come across the map. The SCVs are here, and Coffee's ready for an attack in against someone who's really lacking splash damage. Five siege tanks already on the front doorstep, and the SCVs to buffer as well is a huge factor. I mean, that disruptor that's on the way cannot come soon enough right now for SCV. It really can't, and... It's, it's kind of sad, right, when your Zealot run by turns up and it's like, all right, kill the SCVs. Wait a minute, where are they? They're in your base, mate. And, I mean, SCV still has a lot of oh, units, no. but uh, it's definitely a little bit all over the shop here, isn't it? Like, he Zealots ran in alone and the rest of the army moving back, and now he's on two bases like his opponent. And he fired the Disruptor way too early there as well. It was not, in no world was that ever going to have a chance of connecting. Love the tanks as well, target firing the Stalkers initially and the Immortals, and look how quickly they meld. Let the Bio deal with the Zealots, don't let any friendly fire come off. And you can see the army supply of Coffee, 61 to 26, is looking absolutely spot on. This Disruptor shot's beautiful, triple tank shot. So we are going to get two of them low and kill off one, but now the Robo Facility depowered. I mean, Coffee just has too many units. He pushes into the natural expansion, and SCV is fine, uh, fighting his final fight here in game number two and in this series because Coffee is just not slowing down. GG's. Coffee. I mean, he played good, man. He, he, he did. Like, I, I love his... And this is something you see from Coffee every time, which is part... Like, we've become a fan because of his name, obviously, being Coffee. But we've also just enjoyed, because it's been good, good play. It's like... He has this whole plan set up where it's like a one, two, three punch. And it's not necessarily it's not necessarily like the fanciest late game or anything because he never made it late game. He just went two base. But he is so aggressive, so on point, doesn't really miss a beat with the micro either. Like that that stalker situation in the natural where it's like he blinked on him and then it's like, all right, I focus fire all these bad boys down. I, I trade really well, kill five probes, this liberator as well. Like it's just super nicely synced up, like very clean, aggressive. Uh, Terran play. Nope, it's uh, it's great to see, and it is uh, it's always fun to right, to, to see how he does. I mean, he had that uh, he was in the finals of one of these Asia regions a couple seasons ago when he played Oliver. He took the first map. It, it never came to much more than that, but he's just been a fun player to support and watch since he's really leveled up a bit over the last year or so. As Coffee does finish off our Asia matches for the day. It's day six of Swiss. And it's round three of action that's starting to be rounded out. So this is the first half of round three for Asia. And an army 2-1's XY. Oliveira 2-0 Silky. 
Nice 2 0 Haas and Coffee 2 0 SCV. All those players that won today are now 2 and 1 in the group. Everyone that lost is 1 and 2. Tomorrow, we have the qualification and elimination matches from Asia. So, the couple of guys that are looking to qualify are 2 and 0 right now. And then the few guys who are actually fighting for their tournament life. So, that will be tomorrow for Asia. And that says us done for Asia for today, which means it's time for us to head into Europe. We are four minutes away from Europe officially starting, which is exactly the amount of time we usually have for a break. So we're just going to head into it. Europe will be on the way. I believe it's Wayne versus Shadone up first. So we'll head into that and we'll see you guys for Europe in just a second.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, everybody. Morty and Demi here bringing you action. First from Asia, that's wrapped up, and now we head into Europe. As we enter Swiss round three here, we're going to also be seeing a lot of players in Europe who are one and one in the standings. Let's have a look at how these groups have been panning out. First of all, we're going to hop on over to the group A, which is going to be featuring uh, the players at 2-0 in here. Actually kind of fun. Clement Goblin and then Skillers and Spirit at the top. Goblin getting the win over here. Marine who has to play against Spats today. We're going to be starting off with Wayne versus Shadow. And there's also Mana versus Battle B in this. Of course, the players down on that elimination side. DNS, Milky Cow, for example, going to be one to watch for. Uh, in tomorrow's game. So that's Group A of Europe, of course. In Europe, we have two full groups of Swiss, which means there's even more action to talk about. So if we do this little special button press, this should just update. And no, that's not the schedule, it's the standings. And we can have a look at Group B as well. Any second now, there it is. So over in Group B, mm -hmm. obviously having a pretty fun time as well. As, um, yeah, it's been a... Um, it's been a decent time over in Group B, and uh, we have got ourselves Max back Showtime. Hostum and Raynor all at 2-0. and Hostum will be playing against Raynor tomorrow. Max Bax will be playing against Showtime. Uh, today's games will be featuring Akron versus Young Yakov. Uh, Night Phoenix versus Christiana. Bly versus Kung Fu Banda as well. And Lampo versus Youth Thermal. Youth Thermal playing random, Ben. He picked up a cheeky win over Drogo in a PvP and a PvT the, uh, TVP the other day. So, uh, you excited to see some random play later? I, I am, and those are, like, I don't get to tune into everything, but that's one of the matches that I went back and watched, because I was like, wait a minute, like, he played PvP, he lost the first game, and then he, mm -hmm. he played PvP and won the second, and actually played really good, you know, it was like yeah. some DT into Immortals and stuff, and and then won, like, uh, Terran, right? Uh, he, he just, he played solid, and whenever it's Lambo versus Euthermal, like, that's a matchup of old, like, back when Euthermal yeah. used to play super professionally, they both were like, I'm better than the other guy. Like, and it used to be, give it, given the kind of like feeling behind it, that it was like both of them feel they're better than the other one, and whoever loses, it's like, oh, I shouldn't have lost against that guy, and it's like, oh, I'm obviously the better player. And like, I, I just love it. So I'm, I'm excited. I do think Lambo is obviously in better shape right now, but Haas, I mean, there's a few surprises, isn't there? Like Goblin in Group A, yeah, being Hero Marine and getting top top uh, four in so far. Even beating Mana, that was a bit of a surprising series. But then, uh, yeah, in this one, Harsom doing as well. And Raynor as well. That's not actually undoable for Harsom. Uh, he, he's actually given Raynor a bit of a bit of trouble we recently. Knocked him out of Atlanta. And now Raynor is in Korea playing on the European server in the middle of the night. Bad ping. It's actually set up for Harsom to potentially get a win there as well and just qualify to playoffs straight away. That would be sick. Again, those matches, I believe, I think, again, in Europe, it's going to be all matches at 1-1 one one today, like we had in Asia. And we're going to see the 2-0s and 0-2s play tomorrow. Uh, our first matchup is actually going to be PVZ. And we're ready to jump into this in the top left-hand corner of Oceanborn, which is our favorite map of the day so far, apparently. A blue Protoss from Platinum Heroes is Shadone. And spawning over in the bottom right, playing as the Red Zerg, it is Wayne. Formerly known as Ratata, formerly known as Vanya, now he's Wayne. I just love that on Discord he's called Wayne Ratvan. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, that's what his name is on Discord, he's called Wayne Ratvan. <laughs> what what team is he playing for currently? Because I don't know if they all fancy He's on uh, the Starlight Twinkle squad, I believe. Which that's is... also a funny name. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it it is, and it's also kind of an interesting key team because they they had Spirit and then Spirit left to join uh, Navi, and now I think Starlight Twinkle is actually Wayne. I think Cham's still on Starlight Twinkle. Maybe Christiana is too, and uh, and then like a bunch of Chinese players. So it's uh, wait, yeah. did did what Spirit on Starlight Twinkle? Did he go yeah, from for, for about six weeks or so? From Sidestorm okay, to... So very... Oh, did he get picked up by Sidestorm first? I think he went from Starlight to Sidestorm to Na'Vi. I think that's the, the route Oh, spirit really? Game. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I remember being on Sidestorm for quite some time, just because I thought, hey, that's a pretty sick roster for, like, Team Leagues, you know, having yeah. Spirit and oh, no, uh, Max Packs on the go. Um, but, yeah, these players that we're looking at right here, like Wayne Shadown, in my head, when I think about the tip-top in Europe, like, these guys are not necessarily your top eight contenders, but they are guys that are scary for the top eight contenders. Like, 
Wayne has never been your, I'm going to sit back, play that nice, safe, late game Zerg style, you know? He's, he's all about, he's the mini a laser in a way. Like, if there is a, sh a sharp timing that is hard to defend, but, you know, you can execute it and do well with it, Wayne will absolutely be on that. And he's absolutely dangerous with it. Like, I, I think he was the player that had that series against Gung Fu, <laughs> which was, uh, maybe it was on... Was it oh, a map no. like this? I think it was, you know, where it was just like a disaster. Like he absolutely had the game and then like three storms landed and killed 200 supply. It was beautiful. Yeah. Um, maybe it was Site Delta, actually. Site Delta, I think. Um, but but yeah, it's he's a fun one. And Shadown, he's also a Protoss with like his own funky twist on things. Like I think he's also reeled it in a little bit where he's not giga cheesy all the time. He's actually quite solid behind it. But yeah, not he's also quite a tricky player to go up against. Yeah, and, and I mean we've seen Shadon have have moments in this event as well and these regionals before, right? He, he challenged Clem that season, right? He gave Clem a loss and a run for his money, and that was a uh, a good time. So, you know, to me these are two players who are absolutely challenged to make playoffs. They can absolutely be top sixteen in this region, but they're not going to be there every time. And it's you know it's never a guarantee for them to get there. And that's obviously shown so far by their score lines. They're both one and one. Obviously, again, fighting to kind of improve on that today. And uh, I think that's obviously going to be a very fun one to watch and uh, to see kind of pan out. The, the previous matches for these guys as well very interesting because Wayne actually lost to Battle B initially before beating Fordjumi, but he did not look good against Fordjumi. He really should have probably lost the uh, game number uh, two that he played. Uh, Fordjumi just pulled the trigger like a moment too soon. And then Shadon beat DNS, but lost to Spirit, and I don't think there's any shame in losing to Spirit, so actually in terms of form, in terms of what I've seen from these guys in this event so far, I actually think I go into this kind of favoring Shadon, but on any given day I would have normally have picked Wayne, I think, so that's kind of a fun factor as well. I, I'd be totally with you. Um, like, <clears throat> it, in my head, like, Wayne, he's kind of had these surprising results here and there, where it's like, you know, he, he's dangerous, man, like... Uh, was it in WTL where he went like 1-1 one, one against several or something? I mean, it was yeah. probably like, a it was a weird day. And it was like that uh, frickin' A. Rod who set, of course. It was like that kind of map. But he he's dangerous on those. Already these oracles having a nice little visa over here, Wardy. This is uh, really good stuff for Shadown so far. Yep, I'm getting in. Five drones already going down. It's a fantastic start. There's Twilight Council, Forge, Robo Facility halfway done. All of that coming through. The extra gates coming up. The Nexus coming down. The charge on the plus one continuing to build as well. So we just get plenty of upgrades and setup. And obviously any workers you get along the way with your oracles is only going to be a big plus. You know, Wayne loves to play aggressively. He will play timing focused. And any worker you kill is going to reduce the strength of those timings, right? So... That's going to be your kind of road to victory here for Shadon. Reduce the strength of those timings, give yourself the best possible chance of surviving through. Mm. The longer you force this, I think the better off it will be for Shadon. Also, so, okay, Shadon only went up to two oracles here. Like, very often, Protoss can go two, three. Either one's pretty damn good. He's already got damage done. He's also not going for blink immediately. This is very quickly into charge, and he's got a forge on the go. It does look like Wayne is going to go very heavily into Roaches. A lot of the Zergs like to go for the melee upgrades, but he's directly into that range upgrade category. And he's on that perfect drone count as well, where he can morph in a few extra buildings and get onto like 66 drones, but taking that fourth base pretty damn early as well. And he's got away with a lot of greed here within regards to how he's been droning. And oh, these oracles a bit... In fact, is there only one? Okay, okay. That was a little bit funny there. These oracles just being met by one queen. That was very fortunate for Wayne. Yep. No, that was actually very uh, uh, fortunate indeed as we just have the Temple Archives, by the way, finishing. So this is going to turn into potentially a bit of a timing focus from Shadon. He's going to have Archons plus one in charge. Like, this is a very aggressive army that can absolutely do a lot. So let's see what he wants to try and achieve. He's warping into the bottom side. I mean, even just running into and cancelling the fourth base could be a pretty big win for him right now. Again, slow down the Zerg. He's going to not go for the fourth. Instead, he actually wants to try and fight the fifth. No, he see, uh, sorry, the third. He kind of doesn't decide. Now he is going to decide to go into the third base and going to go for some drones here. There's Roaches out, so maybe he would have been better off just trying for the fourth base again, that cancel. But he clearly believes in his fight to some extent. We're warping in a few more Zelts as we go. Just got to keep that prism safe. So far, we're okay, but this is just too many Roaches, I think. Oy. So we get ourselves seven, eight drones, but we lost an Archon. Lost an Oracle to the Spore Crawl on the south side during this as well. And that will be that. Yeah, I, you know, that all looked a bit 
indecisive from shutdown. Like that was the word that I would absolutely use to describe that. It it was a bit all over the shop, where to attack, where not to attack. Uh, even kind of saving a drone with the stasis there, it was <laughs> about as unfortunate as it could go. But it's not as if he's not geared up behind it for something else. Like he, he's getting the Immortals out, going up to double Robo. But this, this is where Wayne is the most dangerous. Like I, I talked about that 66 drone number being the perfect saturation for three bases. And he's done nothing but produce roaches since then. Shutdown, he's in trouble here, Wardy. Yeah, no, just pure rush production, and and yeah, this is where Shadon's gonna, you know, really be punished for having lost any amount of supply previously. Storm is not done yet, and I don't think Wayne is gonna be kind of waiting around to give him a chance to get Storm. He's gonna morph a couple of Ravages, but he should just be pushing forwards and going. I mean, Storm might finish up during the fight, but how much damage will be done by then? There's 112 to 48 army supply. It's very one-sided, and as we push in initially, looks pretty good for Wayne. Looks as though Storm 10 seconds away has a chance to get finished up, but, I mean, the position's already here for the Roaches. Let's see if the Storm can make any amount of difference. I'll tell you what, Shadown's being so patient with putting up a battery overcharge here, isn't he? And, I mean, Storm is ready, and Wayne, that is one of his worst enemies here. The Storms are big. The Warp Prism's still alive. The juggling starting to happen now. That shield battery overcharge kind of went off on no units up there in the north. Yeah. That was definitely problematic and Wayne here is just pumping out units probes are pulled that's never a sign that you want that immortal in the south being left for done over there and that's just too much Wayne yep too much Wayne is just going to be successful right I mean he's just going to keep on breaking onto this base the third will fall the robo facility one of them is here as well so that's going to get shut down at some point another immortal drops and Shadon just kind of picked the wrong build for playing against Wayne I feel like like Zealot Archon against a guy that likes to be aggressive and build up a lot of roaches this was a rough choice to build, and especially attacking in the way he did. I honestly think, imagine he just goes and cancels the fourth base, pulls back home, doesn't necessarily lose anything. Then I think this is a defendable position, right? Because you get Storm up, and you get a couple of Immortals. That is good enough. It's just that initial loss of units for not gaining anything on the other side of the map. That really, I mean, let's say he didn't gain anything. He got like eight drones or so. I just feel like that could have been and should have been so much more if Shadon really wanted to see success in this. Yeah, that... Um... That was definitely not what he was looking for. Second map will be be Alcyone, which uh, also a fairly uh, standard map uh, for these guys today. But definitely, that was the kind of game that Wayne wants to play. You know, like it's it's not super fancy, super crazy. It's pretty damn straightforward. You defend, you attack. Like that. That's basically Wayne's games in a nutshell. Like, or he's just the one straight up attacking. But your opponent making it making the choice even easier for you. Frickin' frickin' A. Like a uh, nice play out of Wayne just to make sure that that game went as planned. And yeah, Shadown has to be a little bit more careful with his build order choice, I think. Yeah, well going into Alcyone, this is obviously a map where it can get a little bit interesting because of that gold base. If the Zerg chooses to take that early, do you then want to try and be aggressive onto that? Do you let them have it? Those are questions to ask, so Alcyone will be our map. And we will see what Wayne and Shadown have in store for us here. As we head into map number two. We'll be starting in the top right-hand side from the Platinum Heroes, the Blue Protoss, who is down one. It is Shadon. And spawning over in the bottom left with a nice fiery win in game one, it is Wayne. We'll see what Shadon comes up with this time. Uh, I mean... Alcyone is still a decent map for Oracle openings. You, you do tend to find Oracle openings have just been like the, the bread and butter of Protoss uh, versus Zerg for a long time now. Just that, that, that build definitely requires your opponent to not be that prepared or a guy that's looking to play a later stage in the game. But Wayne, it just, he already had it in mind that he wanted to go Roaches, didn't he? And for Charge Lot Archon, especially in those numbers, it wasn't massive numbers. And I mean, you do kind of have to go very quickly. Um, this game, Shutdown did go for a little bit of a hatch block. So the third hatch will be at the third base and not at the natural. Already something that Zergs do plan ahead for, but a nice little start for Shutdown here. Yeah, it's going to get that ready to go when we do have a Proby. Just nibbling a little bit here and there as well. Hatch Gats and Pool coming up, a couple of drones coming about. As we have ourselves the yeah, next is dropping in. Obviously, we'll see what the uh the tech will be eventually from Shadow, and that's gonna tell us what kind of game he wants to play. 
Uh, again, I'll sign you. Sometimes the map players play a bit differently on because of the possible gold base, but there's no gold yet from Wayne, so probably just a Stargate out of Shadon. And then we'll see what his follow-up turns out to be this time on the back of those oracles. Uh, that would be my assumption. I mean, Wayne can, again, play kind of crazy too, but... I mean, like I say, to me, he's less of, like, this crazy, oh, I'm going to knight us all in you guy versus just... I'm going to set up normally and then cut drones and hit you with the timing. So... Mm. We'll see uh, if that is in store for us yet. We'll see if he goes straight at Roaches, because you're right. Some players do still play that melee upgrade. We maybe don't go all the way to, like, plus two melee nowadays. We play melee into missiles later on, but he really did just hard commit to Roaches early in that last game. Obviously worked out wonders for him. Game so we'll see if that's the plan mm. again. As uh, Shadon going to hit us up with a little pause here. Uh, hopefully nothing too major. We'll get back into this ASAP. Yeah, we had a pause earlier as well. Luckily, it was fixed very, very quickly. I believe these players do go on different accounts yeah, for they this. Do. Yep. The All right. Tournament so some, 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 yeah. So sometimes it's just setting yourself up Game nicely. Easy. Maybe a hotkey was missing, but normally just, you know, control paste it over. Just make sure everything's the same. But it will be a Stargate again for Shadown and. You know, it's, it's just like the nicest way to get into a normal game, not be caught off guard, get to scout, get to get vision, get to be safe for your third base as well. Ah, just a, a nice way to open up. Yep. Nice way to open up. I mean, like you say, just going to be safe, steady. Stargate halfway done already. That hatchery dropping down from Wayne as he takes a very normal three base setup. And uh, yeah, Link Speed's about halfway done. Warp Gate is building from Shadon. Again, next, very much so just expecting this to be oracles out of the Stargate. Early game PvZ does not leave a lot to the imagination when a Stargate comes down. It's usually three to four minutes of the expected. And then with the oracles, we obviously get something to start to watch. Mm. And just on about this map, you did mention the gold base. Oh, let's those adepts finish up. Okay, they hit so far. Not bad. We'll be able to deal with this very small number of things, but Wayne not losing any drones so far. That's what he's after. And he just holds down the drone key. Uh, when it comes to the gold base, it's obviously far more beneficial for Zerg on this map in that they can get it very quickly as their fourth base and then really get pumping. And if you told Wayne, like, hey, man, there's a fourth base on this map for, like, a gold. And it's like, really? Like, I, I can all in even harder now? It's like, I, I, I bet he's going to go for it. Like, I can't see him not. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it seems like that's the... Uh... The kind of the trigger for Wayne is they say, whoa, I can be aggressive, let's go. Uh, adepts show up. The Oracle will fight a few of the Lings protecting the Adepts. I mean, at least we're losing Lings and not drones, right? I mean, anytime mm -hmm. you lose drones, it's bad. You're losing Lings, yeah, they have to be replaced, but losing drones really affects your economy. The Adept comes across here. The Oracle will go one more time, but it's going to be in the middle of all these Queens. I'm not sure it's getting out alive. It's close. Ooh. It just gets out. That's dangerous, because losing Oracles, loses map control, loses defensive options again against Wayne. You want to have as much possible defense as you can. Apps absolutely do. Like, even for stasis is later on or just revelating that creep, you know, you don't want to be going for an observer to get rid of all that stuff, and you really lose a lot of tempo and really allow your opponent to just get going. It does look like the Twilight will be going down along with the Forge. So, so far, it could be very well the same kind of build, but on a map like this, I do like Stalkers being able to navigate over these mineral fields and three oracles do get to spot this fourth base going down which they are past that mineral field but they're not on the gold and shutdown should be able to get a nice little cancel here to start things off look at that the queens they want to get down there wadi but you need to get rid of two mineral fields to do it yeah what a great uh, play being able to get the fourth just with the oracles is great now the adept's going to show up too well that's one dead oracle surely it's the low hp one being targeted so it goes down immediately but the Adepts show up, and the Lings are not nearby. The Drones now have to pull, and this is seven workers already dead. So, again, Wayne is definitely struggling early here to, to just deal with his damage, deal with his aggression. And uh, Shadon is not going to commit to the Shade into the main. He's going to recall out instead. That should save all of these Adepts. And they do get out. And the Oracles, again, two of them still healthy at the very least. It was the one that was low that got targeted down. So, two healthy Oracles remaining. I mean, a great set of successes from Shadon. Cancelled fourth base, a bunch more Drones going down. Just fairly free damage being found across the course of this. I mean, he's lost three Adepts and an Oracle, but he's killed 11 drones, 16 Lings. And there's the Roach setup coming in from Wayne. But again, this is going to be done off of a pretty rough situation. Like, he's not as strong as he would want to be at this point in time. 
yeah, I, I very much like how Shadown has changed things up this game. It's just been more aggressive with Harass, like more commitment, but getting the damage done. And Wayne, he's getting himself set up to get up to about 66 drones, and yet again, and he's sharking around with these Zerglings. But you see here, Shadown, he's like, you know what? Second Robo, I've gone into Blink first, not the charge this game. I'm far more set up for a normal game. Wayne will get that Infestation Pit, which does open up Hive Tech later on. And having two Oracles in this group of gateway units, it's something you do have to respect to the, the Zerg, but Wayne, fortunately enough for him, is very quick on producing those Roaches nice and early here. Yep. Lots of roaches coming up as these few stalkers. I was don't have blink yet, but you do generally push before blink because there's not a lot to necessarily punish these stalks from being here, and especially if it's roaches. You know, this is where like lings could maybe surround, roaches cannot, but even lings would be, you know, tackled on by the oracles. So yeah, there's generally an answer to everything right now, and that's why Shadon can already be on the map. Roach, these, uh, roach speed finishes, and we head straight into the hydra den now as Wayne. So he's going to begin to move into this. Uh, but Shadon's tech is looking good. Two Colossi on the way at once. I mean, that's perfect against Hydras, right? So you're going to have good splash damage available against these kind of very fragile units. Again, I got to love a lot of what's going on right now. He is on a clock, though. Because it's, it's not as if Wayne is not going to be prepared, like, minutes down the line for this. Because a Hive tech is pretty quick. And Shadon, like, whenever you go Oracles, you're a little bit on a... Or rather, whenever you go Colossus, you're a little bit on a clock. Like, you know that they only have a certain amount of time to live until Vipers come out in the field. Unless you're in one of those late game situations where it's like the feedback fight against the Vipers and stuff. But will that get to this Lurk attack on the way for Wayne? So a very, very different game to game one. Yep, Lurk Den already in production. So if you can get the Lurkers, then again, a brilliant little something. You've got to imagine there's going to be a time in here with a few Colossi that sent Thermal Lance. That plus two attack of create all of that could hit just as Lurkers. Even if Lurkers are on the map, they're not going to be upgraded yet. So that really would be the time when Shadon looks to hit here to just minimize the effect of what Wayne is teching into. So we'll see if that mm. becomes an option for him right now. Still trying to be, you know, taking this on with the Stalkers a little bit. Clear out some creep. Anything you can do to make that future attack a little bit more, uh, you know, simple to commit to. Two Colossi shown up here as well, so we're very much so ready to kind of take this fight. As soon as the upgrades pop, we're going to be in position from the very get-go. Absolutely, and I mean, that gold base is vulnerable over here, and Vipers aren't, or rather, Hydras are in the mix here, and Colossus, they do do well against them, but that is a lot of Roaches getting very much on top of this Stalker Death Ball, but Wardy, I think Shadown, his army right now is just packing the muscle just enough that it needs. I gotta agree with you, it is looking good, the Colossi are not going to be touched by anything, the Vipers are on the way, but that's a long way to go, because you've got to wait from the build, consume some energy up, and there's three Colossi here right now, I believe a fourth is about to walk in from the top right of the screen, so we've got four Colossi about to come powering through, I mean this gold base doesn't stand a chance, Wayne just has to kind of bank on somehow, some way getting these Vipers available, and even then, hitting every single abduct doesn't guarantee you a defense here, First Lurk is coming up, but they're not quite ready yet either. I mean, the timing is absolutely pristine here from Shadon. He blinks on the Lurk as they will not even get a chance to burrow as one of them gets burrowed and it didn't even fire a shot off. There's the Abducts from the Vipers. Two Colossi do go down a third one as well now, but there's just too many Stalkers, which means that this game is done and dusted. And Shadon is going to be kicking this to a game number three. I like the change of pace that he did that game. Like, it was far less super committed with the yeah. attack that he did. But it was a lot of finesse play, which, you know, a lot of the harass did a lot of good damage. The adepts as well being used in combination killed a lot of zerglings as well as drones and just slowed down Wayne uh, massively. And it wasn't the kind of game that Wayne wanted to be playing where it's like, oh, I have to deal with this. I have to deal with that. I would just want to get going, man. And it's, yeah, a, a nicer uh, change of gear here for Shadown. So I'm, I'm Looking, I'm curious how Wayne is going to adjust because third map will be Ghost River, and this, it's it's a smaller map, Wardy. It, it definitely is trying to get in there, deal damage. Like I think it's far easier for a Protoss to get a good read on what the Zerg's going for on a map like this. I can absolutely imagine a world where Wayne just like knocks down rocks and like goes like super quick across the map and everything, you know. So. I can absolutely imagine that as we count down into Ghost River. Like you say, it's a very aggressive map. There's a lot of potential for aggression. To me, this is a Wayne playground. We'll see what Shadon has planned and in store to kind of make this uh, doable. Absolutely. Get, getting right on into it now. It's it's 
you know, it's refreshing when we do actually get to see some of these new maps, given how uh, tentative the players have been about actually playing on them. And I mean, I don't know who this one favours. Like, the third base is, is very obvious which one you have to take. It's very open for the Protosses, which for Wayne, you have to be like, hey, it's a very open third base, timing attack, let's go, go, go. But spawning over in the top left, currently 1-1 in this series. It is the blue toss, it is Shadown. Up right now, a red Zerk and the Starlight Twinkle. This is going to be Wayne. Ending up on game three here. It's early. Oh, am Ooh. I DC? Oh, it's, I, I see it too. It's the referee. Oh, Unbelievable. Thank goodness, you know, the ghost of Emil at it again. <laughs> yeah, ghost of Emil. Well, uh, our referee is going to time out here. I think we can resume without the referee. I don't think that's actually the end of the world, so that shouldn't be a problem apart from having to go through this countdown. And hey, at least it happened early in the game. That's always good news. Better than it happened mid-fight or anything like that. Yeah, mid-fight where you get to think about how you're going to obliterate your opponent and all oh, that cheese is coming. They have to wait a full minute for it to happen. It's like, ah! But <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, better, better time at the start than anything else, but... Well, yeah, what do you think about this map, Wardy, for this matchup? Yeah, you know what? I think it's very interesting. I think it's one of those maps where it really feels like there's a lot of potential options, right? Um, like, your base layout's kind of given, but then there is potential for the Zerg to be aggressive. There is potential for the Protoss to be kind of aggressive as well. Like, I mean, very short if you want to go for Adepts or something, whether that's with Glaives or just kind of like we saw last game, Adepts coming across the map alongside the Oracles, for example. So... Yeah, definitely some options across the board. Yeah, you know, it, it, this is my uh, this is my dad brain at this point. I even look at that natural base that's kind of blocked off by these minerals and these big rocks and being like, there was once upon a time that Protoss would utilize this and go for like Tempests in this area, like behind the natural. Even getting a Tempest behind the main and the natural would be really annoying. I, yeah, I... I see cheese when I see this kind of thing and just looking for the potential opportunities. It's it's lovely, but I am looking forward to see what uh, Shadown does. So far, too crazy uh, coming out of either player here. Nope, nothing too crazy at all. We've got uh, Nexus into the natural expansion and uh, we have plenty of time to, again, sit back and wait to see what the choices will be. Yeah, I, I do think uh, maybe we see Shadown switch it up a little bit but i think honestly what he's been doing has also been just good against or good for what this map is as well like i said just adepts wandering across will hit sooner will hit a bit harder so yeah uh, this map it's so intriguing to me as well because the longer this map goes like you are limited on bases you know it's not there's not just endless bases to take you kind of reach that maximum at six so you know you're kind of capped in terms of how much of a late game you can play as well and especially in pvz that can be very standoffish later in the game it kind of gets very intriguing because you're like, mm. oh, you know, you've become very standoffish and this map really encourages that, but then with less money available, so you're kind of on a timer from the very get-go in terms of how you're trading, how well you're putting out damage and so on. All of these things are pretty big factors. No, definitely, definitely. Wayne is doing a good do job droning up, shutdown again with the Stargate. Not too surprising at this point, obviously. Uh, Zergling Speed is on the go, taking the drones off the gas as well, just putting all the minerals you can possibly get into that drone saturation going. Getting the third base up at the natural as well. A standard is, a standard does. Yep. Very uh, straightforward at the moment as you just uh, see a couple of adepts. Gonna come across and see if they can find damage. Shadona has found damage early game every time so far, right? Uh, it took a little bit longer in game two, but he still got there eventually. The adepts definitely been a big part of that. So we'll see if that's something that Wayne can tighten up on, because obviously just a cleaner early game can set him up for success. But I mean, these adepts just commit in. That's a massive drone pull. The entire mineral line pulling away. We lose two wow. workers anyways. These lings will go down, and these adepts are barely even hurt. So this is a fantastic start. We come back around this side. We're going to get a third drone. Now we shade out. That's a hugely successful opening, because these adepts are still alive. Now Link Speed kicks in, but I don't think we've got enough lings left to kill these adepts, so... If the adepts just turn and fight, they should be good. And, uh... Oh, oh, they shade oh. away. I mean, messed up micro, right? He could have had a couple more adepts, uh, adept shots off there, but... Either way, the adepts are out alive. The damage done was good. A win already for Shadow in early game. 
Absolutely. I mean, Wayne will be able to maybe? Nah, I mean, I, I was thinking if he had a couple more links alive. Hey, even if he kept those links alive from earlier in that harass, maybe he could have got the cancel there. But here, this Oracle comes in, gets a little bit of extra damage done. I mean, the Oracle did stay maybe outstay as welcome a tiny bit. But so far, Shadown throughout the series just looks like he's getting better and better at dealing with Wayne. Yeah. No, I mean, definitely uh, definitely true, right? I mean, you're just uh, kind of dealing with aggression early, getting, you know, being very successful with your own aggression. Now we'll see what the Triple Oracle can do this game, because, again, the Oracles have definitely been a factor throughout the previous fights as well, so this is also going to be pretty uh, fun to see. As we just have Nexus coming up to finishing. It's, oh, another Oracle as well. That's going to be Oracle number four now building, so Shadon really believes in this Oracle count. That's two drones now, and, yeah, Oracle four. What an interesting choice as these adepts continue across the map. Very interesting. Like, there's no Twilight Council on the way either. Like, this is just a very prolonged harass stage of the game, isn't it? And I mean, mm -hmm. these adepts do get on just a handful of Zerglings. This is not enough to deal with this. Like, this is actually very, very scary if you're Wayne, but they are Ooh. caught fighting queens for maybe a bit too long here. Do get on into the main. Not too much to stop them just yet. You know, they're going to get a couple final drones. The low HP Adept finally target fired. And this will be the end of the Adept harass. So, yeah, I mean, now it kind of questions, was the fourth Oracle worth building at all? Because it does, like you mentioned, delay the Twilight Council. So that future tech is then slowed down. But then you do have an extra Oracle than usual to kind of go harass with. I would have liked that if this game was still in a chaotic stage with Adepts around and everything else. But now, well, I guess now we'll just see what four Oracles can do. I mean, they could activate and try and cancel off this fourth base. Uh, queens are here. We actually just dive on the Queens as well. That works. First Queen is going to eat a Transfusion. That's the only Transfuse available, I believe. We're going to get the Queen. We're going to pull back. And that's apparently going to be it. So all of that for one Queen. Pretty lackluster. Pretty lackluster. Like, sometimes I've liked it when people do go for a fourth Oracle. Say if one's, like, massively wounded. Just because it does allow more diving potential. Then you just use that one with your army to revelate and such. But this didn't look quite the case for Shadown. But he is going into very heavy gateway play here, getting the plus one. And it looks like Wayne is just going for very much the same old, same old. Oh, both Stalkers do die there. Keeping those alive would have been very nice for a shutdown. But now he is able to go on the map. And the fourth base is... Pr this is a, f a funny map. Because normally, the more bases you take, the more the closer to your opponent they become. But in a way, they get further away from your opponent. So... Mm -hmm. It is a little bit tricky for the Protoss to get in a position where you can actually deal with that four base nicely. Kind of have to go past the third base, which in Wayne's case, this game definitely works in his favor. Well, it's fun because the map is short to begin with, but then it doesn't get even shorter right over time because that's when, mm. you know, Terrans would always love this or Zerg Aggression would always love this. It actually has this weird moment on the fourth base where you're right, you go away from your opponent. So taking a fourth actually becomes quite naturally easy as long as you got three bases decently. And so, yeah, the attack here from Shadon is not pressuring the fourth, but instead likely to try and trade on the third. And this is more than likely just going to be an attempt to take down a few roaches here and there, not much more than that, because I just don't think you will be able to find much more than that as these stalkers continue to blink back. Bling roach, getting the push back there. Some extra stalkers showing up, and Overlord going down, and we actually continue to push in. We get a Ravager on the go. Nicely caught. Shadown's actually micro this really well. Like, his micro so far, it's been a good battle of attrition. He's getting a fourth or fourth base is down behind this as well. I mean, even these stasises could be very annoying at some point. Like, losing the queen potential here and acting like a little bit of a wall, that's just annoying. Yeah, very true as these oracles. Oh, the oracles. Yeah, still activating, right? Going after those ravages. And this army Shadown just keeps on pressing forward. Roach, Ravager, Ling, Queen. Continue to take a bunch of shots. You are going to see a couple more corrosive of Vials coming through and just forcing these Stalkers back. But the Stalkers keep on finding damage. They keep on trading. And the more they're able to do this, the better off, uh, the, uh, the better off they end up. Absolutely. Even an aggressive blink on top of this. And I mean, the Ravages, they're going down as well. These Oracles, they've just been annoying, man. Like, it hasn't been, you know, night and day difference to what they normally get done. But the fact that they've just been there to soak up a little bit of the shots from the Queens, put the Stasis is down, go for the Ravages as well. And Shadown, behind this, he is suffering from a supply block right now, but all the fighting in going on here, also limiting this creep spread, it's been great. Yeah, it controls the game, right? That's what it comes down to. You're controlling the game right now. 
And the more you control this game, the better off you are. Now, he keeps on building on these stalkers. There's plus two slowed down by, I believe, Contaminate. So, a little bit slower on that upgrade than he would like. And now, Wayne is getting towards the hive. So, we are getting towards the hive. That's about halfway done. If he can get better tech up, right, that's going to give you some opportunity. The Oracle's going to find that uh, fourth base currently undefended. A few Hydras split off to go deal with it. Man, I don't know. Supply lead now in his favor, and... Yes, uh, continue to look pretty good here. The Oracle's all low HP, but getting out alive. Yeah, I did lose one for his shuttle. I, I was thinking, like, you have to be very careful with moving over just a small handful of Hydras, because Oracles can deal just as much damage to Hydras as any light armored unit. And now these Stalkers march over here, so he gets to that faraway fourth base, and that is a lot of Stalkers just parading through this army and getting good economic damage. And I'm looking at the bank, Wardy. He has nine gates available right now. He's going to be on triple robo production very soon. Templar Archives. He's sitting pretty with 80 works as well. This game is all about Shadown right now. Yeah, Shadown, Shadown, Shadown. He has uh, continued to look very good. But again, though, you know, Lurgadon's coming up and Fest is coming out. These things are coming in. That could maybe give you a bit of a chance later on as Wayne. And he's going to actually push Shadown back here as well. Yes, okay, the damage done is huge. Fourth phase gone. Uh, Wayne having to rebuild this, and Shadon is also teching up, so probably going to be fine at the end of the day. But, uh, I mean, at least Wayne is getting some tech that might at least give him a shot at this, you know? Uh, I, I like getting Adepts here and there and everywhere as well. Like, this is just annoying. Three Immortals at a time with Storm. And it's Lurkers only just coming online. Like, yeah, yeah I, 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 I like Shadon. Yeah, just dead now. Yeah, get... yeah I, I think he's dead. I think he's very much dead, and... Trying to keep it alive with some transfusions, not going to happen. Gets a little cheeky Hydra for his trouble. And look at his bank as well, Wardy. He can produce for absolute days here. And he's thinking about getting a fifth base. I saw that camera move over to the, sa the very southwesterly point. Ah, Wayne just hasn't been able to get going this game. Look at the income tab right now. It's like 3k 1200 versus 1.5600. Like Wayne is literally mining half as much. Yep. No, he is. Uh, he's got a, you know really terrible income and just doesn't really have a way to do anything he wants to. I mean, vipers are coming out, but there's going to be high templars available. Storm is going to be available as well. And that's going to have stalkers coming through, catching a couple of well, a lurker now. A couple of lurkers oh. make it three lurkers, so they don't even get burrowed, man. Before they get adaptive talents, that ability to uh, move around and reburrow quickly, they are just so slow. <laughs> they are. I'm. I, I'm in. Oh dear, that's. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's a little bit of a donation there. Now we can't oh. see that lurker. Uh, it's yeah. a bit unfortunate. I am loving this uh, Overlord Caravan, by the way. And Zealots run into the natural. Constantly dealing damage. Wayne is bleeding all over the shop. Even over at the fourth again. Ah, really good play out of Shadow, man. Really good play. Yeah, he's just controlling it well. He knows exactly the kind of army he's got. He knows he doesn't want to give his opponent too long to like turtle up to enough lurkers that it would be actually a problem to fight in. He denies a base again, right? So Wayne just cannot possibly keep up. His mining is being disrupted the entire time. Third dead, then, well, it was fourth dead, then third dead, and fourth dead again. And uh, well, that's a big factor, as you see. This army going to come back oh. in one more time, and just going to be in, mean, again, just catching the lurkers kind of unburrowed. I mean, one lurker's burrowed here, but one lurker of splash just isn't enough to force this army back on its own. And so Shadon takes another good trade, and it just keeps on going. Ah, does manage to yoink out a immortal, but I mean, Wayne, like, the supply is constantly dipping for him. He's been unable to mine off four bases uh, consistently, right? And Shadown, he's just teching up that immortal count as well. It's up to seven, soon to be nine, and he now finally has detection in the mix, so can probably deal with the lurkers a lot better than he was doing. And remember, these are very well upgraded Protoss units. Plus two, plus three, soon to be done. Warp Prism comes in. Maybe this is just the icing on the cake here at this point, and it's going to get the job done. Yep. I see a few more drones continue to drop down here. I mean, again, it's just painful for Wayne, who is just taking damage from every single front. As do you get one little mortal abduct in. This mortal takes a shot or two. I mean, now we're just going to go for it. We're going to jump on these lurkers because there's nothing to protect oh. them. And that is going to do it. That was an interesting storm, but GG called. <laughs> And Shadon takes a two to one. <laughs> that was like watching those New Zealand players like slap themselves in the face before a game, except like as a victory thing, right? Like that was uh, definitely a last uh, last minute. I'm gonna storm myself. I, I was actually very um, very impressed with Shadon. Like he lost the first map, sure, and 
I actually don't mind it when players do something a little bit crazy in game one of a series. But then you could see, like, he made the adjustments going on forward, and they were all just good, good adjustments. Like, he no longer did the, all right, I'm going to do a big push on you, see how it goes. It was the, all right, let's see, like, you didn't deal with the first oracles that well. Let's just do that and do it a bit more. And then it was like the adepts came in at different times, the oracles continually did damage. Just, it, it really felt like Wayne wasn't able to play his true game, game two and three, and Shadown did a good job of analyzing that he could maybe do that and maybe, you know, finding a weakness in game one. That, that just shows me that Shadown um, handled this series very, very nicely. Very smart. Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely with you. And honestly, that was kind of my feeling coming in. I feel like I've liked Shadown's play a little bit more than Wayne's throughout the event so far. And uh, Shadown does indeed get himself to that two and one scoreline in the group. So plenty more StarCraft to come. Here we're against Spats up next, followed by Battle Bee and Mana. And more to come, as you can see on the schedule right here. So we'll be back in a few. Plenty of games, seven best of threes to go. It's that TVP uh, section up next.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Air Marine versus Spats of Nexus. Here in Marine, and I don't think we expected to be here today because of the fact that this is a a one and one matchup, right? Like that's kind of wild. Um, he lost a goblin, so that really was a shocker. That was probably one of the bigger upsets of the previous round of Europe. And uh, now he has to play against Spats, who I feel like he should be very comfortable against. I mean, rough draw for Spats, because here Marine in TVP is a beast as well. Um, but yeah, what a what a wild timeline we're living in that uh, here Marine is down at 1-1, because he's used to cruising through these groups. Maybe for some resistance, a 2-0 meets a Clam or a Rain or somebody. But yeah, then knocked down by Goblin is not what we expected at all. Not at all. I mean, Goblin is a guy that... <clears throat> I remember a long time ago, WCS, where I think he made like his first top eight by beating Drogo, <laughs> like a long time ago. And I remember it being really funny because it was one of those moments where Drogo was a little bit salty. It was like, GG, good luck getting 3 0 because he played Reyna next. <laughs> and I was like, oh my goodness. But Goblin's always been this kind of like quiet Protoss player that's done well, you know? Like, definitely a little bit of his own brand, loved the Sky Toss and stuff, but. Goblin's had a real run, man. 2-1 mana, 2-1 Hero Marine, and I mean, wow, uh, very impressive stuff for him. I mean, now it's going to be very hard, but yeah, Gabe, he's the gatekeeper, man, for a reason. He was like the so solid fourth place guy in Europe, and I mean, now it's a lot more contested over there, but we will get on into it. Spawning over in the bottom left here on a new map today, it is none other than Mauser's Hero Marine. And in the top right, it is going to be Spats, our blue Protoss player, who is currently teamless. You know, <clears throat> he mentions a new map. I actually do think in Europe we'll see a few more of the new maps. That's been the trend so far. Asia seems pretty resistant to change. They don't want to play the new maps. They haven't really played the new styles. Like in a lot of the PvPs, you're not seeing the Sentry, whereas in Europe you're seeing loads of this new Sentry. So it's, uh, mm. it's kind of a really cool little comparison uh, just between regions. And yeah, here in Europe, do you expect to see a lot of post-youth, a bit of Dynasty, definitely some Crimson Court throughout the day as well. I'm expecting those maps to get some love across the course of Europe because they've been seeing a lot of play in general. Like I say, it's a pretty cool map pool. It's one that seems to be pretty uh, diverse. And that's uh, awesome to see. Yeah, I got to play a few games today on stream before this uh, begun. Got to play on this map and I liked it. I, I liked it a lot just because it was very greedy for me. You know, it's one of those yeah. where... I feel so damn safe to just have a wall at the front. And I played it again last night and I went for 3cc. I felt like I was rocking it. Then this is the one I got Void Ray rushed on Wardy. It was horrible. But... <laughs> what, from like the right side? <laughs> also, or like the side uh, of the... Yeah, yeah. Like uh, I let this plonker mine out the minerals without me seeing because I was like, no way can you mine through those minerals because like 20, 20 a pop, you know? Uh -huh. uh, but, but they did it. They absolutely did. And Spats here, he's doing something very, very special. Like, this is one base, Twilight. He went double gas very, very quickly. And he is absolutely going to be up to no good. And oh. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Wow, what a funky way to open, because it is an expansion, but it's at the gold base, and it's after the Twilight Council. So it was the one base Twilight. Now you take the gold. But here, Marine, I see the Twilight Council. I'm like, oh, God, the one base, like, DT Rush, or one base Blink. So if you bunker up at home and get defensive now... This could be kind of wild, right? Because then all of a sudden, there's actually a gold online. But our oh, Hero Marine's too smart, man. He's going to come and check it. So he sees the gold from the high ground. Knowing this, now he can make the completely correct set of calls. Because he knows the economy available to his opponent. And he knows the tech that's on the way as well. So actually just perfect setup from Hero Marine in terms of information. <laughs> and now it's up to him to kind of execute. I even like the way that he just went to the high ground there. Didn't even reveal that he spotted it. You know, because, I mean, what are you going to get done there with a Reaper? You can't kill it. So he, he just kind of spotted it, didn't reveal that he knows about it. And now he's just kind of making sure, like, all right, all right, is there something on the map to be worried about? What's actually going on here? And so far, zero panic out of him. Like, absolutely zero. And Gabe, for a lot of Terrans out there, you know, he's a guy that streams a ton. Gets to see that Twilight Council busting its groove over there. That's big sign of blink but he, he's a terran that absolutely was king of tvp when and i mean even getting a hellion over here for that gold base slowing things down but even when terrans like maru struggled in this matchup with certain things 
you could then find Big Gabe against the same Protoss like a week later, like a trap or something, and it'd be like, okay, he's just amazing, isn't he, at this matchup. He's just played it more than anybody else. Yeah, that's kind of kind of wild. He's uh, so good at, at DVP and knowing the ins and outs, knowing the timings and the little things. And I always remember Roddy being like, you know, he kills two probes, and he's like, oh, well, I killed two probes here, and that means that my 655 attack is now better than my 705 attack or so. Yeah. And it does feel like that because it always feels like when he does damage, he comes across and he, he punishes very quickly. This is a very odd build, obviously, from Spats. He's obviously about to have Blink. He's going to have Prism. But he's going to be under pressure as well. Widowmind drop around the right-hand side. Hearing getting up a tank and a Raven back at home as well. I'm not sure, man. Like, uh, I feel as though it's, it's definitely an odd one to read into. So I guess we'll see where it all ends up. As we do just have this Medivac going to go for some damage, though. Yeah, I mean... This isn't as bad a situation as normal, just because your natural is here in rain. It's kind of half a gold base, isn't it? And I mean, these Widowmine shots, that's just one. Yeah. I mean, this is about as bad as it can go for spats, like, for real. Even, oh, <laughs> oh man, it's, a, it's, as bad, it's as bad as it can go. Like, that, it, it's not brutal. as bad for a Terran as normal. Yeah, this is going to be one tank to your PSO. Okay, we have to move away from this uh, mining for a little bit, so some potential, but we're going to come in, drop an order turret. That's some extra damage output, and we push this back. Now the tank gets siege in a more forward position, and okay, you lose a few SCVs, but you've done the probe damage to justify losing a few SCVs already as well, right? So that's lovely, and now the Absolutely. water mines are back, so they survived, and now they're going to come back in, and Spats has to split once again, choked up because of, or clumped up because of the shield battery, so even more damage done. And guess what? Back in the medevac, they're going to get to fire a third time at some point. I thought they nerfed the Widow Mine Wardy, but... Oh, oh uh, never mind. Nice <laughs> blink there to get, yeah, nice blink to get it uh, out of the way. But I'll tell you what, you kind of go with a Widow Mine drop, hoping that you might get like, I don't know, let's say let's say you hope for five-ish probes and some lost mining with them dying. The fact that he got 12, uh, really, really good start for him. And, you see this Terran army forming, and he's already got a Raven on the map as well, and there's a Dark Shrine on the go. I mean, Spats is in that kind of position where you have to hope that your opponent messes up a little bit. or And, and to do that, you have to force some mistakes out of them. So that's what he's really going to be good in for this game. So we might see something super crazy out of Spats. It might not work out, but he has to do something. Yeah, no, 100%. He has, has to pull the trigger and, and fire away and get something done because sitting back isn't going to be it. I mean, Dark Shrine is obviously a cool idea, but then obviously there's already a Raven out, and as long as that Raven's still alive, it could be, uh... Yeah, as long as that Raven's still alive, the DTs are going to be limited in their effectiveness, but maybe that could be a target Boy. here while this harass continues, but we're just losing the Stalkers! The move command to the side, we have to blink back to the prism. Uh, this is really not going well. Look at this tank setup, by the way. Like, three tanks, very nicely situated here. Even get a fourth tank out. This is something we've been seeing a lot more out of the Terrans. Like, they don't just stop at, like, one, two tanks here. They've been absolutely producing more. And Hero Marine, he's making some decent calls here when he can move out and what with. He's still protecting his natural very nicely while setting up a third base. So you see that? Like, he's over there. Now he's spotted the DTs as well. I mean, getting some damage done. The Raven's definitely in the wrong location here to deal with it. Yeah. And, I mean, has, has Gabe noticed it yet, even? I, I want to say he has. He's just focused on pushing. I imagine the plan is he still wants to push, and so the Raven will stay with this army because he knows he can scan to defend at home. And if he gets rid of the prism and so on, there's going to be no more DTs there. And now the Raven is here on the map, so you cannot uh, worry about DTs that are coming forwards as well. So I, I think that's just the logic he's using. And as we do see another, another prism actually being chrono boosted out, but these tanks are going to siege high ground. It's one Boy. of the strong positions on this map, this high ground location. And yeah, with the tanks already sieged up here, this is going to feel a bit brutal. It really is, and I mean, that Raven, it's only popped one turret so far this game. It's pretty damn high in energy. I mean, the, this number of Marines is not super high. Okay, turrets are popped. Is it going to be able to keep alive that Nexus? I don't think so. I mean, it's going to be a real battle to keep this going, and it is taken out. Another turret goes down as well. There's lots of tanks, more bio coming as well. I think Spatz's days are very much numbered. Yeah, I mean, obviously losing the gold's already brutal, but then... Just losing all the units here as well is even worse, and it does seem as though we have got ourselves a Hero Marine victory in game number one on the horizon. He is pretty much right there with it. As we have an Archon Morphin and a couple more DTs getting set up, but this Raven is still alive as long as this Raven is here. I mean, I guess the DTs just have to become Archons, which obviously is less than ideal because Archons kind of need some buffer as well. I tell you what, Spats is uh, an optimistic fellow. 
Like, this is a, you know, 54 supply, you're against the three base Terran, which you know of at this point. You're like, you know what? 54 supply? I've still got a chance, haven't I? And I mean, to be fair, he has 1 1 in this group, and coming up against Herobrine, it's, it's definitely a rough draw. But he's going to try and make the most of it. I mean, these TTs getting quite a bit of damage done. Nice little micro and pickup here, but there is so much Terran on the map at this point. Yeah, no, just a lot of it as we see the tank pulling back. That DT will go down, but the prison went down as well. Yeah, I mean, Spats almost feels like that could have been a GG moment. He's like, oh, I lost my pressure on the map. Okay, GG's, let's go next. He's going to come across with the end army and just try. I mean, hey, in the ESL regionals, he's only come around once or twice a year. Why not give it one last shot before you tap out? Yeah, yeah, I mean... This is a more than a Hail Mary at this point. Absolutely is. And I mean, you see that Colossus? Gabe is targeting it down with the tanks. And GG. I mean, nice game one out of Hero Marine. Spats went for something a little bit cheeky, offbeat. And I kind of like the look of it. But the way that Gabe responded to all that, even with just a handful of units, like the Reaper and Hellion initially, it was just good out of him, wasn't it? And then the Widowmine stuff, that really sealed the deal. Yeah, no, it was, I mean, the Widow Mines are brutal. I mean, eight kills off the first two mines, and they get to come back again, they get four more. Yeah, that, that was just rough, and then, obviously, the DTs did okay, but they kind of led to you kind of not having anything else anywhere, so, yeah, it was uh, well played. I, I think a lot of this was just Hero Marine as well, getting that scout, and he, you know, saw the Twilight Council, then he was like, okay, I'm going to move over to the main base and check, uh, over to the gold base and check to see that's up. Oh, it is? Cool. And then he has all the info, so he doesn't overreact to anything necessarily. He knows the possibilities of what could be coming. Once you know all that, it makes the game so much simpler for yourself. So, big part of the uh, big part of the game there. As we get ready now for game number two, it is going to be Crimson Court for our second map. So another of these newer maps, I really love this one because it's just so fun. Because like you're kind of forced into the middle, but then you've got options to go to the edges as well. It makes it very varied, and so many people have so many different takes on how to play it out. It's been very uh, very varied map. For the uh since it came into the map pool yeah this is one that i love the like narrow valleys down the middle and then the edges are kind of like cut off and so you are very much for it's like an opposite go golden wall <laughs> in a way but and, and by that i mean like you're very much forced down the middle yeah. but then you've got these big sections that you can go down if you want to uh very interesting spawning over in the top right Ah, Red Terran is Mouse Sports Hero Marine. Up against that blue Protoss in the bottom left hand corner of the map, it is Spats. Yeah, you've you've got to feel for Spats a little bit here, because Spats isn't a bad player by any means. It's just you're running into one of the best TVP players of the last I wanna say like five years at this point, like even when other Terrans are on song, such as like the Clems of the World, the Marus, obviously the Cures. I mean, Cures also exceptional at TVP. All those players are exceptional at TVP, but Hero Marine's very, very systematic about it. Like, he's, he's a tough guy for anybody to run into at this stage, and never mind a Protoss. Yeah. Yeah, Protoss especially. It's, uh, he's just so good at this matchup. His, his knowledge of this matchup, his feeling of this matchup is so good. And uh, especially when he goes in knowing he's the favorite as well, there's no need for anything funky or anything fancy, so he can just play, you know, a baseline standard without mixing up too much, which is even better for him, because then he's like, cool, play my standard, I'm going to play normal from the start, there's just even more kind of kind of scriptedness to this, uh, which lets me kind of just pan out into my favor. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there's, there's trademark moves out of Gabe as well, like, you know, the big Gabe drop. Uh, that comes in where it's like eight marines in your main base at some point like these are things that you have in your mind that can co oh my okay th nice. this is just brutal <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is just brutal like absolutely is brutal like you, you you want the stars to align you're like okay is this my moment and then your probe dies to an SUV which should never happen Ugh. yeah not the, not the start you're looking for but Spat's going for a far more generic opener this time uh, there isn't a super accessible gold, I mean, besides that mineral wall, but there's a rich gas, difficult to utilize on this map. Um, and yeah, now the Reaper just gets across the map, gets to spot exactly what's going on, and we're going to see what both players are going to be up to this game. Oh, I think the Reaper's going to die, maybe. Oh, oh, vision lost. Yeah, vision lost. Comes up to the high ground with the Adept, and 
We will just jump back down to the low ground so the Ripper gets away. Well played by Hero Marine. Good little bit of movement there as the Twilight Council comes up. Obviously, the correct order of things this time. Next is then the Twilight from Spats. We're playing a much more standard game, of course. And uh, Hero Marine playing safe, man. Bunker is already up in front of the natural, so he can fill that with a couple of Marines. Going to get a Hellion to help him continue scouting, I imagine. Although, scouts in sees the Twilight Council right now, so now he knows exactly what's up anyways. And the starport will start for him as well as the next step of the tech comes in, as expected. Yeah, and the Hellion works so well in combination with the Reaper. Oh, I think he's going to get that probe as well for his trouble. So again, just getting little bits of damage done. But in another world, none of this would have happened for Spats. We'll get to kill the Reaper, which is good, because that Reaper getting into the main and then the follow-up with the Hellion, that can actually get unreasonable amounts of damage done. Does get to see the Hellion, but maybe he didn't quite see it. Um, but still, it's looking to be another Widowmine drop opening out of uh, the Terran here. Yep. <clears throat> just get ourselves into some of that pressure, get on the map early. I'm just going to be seeing a Hellion, going to fire a few Ooh. shots. Is going to go for a couple of probes, so we're going to be able to grab that. And I'm just going to get one more as well. Nope. Actually, last shot was good to get rid of the Hellion before that happened. As the blink comes through the robo facility, the gateway all coming about as well. Medivac tank and a couple of Marines going to go as well. Yeah, this this kind of situation, like, the builds that Gabe is very, very good against are the things like Stargate that's slightly out of the ordinary. Because those games, a lot of Terrans can be like, oh, what do I exactly do against this? What's the best response? But here, he's just gone for one Widowmine. Now he's going straight into tank production, which is extremely safe. Like, this is one thing that is super good against those very aggressive Protoss builds, which... Uh, he's not against this game, but uh, it does allow you to be safe. So, here I mean, he's not even being greedy with this. Oh my god, is there no react? Oh, five. Five for one Widowmine. I mean, that's a, that's a good shot. Yep, nice uh, little connection. And uh, just going to be seeing Blink and the Prism continue to come about. Raven Tank, couple of barracks coming through. Engineering Bay as well. As the Stalker is going to come on the map and try and put some pressure on. They're going to have Blink. Temple Archives is going to drop as well, though. So, Spat's going to go very fast, Temple Archives, after this. A bit of a Hail Mary. Like, I think he's just going to hope for a, a a storm situation against this. Like, feedback on the temp or feedback on the Raven, getting some storm out nice and early. Because depending on what Gabe throws at him, it is going to be fairly late stim. He's getting multiple tanks as well. He's he just got the Observer as well, right? Yep. Oh, yeah. And I, I, look, what one trick with Terran? Have your tanks like just touching the CC from any angle, and then the Stalkers are always going to be shot upon. And both in the main and at the natural, Gabe is following that rule very nicely. And I mean, that natural, you're not going to deal damage to that. Nope. This is uh, <laughs> well defended as, I mean, Storm on the way. I mean, extra gates coming up. Spats is just going to try and send it, but it's so difficult to believe that something like this is going to work out when Hero Marine is set up defensively already. And, uh, yeah, Stim Combat plus one all coming through from here, Marine. Uh, obviously, the more closer he gets to those upgrades, the closer he gets to just shutting this down completely. Yeah, and once Gabe comes on over here, I don't think he knows about the lack of third. Maybe he does, but, yeah, I mean, like, he, he's just doing everything right. And, and, okay, two turrets down here. That's quite a committal and not going to have that Raven for the fight, but... What's good for him is, his opponent's actually gone for the High Templar, which, you know, you want to be using those High Templar to feed back that Raven, maybe hoping that your Terran opponent guns it with one push, but that's not going to be the case. As long as Gabe just gets a good number of medevacs out and a lot of bio, which is what he's going to be doing, like Spats is just hoping for some very unreasonable move out here, which Gabe's too good for that, man. He's too good. He's just... Spats is... I think he went into this series knowing it's going to be very hard and he has to do something weird, but given that Gabe practices his matchup all day, every day, to the point where he's going a little bit insane over it, he's 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 maybe the wrong guy to do this against. Yeah. I just don't see whether... I mean, now... I feel like if you had to go, you had to go already, right? Now we're getting charged. You know, here Marine's about to start building ghosts, you know? Like, you're never meant to, you know, have ghosts against this two-phase soul in... That's a nice couple storms. It actually gets a lot of marines, so it's a good start. As Hero Marine comes in again, he's going to scout about. It's the forward base being taken, by the way, as we're just going to see the chance to maybe try and grab a high Templar. 
Nice morph into the Archon to save it, but it's not like you really necessarily want Archons right now. Get you morphed an Archon across the map as well, so that's all the High Templars becoming Archons. I still feel like here Marine's army is looking good. The Widow Mine set up, the tanks are going to relocate a little bit as well. Hmm. Uh, he's going for that rich gas base, which, you know, it's... I mean, for Storm and making High Templars, are... oh, well, that was not what you wanted. I mean, the Storm initially was good, but... Sacrificing the High Templars, especially when there's medevacs out already, not what you want. I like ag again. If Hero Marine was the kind of guy to gun out prematurely against this kind of stuff, maybe it could have worked. But it's just like he sees the whole map, isn't it? He's just made all the correct moves and choices. Yep, really much. I mean, there's another storm well, coming big, down. To be fair, storm. that's a good storm. I mean, that helps, right? It evens up the supply a little bit. The Widow Mines, though, against these elves, and they're not even charged us for a few more seconds. We just lost half the elves before they had charge, man. Ouch. Yeah, d disaster. And it, it's not as if Hero Marine needs to win these fights. He's got quite a few tanks to fall back on. I love these tanks on the high ground as well. Very nicely situated. The storms are really juicy. They are really juicy. The Vikings just take out the Warp Prism as well. But look at that. How do you deal with these tanks on the high ground here, Wardy? The answer is you no. don't. And anti-armor missile on one Archon running away. I love that. I do. Kind of thought here we might chase that high temple down. It's actually going to catch it anyway. It's not going to get a chance to become an Archon here. So they go down another EMP. The Ghost keeping up as well as we grab the Immortal. So here in range is really netting himself an advantage at every corner. And obviously now have about 40 supply. Well, Spats has a third, and he will start upgrades. But again, he's heavily behind, and can only imagine Hiramine will look to push in the near future as well on the back of this uh, success. Yeah, like, work account really is uh, very indicative of what's been happening in this game. Like, Hiramine just not really taken too much economic damage. I say that after he's lost 11 SCVs, but it was while his opponent was on two base, very, very committed, and soon we're going to see his supply just get so damn high and he's going to have so many ghosts on the field doesn't have to worry about robotech for quite some time because robobase only just started and spats he's uh he's in a horrible situation and yet again yep i mean his biggest success seems to have come from these moments where he like comes around the edge drops a storm and, and like kind of catches him really slightly off guard but he's so far behind that even kills like that are not really doing a lot to even this out so the problem really does persist in that regard. So we have it the... certainly does. Yeah. Oh no, he's stranded. <laughs> he's stranded. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, I hope Spats realizes that because unless you kill some rocks or go through mineral wall, that bad boy cannot get out of there. Nope, he is very, very stuck as the prism. Oh, his, uh, prism's come. Oh, I tell you what, locking that down. Save him. Yeah. Locking that down over there could have been really cool. There we go. <laughs> uh, careful of the Wooden Mine, oh, though. Yeah, yeah. Oh my oh. god, Wooden Mine turret combo would have been a kill, right? Yeah, it would have been yeah. a kill. That, that could have been, been so damn brutal. The worst evacuation of all time. <laughs> this it's it's nice, this new touch with the Wooden Mines, like making stuff red as they're about to blow up onto it. It's, uh, it's one of those things that makes it look way scarier, in my opinion. <laughs> You're right, it does, right? It's like, hey, this is about to be deleted, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> It'll change, though, because obviously, as well, it's, it lets you play more quickly, right? You can identify what's logged on to more easily, and very small potential cool micro is uh, kind of, again, in this game, currently just stuck waiting for... Ah, okay, I like the Dark Shrine. I mean, you've got to make a comeback here, Spats. Dark Shrine is the sort of play you make when you need to make a comeback as a Protoss player, so... I like the ideas. I like where he's taking it. He's starting to push this in the right direction, I think. And to say how this game started off, I think Spats has done more than a good job of just kind of stabilizing and making a game out of this. Like, I, I really do, because soon he's going to be at 2 2, which is granted a little bit behind Hero Marine, but I thought he was kind of down and out. Like, his third base was so damn late this game, but these storms, continuously this game, have been pretty damn decent, but. This army, look how look how much energy we've got in this, and that is a big anti arm missile on the back line. Storms, Colossus, they've got a huge task on their hands here. Good storms again on these Vikings as well. Yep, Vikings uh, taking a couple of shots. Oh, yeah. Bio will pull back again. Anti arm missile is down, and we have got this push just continuing from here. Marine, he'll land the Vikings too. And I think the reality is that everything will melt away. There's not a lot of shields left on the Archons. They won't take any more shots. 
A Colossus shows up. We're also wouldn't mining up this mineral line, so that's going to be goodbye to pretty much the entire mineral line. Well, probes go down, and, you know, all of that on the back of the one fight should seal the deal. As Hero Marine looks to go 2-0 and in the game, 2-1 and in the group, and get kind of much more back on track for himself. I like that we switched back to that fight on the right in the south, and it was like, oh, where'd the forest go? Oh, yeah, he's, he's, he's gone. He's, he's died. And, yeah, this base, Hero Marine just showcasing the vulnerability there of that rich Vespin geyser. He's just got so much left. And Spats, he's a fighter, man. He's a warrior. We saw it in game one where he stayed in it until the absolute bitter end, and the bitter end it was. Hero Marine just not skipping a beat here. He's been methodical about taking the extra bases, the tech as well behind it all. Even the layout of this bunker and stuff, it's been clear. This is exactly what you tune into or want to tune into when you have Big Gabe on, on display. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just spot on. And yeah, I mean, again, at this point, we are playing five bases against the four, but well, yeah, he's rich, so he drops four more CCs on top of that. We're gonna actually go chasing down these high Templars. We're gonna get a couple of snipes, and we do kill two of them, three of them. Well, again, more pain for Spats. He's really kind of putting himself through it as well. He's like, I'm going to stay in this game until I really accept the fact that I've lost. Because, uh, okay, he's got 150 supplies, so maybe he doesn't feel terrible. But it feels like every little interaction is just massively favored to Hero Marine. Every time we see something going on, it's just Hero Marine is getting kills. Hero Marine is getting picked off. Hero Marine is deflecting something. So, yeah, he's about kind of being put through the ringer a little bit. As you do have... Okay, a decent storm there. I mean, again, that probably has been the best part of this series in general from Spats. As Hero Marine just gets rid of Marauders and replaces them with Libs. Yeah, maybe the first one might have been, like, uh, an error. But then following it up, it's like, oh, no, it wasn't an error. He just wanted to get rid of those uh, low health units there. Save some energy on the medevacs and get more Liberators as well. That, oh, that was a sad warp prism flying across the whole Terran army there. And the aggressive sensor tower in the middle? I freaking love that body. Yep. I mean, why not, man? Just get as much information as you can. See everything possible. Information is key, and he's holding the middle of the map, so he can get away with having it there. Absolutely. 3-3 three, three about to finish on the bio, plus 2 about to finish on the libs as well, which is humongous, because then you've got EMP for days with 6 ghosts on the field, but then you've got one-shot potential on all these stalks as well. And, and range lib has finished up. This is... This is late game TVP, but it's late game for only one player because Spats has yet to reach the fully fledged uh, Protoss situation here, I feel. Yep. I mean, this is going to be tough because, well, Liberator is just going to siege up this mineral line. I mean, Hero Marine has map control. This is exactly what you want to be doing. The Liberators get to go where they, uh, wherever they want to go. The Stork is going to blink in and they're going to go after those libs. I'm going to get one of them already. Until the stim up is going to chase down some more of these stalkers. As I left, I want to drop. Every fight, every fight, it's just one player keeps on winning out, doesn't he? Like, what does Spats do in this situation? Because it is a horrible situation himself in. Spats is going to start killing rocks so we can get to that other side of the map a bit more smoothly, a bit easier. And Gabe, I see some red dudes in the top left side of the map over here. Most likely some libs, yep, to get some more eco damage done. Just constantly restricting his opponent. And I tell you what, that's a lot of freaking storm on this army. Uh, but it is. It, I mean, that's a big Protoss army, to be fair. Hero Marine has to back off out of here. Yeah, the Vikings trying to get up the claw side, but not going to be able to. I mean, Hero Marine, not the prettiest of fights. The good news is he's got all of these liberators dealing damage around the map. He's going to really put a, a bit of a hurt, bit of pain onto the economy of Spats, who's still losing probes over here. Oy. I mean, he's pushing forwards with the main army, man. This liberators just keep going. This was an oversaturated base as well, so the probes just never stopped being in range. I mean, Spats, I think, just feels like that was the best fight he was going to get, so he just wants to push the issue ASAP. Kills the planetary fortress off, but for the most part, he's still, I think, going to be in a bit of trouble. Six more libs spawning soon. They will help a lot in defending this, and we're also running out of stalkers, which means that Vikings alone would be really good. I'm pushing back these uh, Colossi once again. We've got a few goes to the right side. Could drop a couple EMPs, soften this force up. And here come the Liberator. He's going to likely just siege on top of this and look to end this right now as here Marine will start shooting down Immortals and Colossi alike. And uh, let's push this away. I think this Protoss army did about the best it possibly could charging oh, yeah. across the map. Like, it really did. Because, I mean, he actually made this look somewhat close. But 
those liberators on the left side, like one's got four kills over here. The other one's got 18 kills. This definitely felt like one of those situations where Spats was like, you know what, screw it. It's going bad. Let's just go and let's see how well we do. And probably went a lot better than they thought it was going to go. I would say so. I think he's gone a lot more out of this push than he thought. I mean, this game we've been talking about how doomed it has been for Spats for a long time, right? And so the fact he got to this point where it was like it came down to a larger fight and it actually kind of looked okay for him, the larger fight in the bottom left. I think he was right to be like, okay, surely there's no way this is good for me if I let him rebuild. This is my chance. So I don't mind the way he approached it. I think it was a good effort, uh, but Hero Marine in the end, again, was just so far ahead in the early game that it didn't matter what happened bottom left, he was still ready to go on the upper right when his opponent got there. This is always so sad, you know, when you're a Protoss, you're, you're wounded, and everywhere you go, you just see liberation zones, you know? Like, he knows that the writing is on the wall at this point, and Gabe, he had, I think he has at least eight command centers done. He's got nine orbitals in this game, Wardy, nine he yep. is one rich cookie doesn't even need the work account that he's got but he's got it and spats he flies over here it's like oh you've got more orbitals than i have nexus okay okay i'm, I'm out of here well played hero marine good fight by spats but freaking a that was some uh pretty damn good tvp out of big gabe yeah it was like i say it got maybe a little scary on that one push but again he's just so far ahead off the earlier stages that it was never really going to go wrong for him and that is going to lead us to this uh, GG's. And that means that we have got ourselves a second series in Europe done. We officially hit a halfway point of the day. Six best threes down and six left to go. Mana vs. Battleby is coming up next. And Strange vs. Lays a couple fun ones about to hit the uh, hit the uh, screen. So we're going to be right back. It is going to be that Mana Battleby matchup up next for even more TVP with a Battleby that's been playing great lately. See you guys soon.
ASL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. We have more TVP coming up as Battle B, who's been, again, impressive to me this season. He's going to be taking on Mana. Um, exciting match. I mean, I don't know if you've seen much of it, Ben, but Battle B has been popping. I mean, he beat Wayne 2 to 0. He took a map off of Clam. Like, he is. He's a genuinely become a very fun Terran player to keep track of, man. It's just great to see. I remember when he was on the uh, kind of the up and up and he was just starting to appear in tournaments because he's quite a young German lad, right? Yeah. And Skellis was like, yeah, Battle B's really good. And, you know, very often it's like you get this pressure on your shoulders, you play against the big boys on the big stage and things just don't align. But no, he, he's been looked at as a guy that's good in practice for quite some time. And yeah, he's not an easy guy to go up against by any means. But spawning over in the bottom right here, as our blue Protoss representing Team Liquid, it is Mana. And uh, yeah, that was a little bit of a funky start, losing 25 minerals on the misplaced pylon. Top left, our red Terran player from Berserker Esports, it is Battle B. You know, you know, Manor, he's a bit of a newcomer, isn't he? he? Maybe the nerves got to him a little bit with that pylon. It's not as if he's been competing for like 15 years or something at this point, you know? He's been around a while, man. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, he's been around for so long that he was one of the guys playing Brood War. Like, I want, I want to say semi-professionally back then. Like, there was a, a few guys that were playing Brood War with the big boys, and Manor was one of them. But I think he's like 28, 29. Like, not even as old as I would have thought coming from that game. So, got into StarCraft Brood War very young, and he, he's still gunning. He, he's one of the uh, the old guard, if you will. Uh, absolutely. He's uh, one of these guys that just has been doing it for a very long time. And their passion is very much so still there. And he just, he just loves, I mean, StarCraft too, but just also generally RTS. He's like the first person to jump on any of these new RTSs as well. He plays them all. He plays them a whole bunch. It's uh, cool to see him, man. He just loves, uh, loves what he does. He certainly does. And he, he's good as well, man. Like, he was the first guy to lose to Goblin this season. And it was kind of like one of those narrow defeats, um, if you will. Like, I, I think he... I think I got to see what he was typing a little bit afterwards. And it was like he had a few adepts that he forgot about on the map that could have done a lot of damage and stuff. So, yeah, he even felt like he could have been avoiding this position of being 1-1 right now. Now, uh, obviously these players are going to look at the other one as not an easy foe, just because they're not. Like, but both these guys are performing pretty decently. Um, Mana's a guy that's been top of the EU scene in the past. Um, granted, it, it went in waves. He's been in WCS finals more than once, actually. Uh, like, I think once against Serral, once against Lilbo. Uh, he was narrow. In fact, when I think about it, like he was in the f very first like DreamHack Winter Finals. It's Nama back then. I mean, that's how far back I'm thinking. Um, but yeah, I I like this match between these guys. This sh this should be feisty. Yeah, it should be feisty. Like I say, I mean, Manit always manages to step up, but Battle B has just been so good lately. He's impressed me. He was huge for Berserker and WTL qualifiers just recently. Knocked down Creator in an ace match. Like, that is not an easy name to take down. So super excited to see more of him here today. I, I don't think I would have ever said this before, but I actually do kind of pick Battle B as my favorite in this. I think it's, uh, if, if Battle B loses, I think it's kind of the experience of mana that's going to be shining. Like, the, hey, I can stay calm. It's one and one Like, you know, it's pretty bad if I lose this, although not over. Like, I feel like keeping the nerves in check is basically a big part of it. No, it definitely is. I do know that <clears throat> Clem has been practicing with mana. He did it before his Milky Cow games and, you know, getting a bit prepped. And uh, if you go in practicing with Clem, of all people, you know, that should get you a little bit prepared for these boys, shouldn't it? You'd think so, yeah. <laughs> definitely one so. way to like power one up. of the best Terrans. Yeah, one of the best Terrans on the planet. The guy that goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Max Packs all the time. It's, uh, yeah, should should help out. And so far... Go for an Oracle into Blink. It's definitely not your regular PVT opening. You can see that is catching Battle B a little bit off guard here. Battle B ha is going to go for, I believe, a Widowmine drop at some point. And he's hiding these Widowmines. But so far, this is going about as bad as it could with these Widowmines yeah. here. This is oh terrible. As, oh, we didn't even get the shot off there, but that is terrible. 
it, it, I always remember, like, if someone telling me once, like, man, you should never really lose SCVs as a Terran player to a Protoss, right? Like, to an Oracle. Because if you're losing SCVs to an Oracle, you better hope that you've got your units across the map. And if your units aren't across the map, then you've been caught off guard, and you're taking damage that shouldn't really be taken. So masses of damage as well. This wasn't just a couple. This was eight workers lost. Huge start for Mana. And already just getting in there. Battle B not ready for it. And now Mana has a Phoenix in position to help him deal with this Widow Mind drop as well. Yeah, I'm not even sure if there's going to be further commitment to these Phoenix. I mean, obviously the window is open for you to go down the Colossus route, but Phoenix in position for this Widow Mind drop. And granted, it's only one. Does he have units in the main? I mean, he's got the spot, but he was supply block for a little bit of time there. Will most likely get to get a lift off on one of these as well if he wants to. Ooh. He does exactly that. And I tell you what, the Wood of Mine even hits the Phoenix here, not going for the probes. This is uh, not what you want, Wardy. Yep, it's uh, not ideal. Now the Stalkers get rid of a tank as well. It's also a good little win as Battle B is trying to get into position to be aggressive, but that ain't going anywhere so far. So, yeah, Mana feels though he's all over Battle B at the start of this game. So definitely the opposite of what I expected coming in. Stalkers in position. That's a dead liberator as well, man. This could not be wow. going worse. He deals with it so quickly. He'll be able to be on position before this tank gets sieged, I think. Yeah, I mean, mana, the, the dinosaur toss at this point, everywhere we're looking, it's just all about hip right now. Like, every fight is good, and you've got this squad of marines that there's blink on the field. If this was a ladder game, Wardy, Battle would be out. He'd yes. be out of there, because this is not where you want. Oh, even revelating. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is brutal, man. This, this really shows you that practice pays off if you've been if you've been letting clem have his wicked way with you which is probably been happening i i tell you what man has come in prepared and he looks phenomenal in this first game so far no i i, I mean he looks phenomenal the momentum is in his favor from the very get-go and he's just never letting go of it apparently so it's just all steam ahead for him and obviously, Battle B is completely crumpling here in this first game. Not, what, like I said, 100% the opposite of what I expected. As uh, Mana, you're just going to blink up here. There is a tank siege up. Oh, he doesn't go for the tank. Okay, he lifts it with the uh, Phoenix. Then I'm a bit more okay with it. I was a little bit worried he was just going to leave it to keep on firing. Because maybe that tank should have been the priority initially. Drops back down. Two Marauders are dealing damage. These Stalkers are still playing cleanup. We're going to get reinforcements here. So Mana can actually just keep on fighting this position. Does not need to leave just yet. The Widow Mine doesn't go down in time, though. So that's going to be goodbye to the Zealots. Extra stalkers, we blink in, we get rid of the Marauders, and Mana just clearly believing he can keep this going forever and ever and ever and ever. Yeah, I mean, Mana spells blood, doesn't he? He really does, even the Oracle coming in. Ah, uh, this is this is brutal. And Mana's got, he's got money in the bank, going up to four bases as well. He's got a Terran on two base here, in his base with a third that he can't do anything with. And uh, yeah. I mean, that'll be, it's just, he never got going. He nope. never got the chance to get going. Uh, the first Oracle just set the tone for the entire rest of the game. Combat chills will be denied too. Just to uh, rub salt in the ruined because at this point, uh, Battle is already hurt and bleeding out. I'm uh, just going to make sure no one is going to help him here. As, uh, yeah, SCVs keep pulling in. More Zealots, more Stalkers. I mean, take your pick. You can warp in anything. I think it's going to be okay as Mana picks up game number one in convincing fashion. Again, the, the stage was very much so set by the Oracle coming in. Again, eight probes of damage. Huge start. Uh... Again, very little to complain about there, man. It's just popping off. Yeah, what what a what a start and what a what a middle as well. Like everything that came across the map was greeted with open arms, wasn't it? Like the Liberator, nothing. The the Widow Mine drop, it wounded that Phoenix, but that's about it. Just nothing actually did anything whatsoever. Now, second map of the day will be Dynasty, which we haven't seen this one yet either, right? Not today, no. Uh, Dynasty not is today. Uh, not one that sees a lot of love in Asia. And it's definitely one of the less popular ones because like, it's a straight up gold, but then it's a straight up gold in base that's also point out on the map, so you can kind of attack it. So it definitely requires you to play in a bit of a specific manner. But um, mm. that's definitely not stopped people from playing on it. I mean, I think at this point, people are starting to be very comfortable with how to play it, how to defend that gold, how to punish the opponent's gold. So... Uh, and the map layout beyond that is actually kind of pretty neat as well, so it's, uh, it's definitely seen some love. I like that a lot of our predictions today, Wardy, of things and how they're going to go have been absolutely spot on, and rightly so, from uh, the two... Are we the only Prediction Goat winners? I, I didn't win one. 
Wait, you, no, you did, didn't you? Oh, I was ahead for the entire season, apart from after the after the semi second semi final, which is where we decided to end it, and Nathaniel's won. <gasps> and then after the finals, I was ahead again. <laughs> Literally, it was the robbed, robbed completely. What? Well, that's why I've got you in my mind for the the yeah, true man. winner. Man, you're really you're really making it hurt today, man. First, you bring my Pokemon tournament, you bring up the prediction go like. To, oh, to be yeah, fair, yeah. I, I thought I was going to be bringing up good stuff both <laughs> yeah. times about you. It just turns out I was wrong. <sighs> All right, he's spawning over in the top right of Dynasty as our blue Protoss from Team Liquid. It is Mana. And in the bottom left-hand side, we will have ourselves the red turn player from Berserker. It is Battle B. It's amazing how um, off I can be about you all. This is just the um, this is just the perspective I have on you these days that you're going to be performing well in all these things and doing well, you know. And yeah. I'm, uh, to be fair, right. I'm not, I'm I appreciate not... it, Ben. Thank you. Yeah, and it, it wasn't from a bad place, you know. I know Unless this is like Giga Brain play where I knew Giga Brain play. Like I remember how tilted he was when he got the <laughs> prediction got robbed him by from the Nefanias. It was. Uh... It was funny because our producer even came over. She gave me a go and she's like, I think you're the real prediction goat. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, thanks, Kasha, but it's not going to save me here. <laughs> no, no, it isn't. I can't. I don't even know where my prediction goat went. Like, uh, I know my boy got it at some point. Pulled oh, his ears <laughs> off. <'cause, laughs> you know, I, I remember like at the time it wasn't a real goat. They had to get uh -huh. like a lamb and then stick some panda legs to it. <laughs> oh, and, yeah. Yeah. It didn't last long for my goat, I, I'm afraid. Oh, uh, well, mine mine was a real goat, but I, I call it the pity goat, so. Ah, uh, pity goat. Pity goat. Not what you're after. Not really. The, the panda leg goat was the real one. Yeah. That, that, was, that one was wild. I remember them being like, yeah, there was no goat toy, so we made one. We're like, oh. And then they were like, we're like wait, what did you make it with? And they're like, well, here's the panda we used. It's like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they gave me an abomination. Like, they went full Frankenstein for this goat. Um, how do you feel about these openings, by the way? Like, uh, it's the Terran going for a double gas opener, then into a, a base on the gold. And it, it, it's kind of cool, right? Because it's not something that... Like, you either defend it or you don't. You, have, you can have a tank there to really protect yourself from stalkers behind it. Whereas Mana this game, he's actually... In fact, what's he going for? We've got Twilight Council nice and early. Ah, uh, this this looks far more generic from him this game. Yeah, no, just uh, gonna pop down another gateway. Blink is on the way up. We'll see. I mean, we've seen Blink be a pretty big factor on this map because you can, of course, blink into the gold and everything, right? So that's been a pretty big deal. As the Reaper moves up, the Adept is gonna fire, and oh. the Adept is gonna hunt that Reaper down. Obviously, get the full scout though, and the Adept because its shade was on the Reaper. Boink. Wouldn't have caught it, but the second Adept does. Yeah, nicely positioned there with the second Adept. Um, definitely a little curious where you go for like two Adepts, even though you're going into the Stalker play here, because normally you follow up with the Stalker, but it will be Battle B with the gold here. So I almost want to think this is kind of a role reversal, but it just look like Mana is going to be situating a probe down by his gold as well. And I mean, Terrans, they do build workers the slowest of the three races, so they benefit from the gold, usually the least. Um, so Mana shouldn't feel too, you know, put on a clock with that, but he just wants to make sure that he's not going to take damage in this far more normal game. Yep, well, here comes the Wood of Mine drop, so we'll see if Battle B can find something as he uh, boosts on in. The Stalkers are nearby, though, and obviously the gold not taken, so turn to the left doesn't do anything for you there. Mm. And right now, Battle B can just be pretty content with the fact that he's got away with a gold base thus far. And granted, it's a gold base that you start off with, but not taking any damage whatsoever. Like, this this would have been a, a, in this kind of situation. Like, if Mana could play this over again and be like, all right, you're going for a gold like that. Maybe I'd do a slightly different build, but I, I like it. I, I think these new maps have been very interesting for openings. Yeah, no, the, the, because they're different, right? Because they're not always just the same. It kind of gives you that little bit more variety and everything as well. So, no, I'm with you. And obviously, you can see the defense there from Battle B ready to try and protect that gold with the tank and everything. 
Mana's going to try and target this. I mean, there's the bunker there too. I mean, this is just the investment you have to make because it's so common to come blinking onto this base. Uh, and yeah, Mana just going to get that Robably up though and moving oh. the claw side quickly. Is, ooh, he's going to use the Zealot. Zealot. Yeah. Th yeah, that's really nice. And oh, what? Okay, I, I thought he was just going to pick off probes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one, one, one Stalker for one turret and one tank. Uh, that's a trade that you'll take, man, for sure. Um, but oh, oh, oh. Oh, Ooh. that looked spicy for a moment there. It really did. And I guess a little bit of surround initially on that wood of mine. Oh, will it survive? Oh, just about, just about. Just about a stim and plus one coming through here from Battle B. So we get those on the way. As, uh, yeah, again, a few pros, though, is really nice. And now we can see Stokers trying to get some SCVs to make up for it. We'll see. They can blink back. They can prism back. And, uh, yeah, just going to be seeing Stimpak Combat and Plus One continue to come through here from Battle Bees. Again, all of those upgrades up and running. Would mind Medivac does eventually go down. Mana's third base is definitely later than maybe what he would have liked, but that's because of the investment into very quick Colossus here. Like that Rover Bay already done. Thermal Lance on the way as well. So Battle B, economically, is going to be feeling okay this game. We see in the bottom of the screen there as well, third is almost finished there in his main base but he's definitely situated in in a cell in a way that uh it's it's a bit tricky to get out on the map because you constantly have to be aware that that gold base is very vulnerable man is suffering from a bit of supply blockage here so definitely slowing himself down a little bit yep i mean he's gonna come into this base and he's just gonna try and get a couple of scvs again and uh Again, just try and just do a little bit of something here. The third position is going to be taken soon by Battle B. Obviously, he'll move across towards that natural location. Man is still just very reluctant to ever take the gold base as he gets that Colossus play set up. I mean, maybe save the gold for much later in the game as, oh, Viking's going to have the Prism here, so that Viking is going to force the recall. Prism does get out, but it's just now no Prism on the map for a few seconds, so it gives Battle B a bit of freedom that he hasn't had before. Oh, do you know what? I love this idea of getting out Colossus very quickly here, because if you run at this gold base, force field it off, yeah. really utilize that Colossus. Mm -hmm. This is actually very smart by mana. I, I didn't yeah. really even consider this. Yeah, the only problem is the tank, right? But yep, yeah, it does I mean, tank a bit of the damage, sure, as we see one stalker blinking forwards, the other stalkers are moving about. We're hitting the bunker. Obviously, target fire of those SCVs might have been a little bit better, but we get there in the end. A few SCVs going down. Cool idea, because it's pretty cheap to do. However, we do have that massive Battle B army moving through the center. Absolutely do. Absolutely do. And I mean, this, that fourth base has only just started being made over there. Like, it's kind of a fortunate timing in a way. If he can cancel it, he does do just that. But a Raven, that is a full energy Raven as well. The force field on the tank, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting one. The Widow Mines weren't super juicy. But this, this is definitely going to be problematic for Mana, because Battle B, he is all about the aggression right now. And he's, okay, a few, few of uh, those units just wandering on too far forward here, but Sorkers a bit too leery there. Blink on ahead. Nice little trades for Battle B. Yep, nice little trade out. It's just going to be seen a bio coming across. Is going to get an observer there, I believe, so that Raven, he'll get a catch. And Mana just doesn't feel like he has the army, right? And just kind of lacking in kind of numbers, it feels like so supply blocked like he's he's suffered a lot of supply blocks this game like even now this art oh, that was very very fortunate if that army had like a few more marauders in the mix battle b could have absolutely stomped on those colossus um but yeah uh, all, all the all the micro parts from manus play have been pretty damn good especially with the stalker micro he's very good at that but the the macro behind it with the pylons and stuff definitely been a little bit lacking but maybe thrown off by the fact that his fourth base got cancelled and that would have been a bit of extra supply you know yeah, uh, that, that's very true. As we actually get another base bottom right by the way, so that's going to be the next location that Battlefield was moving towards. He steps away from it now. It's interesting. I feel like we never see the expansions kind of leak all the way down here because usually at some point you obviously have the gold and then the forward base as well. But uh, yeah, man, can you just expand down that right hand side? Yeah, that feels more like a sixth base rather than like the fourth that Mana's taken right now. But we'll see how it pans out for him. Uh, Battle B has mined out so much of his gold that he can actually start moving through it now, which g good and bad can work out very much against you or for you. It allows reinforcements to get here to this side of the map but quite a bit quicker. And Battle B just creating more avenues from 
to go down. Storm is done now, but ghosts are also on the field. Uh, we're, we're getting a proper TVP here. They really are. I mean, this uh, potent bottom right push is going to come in. Balpi is going to strike right here. Pylon goes down. A couple of balls are going to be there. Zelt will charge Ooh. up. The storm flank, but it kind of misses. Now we're going to be able to storm. I feel like that storm could have come a little bit sooner. One more. And all the storms have been so close to being spot on. The drop in the natural is going to do huge damage as well. 14 probes going down there and looking to depower some of the production. As we see the few Zelts just continue to chase about. That's going to be another robo facility going down as well. So, man, good fight from Mana. Maybe could have even been better as well. Oh, the force was going to stop the SCVs. Now the SCVs are in a horrible direction. Talk about doing counter damage. I tell you what, that gold base really, like he probably sent them to another base and they started going through the gold base way. Brutal. In a matter of seconds, everything went super wrong for Battle B here. And GG, wow. bloody hell. That talk about a catastrophic few moments there that that warp prism came in with all those storms softened up that army wow uh that was uh so volatile man you were like man we got a tvp on our hands and man i was like do we <laughs> now <laughs> yeah he was, he was like watch this i can make that tvp disappear um man cool play flanks the flanks with the drops obviously on the storms i still really feel like the storms could have done more like they were still good just some of them could have been a bit better but it didn't matter, obviously, in the end. Uh, and obviously, he made for, for any damage he was taking at home because he just had an army that was not going to be stopped because he wiped out the army of his opponents. So, well played by Mana, man. This is really cool because I really felt Battle B was playing great lately. Mana comes in, gets a win. That's a huge result for him. And obviously, he gives himself two shots at qualification now as he will be 2-1 and one in this group where Battle B will drop to 1-2. and two. All of our matches in Europe today are featuring these players who start the day at 1-1. One and one, So... Pretty much the same story all day long for all 12 of our best of threes. And hence, it's also true for the next matchup coming in. It's Strange versus a laser up next for a little bit of PVZ action. Um, this one's actually funky in terms of, like, history. I'll talk a bit about that when we come back, though. So I'll see you guys in just a few.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, everybody, as we head into a laser versus Strange for our next matchup here. Just uh, get this one underway. Are you in this lobby, Ben? Did you get in? I am. That was, that was I... spectacular because... I, I I invited you as the countdown started. I was like, whoa. And then you joined mid-countdown. I'm like, I'm sure that's not meant to happen, but you know what? I'll take it. You know, I went full, like, I'm glad that you bring this up because I went full Mission Impossible just then. Like, that was, uh, <laughs> I felt super about that. So I'm glad that you were the one to bring it up. <laughs> no, it was, uh, it's okay. I was ready to leave if you went in there. I was already checking. So we're good. We're good. <laughs> All right, we are hopping into a laser versus strange. These two, uh, just before we do intros, have such a weird history. If you ask me a laser and strange their history, I would say, well, a laser's favored, right? But historically, they've played like, they're basically like dead even on series one against one another. And that really surprises me. So, it gets me wondering what kind of crazies we'll see today. As in the top left, our blue Zerg from Team Liquid. This is a laser. And spawning over the bottom right hand side, it is the red Protoss. It is strange. He's also that is surprising though, Wardy, because I would have absolutely agreed with you. I'd have been like, this should be very a laser favored, you know? Like yeah. his his heights have been so damn high. But I guess on the flip side of that, his lows can be low. But in general, I'm like, a laser's a guy that absolutely vies for like top eight in the region, you know? Yeah, so that. Uh, a laser is 11 to 8 all time in series against strange and 20 to 15 in maps like i think that's what gets it for me it's like to me that should have been more like you know more like 75 percent of the time a laser wins right because you're sure if they play online and stuff now that said the last three times they've they've played has been a laser's victory strange hasn't won since 2021 but it was mm -hmm. uh and, and before then like it was a lot of the games happened in 2016 so maybe it's not like super notable it's just uh... it was still strange to me that like, when they have played, Strange has held up so well, because a laser was no slouch back then. We're talking about a time where a laser was out, you know, winning DreamHack Valencia, right? So, you know... Was that 20, wasn't that 2017, though, for a laser? Yeah, or? maybe, but like, he's still getting up and being good, right? So, was it 2017? Oh, getting... 2017 was, yeah. um, was Neeb's year, so I think it was 2016 yeah. he won. Uh, no, no, I, so I think Neeb's year, it was a laser that took oh, one of them. Okay. Is that the one that Neeb didn't win? Mm. I think so. I, I, and then the next year, it was all about Serral, wasn't it? Like, mm. um, so I, I think that's my timeline, because I remember when Elaza was on the up and up. It was, yeah, around around 2017, where, you know, he, he kind of... Was it WESG Europe as well that year, where he beat Nurcho in the final, maybe? And, mm. I mean, that was a wild year. Like, Serral lost to Harsom 3-0 in the round of 12, for example. Like, mm -hmm. Serral was a good player but not the yep. Serral just yet like everything was wild and crazy back then but you're, you're right no, that... it, it was 2017 he did get top four in blizzcon 2016 though so he's still like top tier oh yeah yeah no you're you're right with that one yeah interesting very interesting was that the year that he um beat dark to get there as well i think so i, I think he beat dark Stop. in groups and then like he played special round of eight or something hmm mm. Tell you what, interesting. Void? <laughs> yeah. <Ooh. laughs> Meanwhile, there's a Void Ray on the way. This has become more popular in PvZ. Like, not everyone is doing it, but a few players are like, hey, I like opening up a Void Ray first into an Oracle. Like, this is not the first time we've seen this in this event, even. We saw a bunch of this last week. Um, so, you're going to deny this Overlord super quickly. And for a player like Strange, who does play a bit mysteriously, he does like just knocking down this map control and this vision because then of course he can go and do all sorts of different timings and it's very difficult for a laser to ever get some scouting on what the follow-up is going to be no definitely i mean automatically seeing a void around the go a laser is very quick to pull back all those overlords were on the map that were otherwise you know kind of uncontested gets up a fairly early roach warren as well that's usually a sign that you think you're probably going to get attacked kind of soon but this is already a very different ZVP, and 
you see Strange is just going around checking if there's two Overlords on the go, but Eliza was very good about just being like, okay, I just need one to scout, one to get the info. And yeah, he's doing exactly what he said. Oracle afterwards, as for how many, we don't know just yet. Usually getting a couple out can be quite nice, but Strange, he's getting pretty heavy on the gas here. And yeah, just a cool opening and a robo instead of the Twilight early on. So definitely, definitely a different pace of uh, PVC out of him. Yep, no, absolutely. That robo facility dropping down is about halfway done. The next is coming through from Strange as well. It is just across the board. You know what? I can kind of imagine it though, because if he gets a robo or prism and then goes with some kind of like very powerful push, doesn't really saturate the third. I look at that, I'm like, oh yeah, that's such a strange kind of build. <laughs> so maybe something along those lines. Otherwise, we'll see. I mean, he keeps on warping in sentries. Definitely seems like aggression, because otherwise, you don't really need that many sentries. More sentries generally means like, hey, I want to force field your side of the map big time on a big push. No, yeah, definitely. Like. <sighs> So he's been using quite a bit of the sentry for scouting, right? And you see that here. I like this from Strange, by the way. <laughs> An oracle, but met it with two hallucinations. It's That's so smart. funky, man. It, it's smart, yeah, though, it's... right? Because you're revealing triple yeah. oracle. You're like, hey, I just went void triple oracle. Meanwhile, immortal tons of gateways. Love it. That is... Yeah, I mean, he is playing. He's living up to his name here. And how many gateways we're getting? It's going to be up to, like, eight. I mean... Yeah. This is turning into an old school soul train, like <laughs> zero tech with it. I mean, Eliza has to be on point and he, he's getting the spore crawler. So the trick is working here and he has to figure out what he's up against very soon. And Strange has done a great job of just masking all of this in true mystery. Yep. No, very true as we do have this uh, army starting to move out. We're going to see it with the Ling right now. Well. Layla just started a few more drones. He definitely wasn't fully aware. Now he sees it. Ravagers start immediately. you got to imagine more of his production will go in towards units and only units from here. Can he hold this off? 60 army supply for a laser right now. He adds on some links behind it. Obviously, Strange can warp in a ton of units. They are low tech. He's got a lot of sentries. And those sentries are big because they are going to really dictate how these fights happen. I mean, already catching these queens in the front before much girls can go on is a big deal. We pop the first one of those uh, force fields with the bile. The rest of the battle starting to come through. Guardian Shield up. Stasis Ward catches a bunch of lings in the background, so that's pretty nice as well. I'd love to see those Zealots starting to get to oh. the front as the Void Ray goes down to the Corrosive Files, though. Ouch. I mean, this army just dealt no damage, it felt like. Like, those Queens were such a good punching bag at the front, and a laser, all things said and done, he just absolutely murders this push. And he's got lings for yeah. days, and remember, those lings at the back are going to come alive, and... <laughs> I loved all the prep <laughs> out of Strange, but holy crap. I guess that's the reason why we don't see that too much. Well, yeah, I mean, this was literally a case of, like, you did probably the best you could possibly do in terms of setting this up and selling this as something else and everything. It lasers, like, on 65 drones, and it did nothing. So <laughs> if it did nothing there, when did it ever do anything? Um, yeah, I mean, a laser did build some roaches, so he was a little bit safer than he might have been in other scenarios, but... Yeah, that was a, a very speedy, uh, <laughs> very speedy game number one as the laser takes the 1-0 lead. Wow. Uh, I, <clears throat> you know, I, I often like to look at plays like that because the way that Strange sold it and looked like it was going, I, I, I kind of liked it all, man. It just... <laughs> it got absolutely stomped. He was just... And ev even a laser with the initial queens getting caught, I was like, that doesn't feel that good for him, but... It, that RB was just severely lacking firepower, wasn't it? Like, severely lacking firepower. Just all those units just stay alive for so long. And Biles as well, like, he was very clumped up. Even losing the Void to the Biles. It, brutal. Brutal. Yeah, no, that that's true. The Biles actually connected on the Void Ray, but I just I don't think that mattered, right? The DPS just no. wasn't there anyways, so... Didn't really do too much. And uh, Laser looking to get a win. Obviously, he's actually only played Protoss players in this event so far. 2-0 Geralt, 1-2 against Skillus. Definitely, with those results, says he has the, the stature to kind of take down a Strange. And this is his first uh, PvZ for Strange this event. So, uh, I'd say Laser definitely the expected winner. And really showing us in that game one that even if his opponent is going to live up to his name, it's not going to be a problem for him. So, that said, we'll dive into game number two. Where we start out in the bottom right-hand corner with the player that did just take that 1-0 lead. This is a laser. 
Yeah, Site Delta spawning over in the top left hand side of the Red Protoss. It is strange. A laser doing the same opening again here where, you know, you do the extractor trick to get out an extra drone, so you're 15 out of 14. Get up that hatchery nice and early to avo avoid any sort of uh, probe blocking shenanigans, but strange. He didn't do it in the first game, and he's not doing this one either. He's not sending out a very early probe. This is... I think this is what Lambo would label the... <laughs> in fact, what did he call it when Rotterdam kept doing this? It was like the the the, the most inefficient <laughs> one. You know, just you know you're safe, but you don't really get to dismantle yeah. anything or slow anything down. Like just... Uh, yeah, this shows me that Strange has played probably a lot of ladder, just to make sure he doesn't lose against anything cheeky early on, you know? Mm. I feel like, wasn't it Hawson that nicknamed this, uh, this scout timing? That's maybe, good. maybe. There is. Absolutely. I can't remember what they called it, though. But, uh... Yeah. Yeah, the probe shows up, <laughs> sees a hatch in the pool, and, uh, isn't gonna do much else. Even pinches a mineral, so I, I, I okay. dare say most of the time you don't w you don't want it to get the mineral because yeah. you want to be denying the mining for a bit longer. But now he's like, all right, stole your mineral, mate. What are you gonna do about it? Runs away, goes over to the third. Ah, uh, already an okay opening for a laser, but at least strange can be like, uh, like maybe a laser goes, damn, you didn't do an early probe scout again. Like I did this early hatch for you doing that, and you didn't do it. Yeah. Oh, that, that's actually true. That's the kind of cool thing about changing up your scout timings, right? Like, you, you kind of get the Zerg guessing and stuff, and, you know, if you're going to go for the hatch block every time, then the Zerg can just always, like, 15 hatch or whatever. Whereas if oh, sometimes you do and sometimes you don't, that sometimes the Zerg plays inefficiently because of it. As the Lings do catch that probe, so that goes down, and Lazy will take the third hatch, no problems. Yeah, Lazy's definitely going to smile about that one. And that is Stranger's Scout gone off the map. Now, it's not quite Brood War esque, where you can just keep it in your opponent's base forever, but it is meant to get back home. So, uh, already, that's a nice little win for a Laser there, just making sure that's not on the field. And Strange, this game, he's gone for a Twilight Council in his main base. So, not a Stargate. And that, yeah, th this is also the first time we've seen this today in this matchup. Yeah, Twilight Council on the opening, gonna be probably opening Glaives here, unless there's something really funky planned, but two more gates already dropping in, Glaives does seem like the option, and Glaives does start up on the research bar, so we got ourselves resonating Glaives, we're gonna get those Adepts powered, and we'll see if Strange can find some value with those throughout the early stages, again, could kind of link up to kind of what we expect of Strange, where they're gonna see a bunch of Adepts, they're gonna harass, and then obviously once those Adepts have been harassing and all the rest of it, you can obviously sometimes follow that up with a big aggressive push too, so that is an option that awaits us if Strange wants to run that uh, direction. I'm a bit scared for a laser. Like, he's actually yet to get a gas up with all this, so he's, he's got to have a lot of queens and lings out, but Adept Glaives is pretty close to finishing up. I, I, I dare say that he's timed this out quite nicely for himself because it looks like he's going to gun straight into Roaches, but Strange's builds today... It's like he came out of a time machine, man. He's like <laughs> the soul train, like back when sentries used to deal more damage than they do. Like, yeah, I'm going to whip this out. And then it's like, you know what? Let's do this uh, Adept Glaive stuff. You know, like I haven't seen that for a while. Let's, let's see how it does. And Elise is probably a bit like, oh, uh, you know, I got a really nice scout there on all those Adepts. And it's not with a warp prism either. Like this is a one way ticket across the map. One way ticket. I mean, these adepts need to do something here as well. Glaze finishing up. They're going to get, I mean, two or three drones here just gone as uh, roaches are not ready yet. And obviously, as the roaches spawn, they'll not be all collected together either. So, just going to be seeing the adepts in the shade back over towards the right. But there's actually a spore crawler in the wall making a doorway. That means the adepts can't oh. get any further than this. Yeah, a laser for a moment there. He's like, damn you, creep tumor, hitting it with that queen there. But yeah, uh, this, this is something that. Strange definitely wanted to deal more damage with, but those adepts didn't get to get in there. So nice spore crawler block by a laser and nice preemptive kind of wall area as well. Like just just anticipating that kind of stuff. And even though there was no link speed, he's done a good job defending this. And yeah, I, I like how he's utilizing that spore like a shield battery block here that Protoss is doing PvP. Yeah, and using the door. 
remember when Cyril tried to use this against us in the Katowice semi-finals back in 2020. It was the, uh, the, when Glaze was all the rage as well, and Cyril kind of did this to kind of give himself a better chance against Defender. It still lost that series, but it was very innovative at the time. Cool to see someone still using it here and there. It's not the go-to defense, but it can work nicely if you're kind of just not fully ready numbers-wise. You can afford the third hatch to take some damage, but obviously you don't want to deal with the Adept Shade amongst all your other mineral lines. It's just a good little uh, way to deal with it as these Adepts come through. Uh, shade, but again, where do you go? Absolutely nowhere. Roach is in position, so you're not going to ever commit to that. we got Link Speed coming up on the side of a laser as well, by the way, so that is continuing up as well. Do you think Laser is going to stick on Hatchery Tech here and just absolutely throw it with a bunch of Ravages and Lings? I, I kind of get the feeling that's what he's going for here and just hoping to catch Strange before he's really upped and ready to the next tech. Yeah, I mean, I think so, right? Because to be fair, what have the Adepts really achieved? Resources lost? Okay, yeah, you lost like eight Lings, three drones, a couple Queens. I don't know if that's enough to justify the whole Glaive's play, but... If a laser is going to go, he has to go really soon, because the first Colossus is already going to be out now. Arguably, one Colossus doesn't get a lot done. But obviously, if there was ever a second Colossus, then I'm really worried if a laser is trying to attack into that. So, I guess we'll find out very soon. I mean, I think he's got to be going right. I mean, he's not droning. Link Speed's finishing. Units in production and nothing else. So, we're about to send this here. I guess we'll see how it goes. Yeah, and I mean, he has a big supply advantage, but you got to remember, these Roaches don't have speed. This is... Absolutely a laser with an all-in here. Second Robo at the front as well. Force fields are good to get things going, I would say, but Ravagers won't be Ravagers if they didn't do just that. Gets very, very in the face of his opponent here. Sure, Barry Overcharge does a good bit of uh, regenerating, but I think a laser's just got way too much, man. I think a laser made a very good call and read here. Yeah, it is the timing's just spot on as well. Like I say, with one Colossus only, it's like, well, oh. how much can you do? Oh! Really, a pretty darn good sort of shot. I honestly thought it was going to hit even more. The last second split kind of saved a laser that little bit. As that Colossus falls high ground and Strange is just going to say GG's. This one is going to be done. And it is going to be a laser take. Well, a 2-0 in really not that long at all. Just convincing games, defense nicely both times. Uh, and the second game especially obviously went for the attack on the follow-up. Deciding that he could go for it and he could. And he wins it. <laughs> I like... You know, if you didn't tell me that it was like 2015 uh, in maps between these two and like 11 to 8 in series, I'd have been like, yeah, I think a laser's probably like 80% favored here at least, you know? And those games went pretty much how I thought they would go. Like, a laser just, he looked good overall, just shut down whatever strange was thrown at him, even if it was strange. Um, and yeah, just solid, solid build order choices and. The next series that we've got going up it is the one that I've been looking forward to for the whole day, actually. Yeah, the, the Youth and the Lambo series. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how it's going to go exactly, but it's just spicy, man. Like, there's a lot of history here, and I, I love I love it when these two duke it out. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I, I'm just going to grab the uh, schedule here for one second, guys. Let me just uh, get that complete ready and uh, just bring this up so you guys can see, because we're actually halfway through... Europe already. The last few matches, Ben, have been speedruns all of a sudden um, to take us into the second half of the games here. So we're a little bit ahead of schedule, but that doesn't mean we have to stop and wait. We can just keep it going. Lambo versus Youth Thermal, Zerg versus Random. And then we're going to be going into some PvP with Night Phoenix versus Christiana. Akron battles Young Yakov. I think that's a really fun TVZ uh, as the penultimate series today. I actually look forward to Blight versus Gung Fu Bandra as well. All these final matches are like really cool, like interesting games. And obviously very important for these guys making their campaign here in the ESL SE2 Masters Spring Regionals in the European region. Uh, their campaigns really hinge on this one. So more action coming up. Lambo vs. Thermal is next. We'll see you guys in just a few for that one.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, everybody, as we are getting ready for what is Ben's favorite match of the day, it seems. Lambo versus Youth Thermal. These guys having a good chat as we get ready to go because uh, they are talking a little bit about how, um, basically, <laughs> Lambo's like, well, you beat the guy that I almost lost to. And uh, it's funny because they actually had... Um, similar kind of results or similar opponents so far lambo actually beat drogo lost to hostum euthermal lost to hostum beat drogo so they've both beat uh, <laughs> drogo on the way here um so that was kind of interesting they both played hostum and lost to hostum so they've actually had similar results so far obviously i think this is going to really almost depend on what race euthermal gets as well he's playing <laughs> random he could get anything right now he really could i mean it's it's never comfortable going up against a random player like you know, I, I will absolutely bring up Flash in Brood War, where he had and he gets Terran, Wardy gets Terran. Um <laughs> he had that he had that season where he played random, but Brood War, you start off with four workers, way, way, way more influential, like what build order you go for. And he actually managed to get like a really decent result, I think like top eight or top four or something in the ASL, which was insane. But yeah, you thermal, he's he's a scary scary fish, man. Like before he became a Terran player, he was a Protoss player. And speaking of, spawning over in the bottom left of Alcyone over here, it is Euthermal. And the top right from the Shopify Rebellion, our blue Zerg is Lambo. It's actually so scary going up against a random player. especially I think especially with Zerg, because there's so many situations where it's like... <laughs> You know, you can die to a 12 ball if you're too greedy. You can die to, like, proxy 2 rex if you're too greedy. Even, like, I, I know that Euthermal's not afraid of cannon rushing either. There was that moment at Home Story Cups where he was still professional. Mm -hmm. I think still competing for Team Liquid. And he was just cannon rush. He, like, cannon rush Snoot out of the tournament, I think. Yeah, and his teammate. <laughs> yeah, like, there's, there's a lot of brutal moments. So Lambo here is going for a very safe opener, I would say, for the most part. Like, pool first hatchery on the low ground obviously on the low ground but yeah this is this is a fun one because both these guys in in character they're both confident human beings they both play with i think they both still do very high mouse sensitivity they're both very very good players uh, lambo more on the macro side and euthermal very much on the micro side and yeah it's, it's always fun between these two and it looks like it will be a high ground cc from euthermal which is interesting against zerg but against a pool first it's kind of the perfect choice i think there's just a a knock-on effect right where lambo's like well he's playing random so i'm gonna pull first in case of all these things that you mentioned and euthermal's like oh well lambo's smart he's i know he's playing zerg so he's probably gonna open pool first you know in case of all this stuff so i'm just gonna open with the high ground cc and just be very safe not have to worry early and uh, obviously now Lambo knows this Overlord does see the Reaper leaving onto the map. So now Lambo knows what's up. But like we say, with the high ground CC, you're going to be very safe there as you thermal. And you don't have to pull this Reaper back against those Lings. Because you can't just wait until your Reactor and Factor are done, I believe. Yeah, definitely. Like, and, and let, let's, be, let's be real. Like, the pressure's more on Lambo here. Like, you thermal has been very consistent about selling himself as retired for a long time, as, you know, this memer for a long time. It, both of those things, even before he actually did officially retire. Uh, Lambo, he's a, a well-respected player for the Shopify Rebellion, which is um, by no means a, a small team in StarCraft 2 now. Um, so yeah, definitely uh, an interesting one. Uh, this game, the pool first, obviously doesn't really get too much done, does get confirmation on what he's up against uh and gets to did he get to see that there was a cc on the high ground i dare say he did it was pretty damn close but he's gonna know most likely what's up here yeah he did get to see the cc so cc is confirmed and uh obviously that is good information i have known that, that is there and you have the barracks coming over that's going to provide high ground vision which allows you to kill this overlord that does obviously slow down production for a bit and there's a fusion core from you thermal so if you're wondering what kind of style he's gonna play well, there you go, Fusion Core goes down, BC set up to start herself. Not the most popular way of playing lately, so definitely a little bit of a spanner in the works compared to what we're expecting. Uh, definitely is, definitely is. Uh, a lot of Hellions on the map gets to clean up that Overlord as well, and Zergs very often, they don't scout with two Overlords these days, just because if you do, and your opponent goes for a Viking, well, you're in trouble, and these Hellions, this Reaper, they're okay. most likely a one-way trip here, and... 
A little bit of drone damage so far. Oh, that next and shot up. was good. And boy, seven drones for his trouble. I tell you what, Euthermal is looking at that and definitely okay with that outcome. Yep, Ling Speed just not done, so the Lings are lacking in, in how well they can defend. And so we do get in, we get some damage done. I think you're very right. I think Euthermal is very okay with how that goat turns out. I do see the battle crews are coming up. A couple of Hellions are coming out. SCV and the Deep are coming in as well. I was just drop another inject or so. So Lambo on the road to recovery, but of course we're on the way to this BC and Lambo is prepping to some extent, getting the spores up and getting them behind the mineral lines. So that's actually okay against the BC based on where it teleports in. Those spores in general definitely feel like kind of anti-liberator spores so that they're reaching where the liberators might siege up. With the BC, you're likely going to have to relocate the spores anyways because the BC is going to move past wherever the spore would be. Yeah, the only thing they're not is anti-Banshee spores, right? Yeah. Um, just because you want those in your mineral lines. But your thermal behind this, getting the third CC on the go, really hunkering down on the Hellion. And this is this is starting to be very tricky for Lambo to find out what he's up against here because it could still be anything. It could be mech. Like, you, you just don't know. And right now... Uh, the best unit to make a lot of is Queens, and luckily Lambo will be up to a good seven or so. But the BC's out, and yeah. uh, he's just going right on these Queens. And there's only four here in the mix. All the Lings are dead as well. This is this is Bad. very problematic here, Wardy. <laughs> yeah, this is really rough. Two Queens go down. Now the Hellions uh, kind of realize, hey, we could have had some Boy. drones here, and they will go for some drones. Five more workers going down. A Spore is finally in reach of this battle cruiser, but the Queens have to go running to the Spore for the extra backup. We're still going to get some more drones here, depending on what the Hellions can shoot. No, the Lings are going to stop them. As you're going to be seeing this BC around the right-hand side is also just going to stay away. 76 to 63 supply after all of this. I mean, not a bad stuff for you, because also he's following up with Bio. If he was following up with Mech, I'd be like, ah, well, you know, this damage, you know, Mech takes a while to get going, so it's whatever. With a Bio follow-up that hits a crisp climbing, Damage like this really adds up. It can really hurt. This is the kind of game that, you know, you're like, Grandma, do you want to watch some StarCraft with me? And she's like, yeah, of course I do. And then you tune in and it's like, this is absolutely awesome. Like, Battlecruiser just coming in, Hellions. Spire on the go as well. If you're Lambo right now, yeah, and you know, you see everything that's happening in this game, I think Spire is like the one thing that you don't want to be going for. Because there's going to be 1-1 one, one bio out very yeah. quickly with soon to be, what's this? going to be like eight barracks on the go as well. Yep. I, I think that is definitely going to be problematic. And the reason being, muters, because it's most likely going to be muters, they want to keep the opponent at home. They do. And the way that Euthermal's playing, he doesn't want to be anywhere else than parading across the map in your base. This is going to be very, very, very difficult for him. 1-1 one, one upgrades against 0-0 zero, zero as well, because those Eva chambers are just now starting. I mean, Euthermal's going to have a terrifying timing. And you know he can execute. We know he's got the micro to, you know, you know, split well and micro properly. So this is terrifying for Lambo. He is in trouble. His work account is not brilliant. His upgrades are late. His army is not necessarily what you want it to be. I mean, he just finished the Spire, and he doesn't even have really money left over to spend on anything because... Oh, no, he cancels the Spire. Okay, so... He just decides not to go for it, which is a, the right choice. He doesn't need it anymore because the Battle Cruiser account never increased further. So he's now just going to play Ling Bane against this eight racks. Good call by Lambo, and it's a pretty hard one to make as well. Because if you were against Mech, which I think is what he thought it might be, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, you know, getting the if it's more Battle Cruisers or more Hellions, then you have a pretty good idea of what it is, but. I think in some way he made a good read here that it is going to be Bio and just honkers on down to Ling Bane. He's going to try and get up to about 80-odd drones as well, but it's way easier said than done because right now his Lings, they don't deal the damage that he's really hoping they can deal. Yeah, this is nice, man. Another Queen going down. Just a little bit to harass with the BC, right? Keeps the Queens out of position so they can't help against the drop play. Just nice little things. We're actually going to teleport over here and support this drop now with the BC as well. So just cute stuff. And this is a fifth hatchery that may very well just go down very quickly. And that is a big deal as well, right? Just going to be able to grab this and slow down Lambo's production because that's not going to be as much lava available. And Lambo actually supply blocked off the back of that as well. And we are, again, 15 Marines at a time in production. 2-2 two, two on the way from you, Thermal. The upcoming timing is still absolutely terrifying. 
This battlecruiser has got itself up to 19 kills right now. And granted, a lot of it is, well, actually, I think quite a bit of it is queens, a lot of zerglings as well. Oh, doesn't have blink Ooh, available, though. Yeah. So that's Dead. maybe the first misstep of the game for you, Thermal. But everything else is lined up very nicely. And yeah, you said it, 15 marines at a time for you, Thermal. A lot of tanks back home. And my goodness, 1-1 one -one is about to finish up for Lambo here, but he's a minute off being behind in upgrades and yet again against a massive Terran army. Yep, army supply already in you, Thermal's favor. Lambo's trying to go up to Hive, which... It's just a big stretch right now. You know, that's not going to help you in the immediate future. A couple of infestors would have a better chance of helping you right now, but I wouldn't have loved that either. I mean, let's see as Ling Bane starts to run through the center here. The tank's not all siege, so the front tank's going to be in a bit of trouble, but they do buy time. They tank a couple of shots off those Lings, right, and give the time for the Marines just to do damage. So it feels very good for you, Thermal, to start off with as he's dropping back on that right-hand side, wants to keep on trading with these Lings, and just again pulling Lambo back, distracting him, keeping him busy. This is looking very good for you, Thermal, man. You just got to keep saying it. As 2-2 two -two kicks in, his trades are going to be even better. They really are. I, it's so many Marines on the field, man. Like, this is... Oh, my goodness. That is a moment to pause, if I've ever seen one, Morty. <laughs> we're, seeing, to pause. we're seeing Bailings charge in. <laughs> it is an oh, my goodness. Yeah, that is... Uh... That is an unfortunate timing, I've got to say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so Euthermal saying that he, it's probably one of those freeze frame moments for him. That is, that is unfortunate. Unfortunate, to say the least. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was going to say, like, <laughs> Lambo really sums up. You're unseaged and I'm rolling into you. So uh, a moment here as we uh, figure this out. Looks as though we're going to go play the recovery game which will just take a minute or so to sort out waiting for our referee to obviously sort this for us but it looks like we're probably going to be coming out oh, wait we'll just be a moment then we'll come out of this and give it a couple of moments while we wait for these guys to get this game number one resumed in a little bit i gotta say that is very nice of lambo to offer that mm -hmm. it wasn't euthermal asking for it i i'm almost I'm a bit surprised that Euthermal wasn't like, oh, that was really nice of you, man. That'd be really, really uh, swell. Because, uh, yeah, uh, offering that in that kind of situation, uh, very, very nice of Lambo. No, absolutely, man. I mean, just, I mean, it's obviously a big moment as well where Lambo's been in trouble, and that could have been his catch. But, yeah, obviously wants to play a, a fair game as we wait for. Let's get rehosted. It just takes a moment as well because, so the way that it works when we rehost the game like this is, First, you've got to get everyone invited, and then you've got to actually play it. Essentially, the game runs through the replay. Now, this wasn't a super long game, but still going to just take a minute, minute or two. So, uh, just a few moments while we get this. And obviously, for you, Thermal, we have to wait for him to sort out whichever he's going to do to the internet as well. So, Definitely a very tempo-based game, though, to say the least. Like, this is all lining up for this moment for you, Thermal, isn't it? Like, 2-2 two, two, done very much a parade push kind of thing the, the, like if there is a next step for him it's getting 3-3 three, three on the go but it, it's very much all lined up for this like uh yeah <laughs> definitely a brutal situation yep no we will uh get resumed then so just a moment or two and we'll get this uh sorted out and, uh just invite everyone in a couple of moments. I, I, I'm still laughing. I've, I've got like the stream open on my second monitor. And uh -huh. it's, it's just as funny the second time. Like this is an <laughs> unfortunate timing. It really is. Yeah, it was definitely a uh, <laughs> definitely an unfortunate moment. Yeah, just, and still, like, I, I haven't seen Mark say, I haven't seen Mark say like, oh, thanks, bro. Or, <laughs> I'm still surprised. <laughs> uh. <sighs> All right. So, um, to, to be fair, there was one time that I two racked Scarlet when she accidentally made a spawn made this, pool first. They, oh, I thought she made, no, oh, that, made an uh, Evo uh, chamber. Evo, yeah. Evo chamber, yeah. And, you know, I let her, I, I let the regame happen. Then I lost 2-0. <laughs> but, you know, then she, she didn't say thank you or anything. She just went to interviews afterwards and was like, oh, yeah, I beat him all the time anyway. And I was just like, what the <laughs> frick? 
I, I remember being i remember that moment i was so like oh my goodness the shame of these people you know these good <laughs> gestures just being met with unnoticed folded arms like oh my absolutely brutal all right, well, we have successfully restarted. We will be about 30 seconds or so, and we'll be back on track. And so it was about 10 minutes in game, and we'll be uh, ready to go back into this one where Euthermal was looking obviously good, but, you know, it still comes down a lot to these fights and obviously need to be sieged up in the right places and all the rest of it. So we'll see how this goes. Couple moments. Yeah, I, I've got a feeling that it's not a good situation for Lambo, is it? It really isn't. Like, he's absolutely... He needs time, which Euthermal isn't giving him. And we'll see. We'll see. Because they've, they've both seen what happened five seconds on from this situation. So I'm going back in time. Euthermal knows Lambo's ready to pounce. Uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of... Uh, Mind games. There's a lot of mental going on uh, in, in this little bit of downtime here for both of them. Yep. Well... Fortunately, it's not going to take too much longer. We are pretty much right there. The loading screen is it feels so slow, man, when you're sitting waiting for it. And you're just like, go on, go on, fill up. <laughs> Get that loading screen filled up and we can go, go. This is one thing that makes me appreciate StarCraft 2, though. Like, yeah. even in other major esports titles, it's like... Even CS, they had a moment where, like, a player's computer crashed on LAN and you can't replay the round or anything and you just have to keep on going. And it's just like... Oh my goodness, thank goodness for StarCraft. Yep. Well, here it is. So this is the position right where you've got th this army here. Tank's trying to come up and Euthermal does uh, essentially retreat away. So he's just going to back up towards the Siege Tank reinforcements. And he's just going to try and find a slow push forward. His 2-2 just now finishes as well. So he definitely did not want to fight before this moment. From here on out, it's okay to fight because he's got an upgrade lead for the next minute or so. He really does. And... <clears throat> The way that he's playing it as well, this is kind of like, um, I remember Cure pulling out this style where you start adding Liberators to the mix as well, which really make this so much more difficult to play against, you know? Like, it's just a, a whole different ball game, but this tank spread here, this positioning, there aren't a lot of tanks, but there's 90 Marines on the field. There's almost as many Marines as there are Zerglings, and the fight is going to happen. Remember, Lambo does not have an upgrade advantage. He's got... A lot of units situated, not in this fight right now. They're going to try and come behind now, but is it too late? There's so much Zerg here, Wardy, on the field. And right now, all the tanks are absolutely offline, but the amount of Marines that are still left behind. But I think Lambo has got himself out a lot of trouble there. Yeah, I think that was a good enough fight. We've got some barracks that are floating about. A little bit of a mistake there. Euthermal trying to build up into additional bases beyond all this. Um... <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, I, I feel like those bags were meant to reload. Oh, I see. Oh, God. Oh, that's sad. That's that's bad, man. Those tanks were meant to be in the fight previously. So that's where his splash damage oh, was. And that means that that's actually a big deal as now Lambo, it just oh, no. prolongs his chances in this game, right? And now he's going to be able to catch this army. And yeah, you thermal. The tanks blocked in is absolutely brutal for him. Yeah, maybe a bit too much random and not enough Terran, but I tell you what, having all those tanks back at home, if they were sieged, it would have been really good. I mean, maybe it's still okay for making sure he doesn't die to this counterattack. Lambo probably running in there being like, what the frick? Why do you have so much back here? But, ah, uh, I mean, Lambo, he, he's done a good job of just kind of grappling with this game because it's not being an easy one, and these Lings, they are still getting lots of damage done here. Yeah, it feels like you've almost fallen apart a little bit, honestly. Like, I, you know, just... The tanks not being there, and then he's he's got them, and just suddenly now not dealing with the lings properly. Few men, a few too many mistakes in a row right now, and Lambo definitely retaking control. And he's also because he survived through the two two timing. Obviously, his own upgrades caught up. He's about to get adrenal glands. That hive tech is here. The power say bomb off a of viper, but also ultras. Something that Euthermal is not amazingly set up to deal with right now. Yeah. When these guys used to duke it out, I remember so many games of them playing. As soon as a ultra came out on the field, you thermal GG. <laughs> like, so <laughs> many games, like so many games. And right now, you thermal, he's absolutely on the back foot here. Lambo's weathered the storm. He's in great shape. Uh, Liberator is going to be annoying in the back of the base here. But this timing, everything that's set up to it, that is the most random place for those barracks ever. I was going to say, I don't feel like that's where they were meant to relocate and build that stuff, but okay. <laughs> You, you know, it, it's one of those where you rally all your buildings where your barracks are still floating and just wherever they are, you're like, you know what? Screw it. 
like I'm, I'm on the clock here just put down whatever add on I have because even though all your other buildings will rally they'll fly <laughs> yeah I guess what? so no, no you're right man just put it down uh, you just left because I'm like this happened to me so much like I can just <laughs> thoroughly relate <laughs> absolutely yeah uh, you just plonk it man you just plonk, plonk it, it and okay okay so Lambo hasn't started his 3-3 upgrades just yet but Adrenal Glands is done Plus three carapace starts. He's got Chitinous Plating for those Ultras as well. Oh, boy. This has been a, a firework of a game. And that's a lot of Zerg marching on in. And it's not as if Lambo's economy is great, but I think he knows that he's done quite a bit of damage to Euthoma here, that he can do this. And GG, you know, uh, nice game out of Lambo there. Absolutely pulled it back. Yep, very nicely done. GG's indeed. And that is going to be Lambo taking the first game just uh, really was able to keep his cool and keep his uh, you know composure when things were looking tough and was in the end able to get the victory off the back of that because it definitely was not looking good for him at certain points so it was important to keep himself going in that regard yeah uh, fun game though fun game like one of the more fun games that we've seen today in terms of just uh, interesting opener and yep. more random to come as well like it was the matchup I was looking forward to, I must admit, today. Just seeing these guys duke it out again. And yeah, uh, gotta gotta say again, massive uh, kudos for Lambo for just being like, yeah, let's let's go for the regame. Maybe he was feeling that his situation wasn't as bad as uh, I, I was kind of thinking. Um, but again, having all those tanks stuck in the base definitely um, put a lot less muscle in that push than what might have been. Very, very true as we get ready for round two. Obviously, the exciting part of this now is that this is still random from Euthermal, right? We don't know what the next matchup is even going to be. So we just had some CVT. Now we might have some CVZ or some CVP. I don't think Euthermal's actually spawned in as Zerg in the event yet in this tournament. So I uh, I think he's been Protoss and Terran only. So we'll see if this is maybe the time for Zerg to pop up. I, I do think Zerg is actually the worst case scenario for him. I think CVZ is just not it so we'll see it's one of those that playing zerg against somebody that's played zerg i want to say like a thousand times more than you have always feels rough you know it's 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 tough but as far as as far as build order choices and what have you but you do tend to find that like terrans and protoss can sometimes play the other race He's got Terran again, by the way. That's uh, very fortunate. Um, but you tend to find that Terrans play Protoss well, Protoss has played Terran badly, but whenever they all play Zerg, they all play pretty badly. You know, <laughs> it's, 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 just, it's just one of those things. It's a different kind of way of playing StarCraft, man. Yeah, it's, it's so damn different. So damn different. But it will be Site Delta here. Second map here between the man spawning over in the bottom right as our red Terran. It is Euthermal. And the top left, it is going to be a blue Zerg. It is Lambo. Oi, oi. It's not me, right? Referee B, is it? Oh, <laughs> this <sounds> thermal. Ooh. <laughs> All right, well. Well, well Wardy. At least it's the start of the game Ta this time. Yeah, time to tell me about Pokemon, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything to tell you about Pokemon, mate. I, 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 I mean, if you're going to disconnect, this is a better time to do it. That phone data, obviously, uh, not quite didn't working. do him any favors over here. Yeah, not quite, not quite, you know. Yeah, it turns out uh, the internet data was, was not the play. All right, looks as though we're going to have a full <laughs> drop here, so I'm assuming this is just going to be a re-host. You obviously do have to recover from replay because the race has been picked and everything, so this will be another recover replay situation. We'll uh, go, go into round two of this matchup very soon. Just battling the internet demons right now. Ethan was like, hold on a minute. I might not last all three maps, but I can definitely slow down the series by making <laughs> us play two maps four times. Yeah, but we're going to load into this series four times, but it's only a 2-0. <laughs> it's not even a draw. So, uh, yeah, you will disconnect. Like I say, this will be a resume from replay just to make sure everything is exactly the same on the start. It's already been begun. Uh, so we'll get that set up and then we'll get ready to hop into uh, the resume. I was just hoping that Euthelma's internet is going to recover a little bit so that we can continue this series smoothly. 
yeah, I mean, that's the big thing here. Is Euthermal's internet just kaput now? Does he come back? He brings these back. Either now, way. I believe. Huh? He brings these back. You believe? Yeah, I believe. You believe, you believe. You were a th Euthermal fan back in the day, weren't you? I was you good. and him were close and stuff. Yeah, I was good friends with Euthermal, so... Yeah, hard not to be a fan of your friends, right? Absolutely. I mean, he's always been a memer. Always yeah, been a that's, memer. That's very true. Yeah, we obviously... Is, uh, we went to, like, a lot of... I, I did a lot of, like, Dutch StarCraft League stuff, so I went to the Netherlands a bunch. And we just had, like, a same friendship group and so on, so... Yeah, mm -mm. way back when. That was, like, ten years ago now. It's actually crazy. I mean, StarCraft, when you really think back, I can go, like... Oh yeah, to this 2015 was a long time ago, man. And then it's like, no, this this went back to like 2010 for the start of StarCraft 2. I like you weren't even involved at the start, were you? No, I I was uh I wasn't even here when the game released. Like I I wasn't uh <laughs> didn't know what StarCraft Slacker. was, man. Like I bought StarCraft because some guy in my WoW guild was like, yo, you need to get this game so you can play tower defense. I didn't even know what tower defense was. <laughs> and then um and then uh, I, I got it, and uh, I played, like, two games of tower defense. I was like, this is freaking awful. I can't believe I just spent my money on this game. So I, uh, so then I was like, well, I guess I'll see what the the rest of the game is about. Here we are, to, like, however many years later. I, I think it was, like, late 2011, so, like, 13 years later or something. Jeez. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I always like it when people are like, who's Demu? And, and it's like, hey, I've been here since the start, you know, like, and the, or, or I, I think... You know, you can get into those online kind of like, oh, should I, should I tell this guy who I am? And it's like, no, I'll just, somebody else will probably do it. And they do. And they're like, when did you start with StarCraft 2? It's like 2022, bro. I've been here for two years. And it's like, <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yeah, you're, you're definitely cooking, bro. You're definitely cooking. Okay. But I mean, the, this game's so rich with history at this point. Um, your thermal still yet to show back he's up. He's just come oh, back wait, on wait, the channel. Yeah. Oh, no. He is. He, now he's oh, he's gone again. Oh, he's back again. He's off, he's on, he's on, he's off. This is like whack-a-mole. whack a -mole. Except, you thermal, you're here! Get in the game! whack a thermal. Oh, now Mapu's got disappearing. Wow, our observer's just ditching us halfway through the series. Never heard what of, kind of ship? What kind of ship are you running over here, Wadi? Yeah, you know? I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm not in charge of the observers. <laughs> are you not the producer and director? You think I, you think I have in charge of the observers? I just invite them to the call, man. Follow their camera. <laughs> core, core, blimey, butler, and oh, oh, Ooh. in this downtime, just heard my little boy. Oh, babe, thank you, thank you very much. Um, that, that is the the time to get food. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, apologies about that, team. My little boy went to the eye doctor today, and uh, I'll let you know that everything is indeed fine, but uh, just a slight bit unprofessional. Oh, good, mate. There we go. Are we still on camera, Wardy? Yeah. We're on camera. But you're, uh -huh. you're cropped, so actually, they saw nothing. <gasps> fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. I saw it in the score screen. Oh, yo, 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 yo. Oh. Yeah, oh, I guess I this is... um. Picking random races allowed. If a rematch is appointed, players may be forced to stick to the same race as the original match. Please... Okay, so that's that's the debate. <laughs> so mm -hmm. apparently, so apparently, if you're random and you DC and the rematch has to be played, you have to play the same race again. But it's a. <laughs> but why why aren't we just resuming from replay? Because Lambo saw the race in the score screen, I guess. I'm but not that... sure. Like surely we like it doesn't matter how far in you are, you resume from replay, no? I, I'd Wait. imagine so. I, I'm not really sure what the decision making is here. That's interesting. You All right. I mean, it's obviously so kind of right. these rules that have been made, <laughs> never really been kind of set on. I think Lambo said it's okay if if we just redo it entirely and we just. I tell you what, Lambo yeah. is Lambo a king today. Man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely is. Um, <laughs> but it just shows you how. How, how new, how unrandom we are, within regards to like StarCraft Two, right? Like race switching in general is it's. I know it's far more a thing in um, Brood War, where it's like, all right, I play 
ZVP, I play ZVT, but ZVZ, I'm not going to touch. I'm going to be Terran against Zerg, for example. Like, mm, yeah. there was quite a lot of that stuff going on. Whereas in, in StarCraft 2, I mean, we had a little bit of Reyna with his Protoss and stuff, but it, it's never been constantly flowing like that. Yep. No, well, it's... Um... Apparently, uh, we have to follow the rules. He has to play Terran. Uh, Oi. But then I don't understand why... Uh, and I don't understand why we have to make the game new instead of just resuming from replay. Hmm. Yeah, Lambo's coming in here. Again, Lambro, dude. So right now, the... Yeah, the situation. <laughs> this is... This is an interesting. This one I'm new to. Yeah, I know. I really I'm, I'm fascinated to. as an like obviously I run a bunch of tournaments, so I would uh, I don't know what I would do, but uh, I don't understand why you would like. In my eyes, you would. I obviously it sucks because Lambo saw the race, but you're already forty seconds mm. in the game, right? So like at least initial builds have been chosen, like hatchery first or pool first, etc. Right? So yeah, I look. <laughs> that we're just gonna go. I'm interesting though. So yeah, you thought I was gonna be forced to regame with uh, Terran. Very interesting, because, yeah, if you go to the specific of it, his race was random. Um, yeah, but the the specific rule says, <laughs> the apparent, so the rule says if you are playing random, you cannot, you have to then play the race you were assigned at the start of the game. Mm, 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 mm. That's why I mean, but like, like, I think that rule's kind of fine, like, that, that's not what's interesting me. I just don't understand why we then don't resume from replay, so... No? Yeah, I, I, I'm with you as well. I, that's I what's guess, interesting. I think the one thing that this rules out... <laughs> 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 yeah, this, this is a great series, man. I think the one thing that this rules out is the potential for players to have some say on if they thought they got a bad race with random and trying to up their chances, you know what I mean? But then why would you play random? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, don't 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 get yeah. me wrong. Like, a referee's life is to make their life easier. And if this kept cropping up with a uh -huh. player that played random and kept on disconnecting, you know, then get rid of it. But Lambro, being Lambro, and you know, he, he's allowed a regame. He's allowed. He's just allowed you Thermal to do what he wants. And Euthermal, he's been forced by the admins to pick Terra in this game. And now we've got a TVZ on our hands and Lambo again. Going with the pool first here. Yep. Uh, Lambo top left, Euthermal bottom right. Is that Lambo sticking to the build he would have used anyways if it was random? I, I think it might be. Oh my goodness, does this does this gentlemanness just show no bounds? Apparently not. I mean, Lambo was down oh. to do whatever. He was like, he was such. He's like, I really don't mind. Let's just, you know, let's just play. You know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, like both these guys, they they prepared for this today. Uh, they're both here, one one uh, a piece. Mm -hmm. That whatever happens at this point, it's just like you know, it happens. They're both dealing with the same situation, eh? Yeah. I mean, just unfortunate. You know, it's so funny as well because he lagged out. We're like, well, that's the best time to lag out. Turns out it really wasn't, Ben. <laughs> maybe, maybe two minutes later would have been a better time to lag out. <laughs> yeah, it's super damn strange. Super strange. All right, so SB Scout. It was kind of after the barracks, I do believe. Gets to see that it is a pool first. And we have to mention that Euthermal's made his production on his low ground here. So it's the barracks, the factory down on the low ground. It was also a reactor first of all things for him. So I want to say a little bit greedy, uh, but it's kind of like it's a nice build against uh, Zerg in general, this kind of thing. And you definitely have a few very interesting follow ups with like Hellbats, uh, things like that. Good for catching an Overlord if the Overlord does go down its generic path, but not going to be the case today. Yeah, Uthum always likes these kind of like eco openings and then obviously hitting like the big timing a bit further down the line and stuff. I feel like that's always something he's been kind of a fan of. And, and you know, Uthum was always such a creative player as well. Like he was one of the guys, he looks for the Overlord here, but it's actually over to the right side. So good adjustment from Lambo, realized in the last game that Uthum was trying to kill the Overlord. 
Uh, we're going to go double reactor, by the way. So uh, that's kind of funky as well. Uh, I was about to say, one of the builds Euthermal came up with was the kind of like the 14 marine drop with like a mine, where you basically go without stim as like a predecessor to the 211. So you just go 14 marines, a mine, and two medivacs, and you just basically hit before 211. So if your opponent thinks it's a 211, it kind of hits like really, uh, like it hits that little sooner and they're not quite prepared. But obviously, you don't have stim mm. or anything. So he's always very creative with those builds as we get ourselves going into this game too and waiting to see exactly what it's going to be that second reactor about to finish and the starport is going to swap to it nice scout from lambo he gets to see that there and i think it's going to exactly line up to what you talked about and <clears throat> the first player i saw do this kind of thing was gumiho actually and this was during the 16-bit era where like you had this and then the follow-up would be like a, a tank drop afterwards with the marines like very very cool stuff uh but yeah you're absolutely right that you thermal has been good about divvying up his builds like there's also a period of time where against protoss you'd go reactor marines like four or six and then you'd reactor out like two hellions behind it and just attack with just that like six marines two hellions and euthermal was very big on that kind of stuff and mm -hmm. it's going to be a fusion reactor behind it as well like this is yeah euthermal's absolutely been to the lab He's cooking up some cool plays, uh, yeah. absolutely entertaining us. This is actually a, a like genuinely an old school U thermal thing, like the 4D Marine drop and then Fusion Core. Sometimes he plays just straight up mech behind this. There's always going to be BCs. Not sure if he will go mech beyond the BCs, but uh, yeah, cool to see. Just U thermal when he does play Terran still has that little bit of a uh, little bit of something to it. No, yeah, it definitely is. I mean, so far Lambo's <laughs> he's not taking damage thus far he's got more than enough queens he's got eight on the field right now 34 links and hellions are being produced your thermal's still on just two gases by the way just two so i mean the the level of tech behind this is not big and it's going to be a lot of hellions a lot of marines very very interesting out of him like I, i'm not sure it's gonna work but it's it's fun to see yeah, I mean, what he's able to do right now is apply a lot of pressure at the front. The problem is the queen count is so good, right? We've got so many of these queens mm -hmm. here. So they're going to be able to keep everything else pushed back for a little while. And and that just gives you the chance to kind of defend this pretty comfortably. Ling Bane comes up. The question will be, was that BC going to be a surprise at all? Even if it is, Cyclones. there's a lot of uh, queens. And yeah, armory coming up as well, mate. We are seeing some real beautiful stuff right now here from you, Thermal. And Cyclones. Like, that is so wild to me like so damn wild I, I i don't know if this is something that he's practiced a lot of um i i just don't but this is fun man like when when you sit down and play starcraft 2 and it's like can you do just this with like no tech whatsoever on your units like no stim combat shield plus one like it's just not there and i'm just gonna have a ton of units like i think he's gonna get absolutely bopped but i think it's fun to see yeah, no, well, let's see how this push goes. We do not have a Rotron yet, but of course, we do have Balins available, so some kind of splash able to help out here. And as we go pressing forwards, the Ling Bane Queen getting set up. The Cyclone's still locking on the Balins. Taking some connections in. Marines going down. And we just have ourselves the BC still fighting here, but man, the damage output from Lambo is just too good. And it feels like Uthermal again is just not killing anything, right? Like, the Queen's are going to get this BC because it cannot teleport away. That's GG's. That is the game. And that is that. I tell you what, that was 13 queens on the field. Like, Lambo read that very nicely, handed it all very swell as well. He was a gentleman from the start to finish, but he made that look... He, he made that look like, all right, that's a, that's a funky build. We've seen a few funky builds today, and that one just did not pan out. I think Lambo handled that all very well. Yep. No, he... Uh... He uh, really just dealt with that in every step of the way. There was not really much to say about it. So, I mean, the first start of the series obviously was shaky for Lambo. Recovered. Super confident game number two. Played that beautifully. And that leads us into another match of StarCraft 2 wrapped up. Another 2-0. I feel like we had some back and forth earlier, Ben. But, man, it has just been a bunch of 2-0s uh, throughout the day today. And, and when it's a 2 it feels like it's quite a fast 2-0 as well. So, kind of hoping that our last few matches are going to give us a little bit more action because we do have... Actually, I think some very fun ones to come. We look ahead towards the PvP, which is up next. Night Phoenix taking on Christiana. That could go any which way. Then Akron, Young Yakov, two up-and-comers. Have been kind of around for a while now. Akron especially. 
but both have that potential to go on a bit of a run, and hey, the winner of that will be 2-1 and one in the group, which is amazing. And then Bly is here, 1-1 one one playing Kung Fu Banda. That's a, a series from a few years ago, I swear down. So plenty of games to come here. Three best of threes remain. It's Night Phoenix and Christiana up next for the PvP.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, guys. Now they give you an extra dosage of the ESL shop ad, but you know what? We decided just to come and play the PvP instead, so... Uh, with that misclick aside, we are heading on into game. It is Alcyone for our opening map of PvP, and it is going to be Night Phoenix versus Christiana, a matchup where historically Christiana is very dominant. Night Phoenix always feels though he's good enough to kind of take on anyone, but Christiana just has been pretty stable in this matchup here, Ben. Yeah, absolutely has, and <clears throat> you know, there's no uh, Terran imbalance to hold him back this time, you know, like uh, in this matchup, and both these players 1-1 one -one currently, and I tell you what, Christiana has absolutely been a player in the past that has given a lot of the top players a bit of a run now and then. He's a guy yeah. that grinds a lot, um, so he absolutely is scary. But spawning over in the bottom left-hand side of Alcyone today, as the Red Protoss, it is Night Phoenix. In the top right, our blue Protoss is going to be Christiana. Night Phoenix, like uh, for me, both these guys, they're young Protoss players. I don't know. I think they both might still be in their teens or very, very early 20s, if that. Um, but Christian is a guy that absolutely pumps out a lot of StarCraft 2, like grinds, grinds, grinds. Um, Night Phoenix is a guy that's been absolutely dabbling in a lot of the other RTSs that have come out as well. Like, I think he played in one of those... Uh, in fact, maybe he played in the Stormgate Open Tournament as well, made like top 16, top 8 or so. Uh, yeah. So absolutely uh, a lad that loves his RTS in general. No, he is. And just, uh, like you say, kind of able to kind of adapt and kind of be good in those other kind of games quickly. So definitely a talent there. Let's see if it can translate into some SG2 wins today. Again, one and one for both these guys in this tournament and looking to actually cause some trouble here. This is a move I've seen Night Phoenix make a couple of times. Mine had some minerals proxy on the other side of the map while your opponent is going to really struggle to scout it. Looking good. Mm. And what do you think? Because, you know, Wardy, you cast a lot of StarCraft 2. Is Night Phoenix a proxy robo kid? Um, I actually don't know. I, I, think, he, I think he's kind of happy doing all sorts of kind of early aggression. He's definitely the kind of guy I'm not surprised about if he is going to, like, proxy anything on the map. Um, I think over here, Stargate can be a pretty powerful prox proxy just because it's not going to be scouted and you can obviously then mm. fly in with, like, the Oracle or so. Um, that is going to be what it is in this scenario. So, yeah, I, I think, uh, honestly, on another map, I could absolutely see him going proxy robe. I just think here, he's like, okay, you know what? With this position, mine now the bottom. Oh, yeah, but now it's going to get found out because Christiana knows to check for it. So, yeah, Christiana's done his homework. Nicely done. Yeah, I mean, Christiana just needs to find out exactly where it is, because, you know, something's most likely over here, but the question is what, and if he's diligent about it, he will get to spot it, and I think he will be. <clears throat> when I've seen Christiana play this matchup in the past, he's been so much about getting a lot. Not necessarily the highest tech army, but a lot, <laughs> and expanding a lot as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that, that can be difficult to play with play against in pvp because as long like it's not something that you can just be like okay this is the hard counter that like you just kind of have to outplay it right or get fortunate early on a christiana unfortunately for him he's scouting in the spots where it's like okay this would be close to my base okay now i'll start scouting a bit further away because i know something's over here it's just about knowing what and the oracle will fly over his probe so that's actually quite nice for christiana Yep, finally gets that little bit of info, and obviously he's building a couple sentries, Stalker's are in position in the main, Oracle's going to try and swerve to a bit of a different uh, entry point, but yeah, this is looking absolutely fine. Now the Oracle actually flies into those Stalkers, that's going to be a good little pushback. Uh, the sentries do not die as quickly nowadays to Adept, and that makes that uh, any kind of sentry opening just a little bit better against Adept uh, Stargate, so that's definitely a bonus, as these Adepts are going to be allowed to shade through into the main. But I think with the sentries here and the Stalkers, we can now DPS those Adepts, and Again, because the sentries can't be targeted anymore, can't be one shot down, uh, you're kind of just, allow, you know, kind of more able to allow those adepts to shade through and be like, yeah, well, you know, you can jump in and kill like one or two pros before we clean you up. Beforehand, you would have lost both your sentries. Is Christiana going to find that other proxy on the map? I, I see that he's got a unit over there in the top left. I mean, if he finds that as well, that is some 200 IQ gaming from him. But so far, these oracles aren't able to get much done. And it's going to be 
a dark shrine over there of all things. So it's a gateway over there. A dark shrine as well on the go. Night Phoenix isn't about playing your bog standard normal PvP, is he, this game? No, he's really not. He's, he's just kind of going for each and every twist and turn he can possibly add to the table. Uh, obviously, Dark Shrine. I mean, not a bad follow up. Oh, because... is, he spot is he spotting it? Oh, that probe no. Was... <gasps> Did he actually see it? Oh, I got oh my vision. goodness. Wow. That, that is so unfortunate for him because that could have literally been like a giga lifesaver. Now, he is getting down a robo quite nicely timed, all things said and done. But so far, the harass from Night Phoenix. I mean, this was nice getting a couple of probes for his trouble. I think he got the probe that was out on the map as well with the other two or, or other two adepts and five probes. Not bad, not bad. Not bad, but man, he needs these DTs to do something because he's so far behind on supply. He's so invested in all this early game tech, which, you know, he's done some damage done, but it isn't going to stand up and fight. The Robo facility is coming through right now from... Uh, Christiana as well, so if he has the Observer timed well, he might just be able to be instantly able to shut down those DTs. Four DTs. I mean, that's a massive committal as well. Like, that is a good 300 gas on those two oracles, 300 minerals, uh, along with the Stargate. So 450, 450. Then four DTs as well. And he's fallen up with four more gateways here, Wardy. He is uh, he's a man on a mission here. Oh, these DTs, man, they're going to walk straight into this main base. They could just target down the Robo. <gasps> It's going to be extremely close because the Observer is on the way. It's going to pop. It is just in time. So the Observer is there. And now we begin to deal some damage. <laughs> I mean, obviously, we might lose the Robo. Nope, we're going to turn the DTs onto the probes. But at the same time, Stalkers are across the map. And there's nothing to really stop the Stalkers, quite frankly. So that's kind of a little bit of something as well. <laughs> the Archon Morph here makes this a little bit awkward. Chaos ensues. I mean, even the Oracles are going to show up. I love that we're seeing an Archon in the base here. And Christiana did get a lot of damage done. Recalls quite a few of his Stalkers, not all of them. So he's still able to deal a lot of damage on the other side of the map. But geez Louise, this is this is chaotic, man. Like, I, yeah. I'm, a bit surprised he did, I'm a bit surprised he didn't send, like, one of the DTs over to the natural kind of thing. But um, I tell you what, it's absolutely <laughs> not, not your normal PvP to get things going here. No, it's definitely not the normal PvP, and we settled down, Christian, down in workers, but up in army supply. At least it looks as though Night Phoenix will get the chance to get his own blink. Uh, I mean, he's close enough to it now that I can believe that will finish before too much happens. Although, he might have blink, but then Christiana might just outnumber him because, again, up 10 army supply right now, moving across the map. He doesn't have a close warping pylon on the other side, though, so that's a big factor. That is a big factor, but Night Phoenix doesn't have a pylon on this low ground or a shield battery here. This could actually bite him real hard in the butt, but Blink is ready, and a lot of Christiana Stalkers are battered and bruised. I mean, Night Phoenix, he's absolutely in a winning position here. That was ballsy, though. Blinking in behind them, but then the reinforcement Stalkers do come along, but... Oh my goodness, these lads are... This is like when you tune into a boxing match, and you're like, okay, what weight division is this? Oh, like, Super Giga Featherweight? Like, they're just battering each other? GG, Night Phoenix takes the first game of the series. <laughs> Well, he came out playing wild, he came out playing a bit crazy, and he gets himself to a 1-0 and lead. So Night Phoenix, I mean, he was the underdog going in based on history, 37-17 to 17 in favor Christiana's favor in terms of map scoring, all-time uh, maps played. So yeah, Night Phoenix can win games. The question is, can he string two together to win this series and go into Oceanborn for map two? I mean, how many crazy things do you have planned across the course of a PvP? Can Night Phoenix find something else to get himself to a 2-1 and one in this group? Absolutely. That was not your... That was not your normal PvP at all, and you could really feel that Phoenix was just all about the cheekiness, wasn't he? And for the most part, I didn't feel like all of it got anything done, but then it's just like, all right, uh, we're, we're going to start cooking over here. And yeah, really, really cool game, honestly. I, I, I like I like it when PvP is just utter chaos, you know? Yeah. Oh, me too, man. I think uh, PvP is... Uh... Very much so one of those uh, wild, wild kind of times where you kind of get so many different options as well to kind of be chaotic and kind of be crazy. So, yeah, we're going to Oceanborn here, map number two. Can Night Phoenix keep it up or will Christiana find a way to fight back? We're kind of due a two to one, right? Like, it's been a lot of two zeros in a row. So, maybe the PvP will deliver as we have going to start it off with the Red Protoss, who is up a game in the bottom right corner, Night Phoenix. 
And spawning over in top left, the blue Prios is Christiana. If there was one player to go up, 1-0, for me to for it to be more likely a 2-1 in my mind, it would be Night Phoenix. Yeah. Just because I, I kind of went into this series thinking that Christiana was the favorite. You do. Um, oh, you did? Yeah, yeah uh, me Prediction too. go. Prediction, prediction go. Add it again. <laughs> Add it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you can you can definitely feel that uh, Night Phoenix with those cheeky shenanigans was ah, just just good. Like you know, you might pin all your hopes and dreams on something happening, but to be fair to him, he, he made it happen. And yeah, it was it was very devastating. I was very surprised that Christiana actually used all his probes like that to surround and try and kill these yeah. DTs because he he got the obs oh, out. Yeah, like. I, yeah, it was out, and once the obs is out, don't give up any more uh, DTs. Like, don't give up any more probes, right? Because you've got what you need. Like, you don't really yeah. need to save the robo anymore. You've got the blink advantage to so just save the probes, pull them away, and then just kind of let your army kind of play clean up. That yeah, was an interesting one. And obviously, I mean, so many decisions to make in a short period of time because it got super chaotic at that point as well. Yeah, that was, that was the one thing that I was like, that is risky business, because I think that was like one or two DTs that got very low that morphed into an Archon as well. So it's one of those, like, uh, you're, you're you're damned if you do, but, you know, at least you've got your eco alive if you don't. So <laughs> I, I, I don't know, I don't know. But Night Phoenix again this game with potentially a little bit of a proxy over here. Yep. Like, you know what, Night Phoenix, I'm a fan. Proxy Robo Kid coming at you. Hey, you said, is he the kind of guy to proxy a Robo? On another map maybe and here it is so hope the game just gonna put the pressure on and see if we can break through christiana to just take a sweet 2-0 for himself again i feel like such a great opportunity for either of these guys to be two and one in a group um especially groups you know where you've potentially got like uh you know very winnable opponents at two and one as well up next so potentially some pvps obviously that really depends on how the results go tomorrow but like i say i feel like uh a lot of potential for these guys so an opportunity to be made right here as it gets set up Ah, good scanner by Christiana. Gets to spot this before it's done. Um, this game, both of them opting for the same units out of the gateways here. And he starts up his own Robo back at home as well. So I'm not going to get too caught off guard by this, but just because you scout it, this is StarCraft 2. You still mm -hmm. have to deal with it. Yep, absolutely Oh, true. that's a nice start. Yeah, that is that a nice is start. A really the other start. Stalker's on the wrong side of this, so... Yeah, that's really bad for Night Phoenix. Loses himself a Stalker. Immortal coming up. He is going to try and put another pro pile on down, which he will be able to. But now his other store getting trouble down. Oh, where are we going? Bro. That's two uh, dead stalkers. Maybe, yeah, maybe he thought about the follow-up two stalkers that were going to come, you I, know. I but... guess so, because you can't actually run out south easily. Yeah. No. And, and then he thought we could get back to the Immortal. I guess it makes sense. In the moment, it looked silly, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just doing that thing where I'm like, I, I've been a player in this moment where you know i probably look foolish to the commentators and they make me sound foolish but it turns out i i did have a plan <laughs> so one of those kind of situations but i tell you what moving out across the map with his stalkers and then coming here maybe christiana didn't expect this to be coming quite as quickly as it has done yeah i mean night phoenix just didn't stop right he just said right okay then let's send it and he does have the prism here to help now he's going to lose power to his gateways though no warp gate finish so he can't actually add anything else and with an immortal out from Christiana, I'm going to go ahead and say that's probably good enough. These four stalkers cannot be stopped right now. Pylon powers up that other gate, but you need warp gate still. So these stalkers can just kite probes all day, and I think Christiana's got it. I'm going to recall, I think so too. But... Yeah. Uh, and you know, you've seen that recall. Oh, that, that's, <laughs> that's really good out of Christiana. Like, yeah. I was I was thinking, he sees that recall, he's going to get out of there, and he does exactly that. Now he's got a, a phenomenal lead in this game. Better economy, better army together. Ah, uh, re really nice out of him. Yep. <clears throat> well, we do have the... Uh, I mean, Night Phoenix still building the mortals, but obviously Christiana at this point, more workers, has a little bit more army supply available as well. So, again, across the board, just feels like Christiana is going to be in that better position here for now. And uh, hard to really see where you... I mean, Christiana even going to build the Stargate, which shuts down your opponent's prism and can lift up their mortals with the Phoenix. So I feel like that's just mm -hmm. a guarantee in yourself the win at this point. Yeah, he's played good this game, man. Uh, I, I really feel it was like ice cold, no mistakes. That's the way he flies kind of thing. And now he's got his own war prism to go and attack this army of uh, Paul Ladd over here. And 
those poor, poor Protoss units getting absolutely melted by these Immortal. Oh! oh, oh. I say I scored no <laughs> mistakes, but that was, that was a tiny mistake over there. Loses an Immortal for his troubles. Yeah, and he's afraid of losing the Prism and then losing both, right? So understandable. A little bit of miss micro. As Night Phoenix is going to send it three Immortals right now to the one is actually a pretty big factor. Knocks down the battery immediately. This Immortal is going to melt. Fortunately, we do have the Prism to save the day. But now that Immortal is not necessarily in the fight very easily, and Night Phoenix takes a pretty good fight here. I mean, there's a bunch of Adepts. They're very tanky. The Phoenix will do a bit of lifting. I don't think this is necessarily going to be day safe. But hey, this was a hell of an attempt considering we thought Night Phoenix was completely dead. He's going to make a go of it. Three Immortals doing their best, but now down to two. And again, the Adepts just don't die to Immortals, and that's going to be the forever issue here. Oh, that, that Ward Prism. Oh my god. Oh my god. It had one health, Wardy. One yeah. health. I mean... If there was ever a way, that might have been it. And kudos, kudos to you, Night Phoenix. That was very cool. <laughs> oh, PvP, man. I oh, love it, Wardy. I oh, love it. Yeah, PvP is great, man. I love that Night Phoenix had a chance here still, right? Even though, you know, based on everything that went on, the fact we still had a go of it. Really, really cool. Now we're going to see if Phoenix left him, though. That is pretty much going to guarantee the win. And that is going to be Christiana to tie us up. One game apiece in the best of three. And so we are going to go to the game three. We asked for it. We wanted it. We got it. Still pretty quick games, but hey, game three is better than no game three. So we'll see how the decider match goes between these two. As uh, Night Phoenix is clearly being the proxy guy. See if that continues on. Yeah, and that was like <clears throat> such a night and day difference with game one. Like, yes. Christiana got to get the early scout on. You, you saw the early stalker shenanigans as well maybe pathing was not on night stalker's side there or night phoenix's side there um definitely lost out early but the fact that he still made something out of it uh yeah i'm, I'm impressed it, it didn't look all rosy for christiana but christiana made a lot of difficult calls like four stalkers go across the map defend with very minimal uh yeah nice play No, nice play. It's, I mean, honestly, kind of excited to see what uh, Game 3 brings us. So, like, do we go proxy in again? Or are we going to just do something a bit more standard? Does Night Phoenix feel comfortable in the standard game? Or does he feel like he needs the proxies? I mean, it really sets us up for a very cool Game 3. I, I do think Christiana's got the potential to just take it down. I do feel like overall Christiana is the more solid player. Um, so let's see if you can keep that true. You know, no matter what comes on this one. Kind of funny. If Christiana didn't keep that Immortal alive there with that Port Prism juggling... We might have been looking at a Night Phoenix win. As crazy as that sounds, like, sometimes PvP can be so vol... I mean, StarCraft 2 in general is a very, very volatile uh, game, right? Just given the sheer speed of it. But map 3 here, Golden Aura, spawning over in the southeast side as the blue toss. It is Christiana. In the top left, our red Protoss player, it is Night Phoenix, the proxy man in this series so far. Mm. Mm -mm. And we've not... I can't remember what the first map was now. Like, this whole day has become a bit of a blur, Wardy, you know? We have these four-minute breaks to eat our burgers and then mesh it well, together, but... Well, you got a burger. You didn't get a burger. You didn't get a burger? No. Unbelievable. Poor blimey. Yeah, you need to sort... You need to sort Helen out, mate. You need to get your, yeah, you need to sort Helen out. Get, get her to make <laughs> you a burger. <laughs> I'll let her know. A uh, nice... Uh, what would it be? What would you have? I, I was going to say something very, very vegan, like a nice vegan, but a nice halloumi burger. That'd be gorge. <laughs> sure, mate. <laughs> just, just, just have a normal <laughs> vegan burger. Do that work? I just say a normal burger. They do that. Hey, you have vegan yeah, burgers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, but you said a normal vegan burger. I was like, what? That's not normal, Wari. No, you can have like vegan burgers that are just like normal burgers nowadays. Like, what? Yeah evolution man have we gone too far honestly some of the the vegan burgers taste way meatier than normal burgers nowadays <laughs> they do a damn good job actually i, I like you know I'm, I'm poking fun right now i i do a lot of that stuff as well where i eat uh, quite green but yeah this game so far we've not had any low ground uh expansion attempts and the reason i asked about map one is have we had any maps with a natural ramp no and... it's only site delta right yeah has a ramp so we have not and there is those. there is a pro in fact there's two probes on the map for night phoenix here mm -hmm. choices 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 and christiana like 
It's definitely been a game of cat and mouse, like his probes the cat, night phoenixes are the mice, and whether he's going to find them or not, he finds this pylon over here, but no, actually there's no probe here. Yeah, no, no probe, he just abandoned it, so it's just that fake proxy this time around. When you've proxied twice, I think it's pretty okay to go for the fake proxy right into psycho opponent out a little bit, so hold down for that. You'll see Christiana stone up sentries now as he wants to move into that as a way to kind of, you know, figure out information. That's going to be a little bit more gas expensive, and it means that Night Phoenix will be able to put down his tech much sooner. And of course, you will not have hallucinations, force fields, or guardian shields as Christiana will. Yeah, definitely. And Christiana does get to get that Nexus up nice and early, though. Sentries, obviously, only 50 minerals uh, a piece, 100 gas each. But that being said, Night Phoenix isn't exactly far behind on uh, his side of things either. And Robo will be the tech of choice for Christiana. I, I like that. It's it's nice and safe. Allows you to just kind of stabilize. It's it's very. I almost want to say overkill on scouting information, but just getting a, a nice head start on a mortal production is always a nice thing. Yeah, getting that immortal uh, setup going is obviously great, and it can be very powerful. You're going to work with a less mobile army because you're not going to have a fast blink, but you are going to have a very powerful army, and especially with these sentry openings. You're going to have force fields available, and if you can get a push going, you get a couple foot force fields off. The Immortals are just able to fire the entire time. There is so much potential in those kind of engagements. We've seen that happen a lot recently since the uh, sentry buff and the sentry opener has become a little bit more popular. So it really feels like this Robo opening is becoming much more of a viable option. Christiana goes immediately into the prism. Now, <clears throat> Uthermal against Drogo the other day came in with the sentry drops because sentries zap things with shield nowadays. <laughs> so if you sentry drop a mineral line, get some force fields down, it can be deadly, although I'm not sure this... Uh, is an easy main base to jump into, to be honest. <laughs> no, I mean, both the mineral lines are kind of like tucked as far away from you as possible. But we'll see what this cheeky little warp prism ends up doing. It is a nice little scout from Night Phoenix here. You get to see everything that's going on. And you see like three sentries, uh, three stalks as well. What is in this warp prism? Most likely adepts, right? Okay, it is adepts. Yep. Two adepts making their way over. Yeah. The, the sentry drop may just be a thing of dreams forevermore, but it was great to see it one time. As we do have, like, the adept's obviously the more standard way to open, then you build up your mall, so you've got a bit of pressure on the map, a bit of presence, while also building up that immortal Ooh. force back at home. Ooh. I always like these moves, Wardy. Like, the adept's come in, you've got a war prison to fly back to, and no reaction yet from Night Phoenix. This is um, already really nice damage getting done, and even if it was just the lost mining time, you're like... Frick, yeah, that was awesome. Like, the, the Warp Prism, getting this in, it's just solid play out of Christiana. It really is. Oh, did they try? Okay, that was the one from the main. Never mind. But Christiana will have a much later blink, but when he's set up like this, I don't think he's going to be too sad about that. Yeah, he's actually going to move out, clean out this pile on that he's found, so just push that back. Blink is done. As we get this going. Hmm. All right. Well, blink is... I feel like they both have to be so careful yeah. about the other one's army. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. Like, so damn careful, because one, one fight or one immortal out of position and Night Phoenix just pounces on you. And I mean, he does have that soon-to-be warp-in gateway over there in the bottom left as well. Like, I, Night Phoenix is very aggressive, man. Yeah, no, he, he believes he can get something done here with these Blink Stalkers, but I just don't think you can against those immortals. And now you're going to have Adepts in your natural as well to deal with at the same time. That doesn't seem fun. A couple stalkers blink over, but even then you're still running these probes, and actually, yeah, you really got to run them because these adepts can still get a couple kills here. Stalkers take a while to shoot adepts down, so yeah, we're going to get two probes. I mean, it even forces a warp in back at home for Sir Christian. It's still a win because Night Phoenix is otherwise suggesting that he wants to get aggressive here. Absolutely is. Like, Christiana, he's so settled there at his natural. He's even got an observer with his army, like, just in case. And he's getting himself into a position where it's like, all right, all right, if you blink into my main, I have my army here. Like, nicely. Those sentries, though, they've got a mission here, Wardy. And yeah. they are going to... Oh, my God. <laughs> lovely recall. Lovely. I lovely actually love it, yeah. Christiana. I mean, every unit counts right now. So saving yourself a couple here that got force fueled in, that is not a bad thing. A few force fields off ourselves, and it was obviously again so difficult to fight into your opponent because he can blink back. Your opponent, the other guy has a mortal, so you can hardly push in. It's a really weird standoff that we end up at, and uh, that's why this game's going to probably resume. I tell you what, though, as time passes, this gets way better for Cristiano, no? Because now he's going to have blink of his own, but he also has that immortal kind of 
chunkiness in the army as well. That feels so good for him. It really does. Like, they are such a good backbone to any Protoss army, even against Zealots. Like, that's not what they want to be shooting, obviously, but they are such a tanky unit to take down. And Stalkers, they're very finessey, very good at whipping around and stuff, but as soon as you take a fight, which at some Ooh. point, sooner or later, you're going to have to, and Christiana, he, he trades magnificently here to start things off. Yeah, it continues to blink as well. We're going to go and get all these sentries, so that's huge. Just get rid of potential force fields. I don't think Christian is going to stop, Ben. I think he's going to go all the way across the map right now. So he is just going to send it. He is moving through. A couple of stalkers going to sit in the center here, and they're going to try and fight back a little bit. I mean, we could do have these other models. Christian really well, man. Yeah. He's, he's micron really well. Like, going up that ramp, he knew that he'd probably be waiting. He was very ready with the blink. And yeah, the Night Phoenix, he's just... He's looking like the tricky Protoss, and he just went up against a guy that's just come out with some solid play, and he's got a Dark Shrine coming back, back online behind all this as well, and no Robo to speak of. Yep. Yep, I mean, DT Warpins here basically end the game. Doesn't even matter what this army does, because DT is just going to hit every single mineral line, and there's just zero stopping them, so yeah. GG. Absolutely zero. Like, I, it's one of those where I'm like, as soon as they reveal themselves, maybe Night Finish just GG's. Just, yeah. you know, the, the oh, blurs much. are there. Yeah. When, once he hears a DT There's swipe, it's over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, just going from bad to worse. And here, look, Night Phoenix. Yep, yeah, he knows, he knows. Really GG. nice series, honestly. Like, I think they both played cool. Night Phoenix probably went into this series feeling a little bit outgunned. But I tell you what, taking a map and making a series out of it because some of those openings were like disasters for him as well yeah oh that was a, a fun series i'm glad we got to see three games because we saw such a variation of three games right the successes the failures and i think that was really important as well because night Phoenix clearly came in with so many different things to do and uh yeah just seeing christiana kind of again fallen by the wayside game one began together and again being that stable protoss for games two and three able to show us what it was all about there as we do have the updated schedule two best of threes left to go these days man they you think they're going to take forever and don't get me wrong they're not short but uh they do begin to fly by at one point all of a sudden just two best of threes to go akron against young yakov could be a great one Lai Gung Fu bandit could be a lot of fun as well excited uh to see what happens there so we are gonna have ourselves that uh, series coming up or those two series coming up akron young yakov will lead us in to the next series that was just not a sentence so i'll just go to the break and let the ads do the talking brb
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back as Akron and Young Yakov are ready to take to the stage here for some TVZ action. Uh, we are in the lobby. We're just waiting for the players to ready up. And it's going to be Ghost River to start us off. We're going to see one of this, uh, these newer maps. One of these smaller maps as well we talked about, but interestingly small because you end up kind of making the map bigger the more the game plays, Ben, with that fourth base location. Yeah, and just to speak a little bit about these guys, like Acheron, he's been around for quite some time, man. Like, I remember him being the the super youngster on, like, Invasion back in the day with, like, uh, a Hearthstone and whatnot. Um, he, he's been around for a long time, but it feels like he's, I don't want to say finally making moves, but he's absolutely coming together a little bit. And young Yakov, he's also a youngster, but far more new, but... When he first came on, it was like, he's fast, he's he's a bit leery, makes a lot of Ling Bane, but he's also becoming quite a scary fella. So seeing the youth in the scene just get it together a little bit, ah, this is, I think this is lined up to be a fun one. Uh, I'm with you. I'm actually, I looked at the match stairs, I, I actually don't know who to pick for this one, like to have a favorite for or whatever. To me, this was a really cool matchup, very poten you know, potential for a lot of things, because I know Akron loves to play kind of cheesy sometimes as well. I see him in this game instantly sets up all four of his base camera hotkeys, though, so maybe not going to be cheesy this time. As we do start in the upper right side with the Red Terran player, these two are teammates on the Platinum Heroes. It is Acheron. And spawn here in the top left as our blue Zerg player, it is young Yakov. I like his name. Makes me think of uh, Command and Conquer. Yeah. Or Red Alert 2. Yeah, you get like, um, what were some of those units called? Like Crazy Ivan and things like that. And then I think of it, it, one of them. One of those Crazy Ivans could have been like Young Yakov, you know. Oh, I see. Cra <laughs> cra crazy terrorist guy. Huh. Was, uh, it's actually a pretty good name to say, like Young Yakov. You know, he rolls off the tongue it, and stuff. Unlike I just names. wonder what happens when he gets to like 30. Does he become, like, middle-aged Yakov? Mid-Yakov. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it's kind of like Petit Drogo, you know? Like, what happens when he becomes a uh, big dragon? Yeah. Just never happened, man. It just never happened. He stayed Petit. Stayed Petit. Not like, uh, not like Wayne, who evolved from Vanya to Radata, then evolved to, to Wayne. <laughs> I, I gotta say, of all Pokemon to pick, Wardy, I know, like... People have talked about this, but freaking Ratata, like that is, it's as bad as calling yourself Pidgey. Like it, it's literally <laughs> the same area of Pokemon. <laughs> you know, like it, it really is. It's just. <laughs> I love I how I, I love I how just... your analogy is like it's like calling yourself the other Pokemon that shows up where Ratata shows up. <laughs> yeah, it's just terrible. Oh man, and then because I, I still think Vanya was a cool name. Wait, oh, I like this uh, this bunker over there. Does it block the third? Because this is something I, I... I think there's a... I mean, it kind of should, I think. Unless it can go down. You, uh, it, it's one of those... It's one of those maps where you have to take this as your third. Yeah. yeah so you starting mentioned off earlier. like this, I think this is just cool. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned it earlier where you're like, man, I love some, you know, some of these builds where you kind of go and block that third base and you just don't let them take it. And then where do they take their third? Well, they don't. You know, you, you, yeah. do, you don't want to go bottom left and take the fourth base location as your third, because then you're going to get dropped like crazy. So it's really limits what you can do. Young Yakov now decides to put down a gas, and that's actually kind of uh, going to be a factor as well, right? There's going to be his second gas coming through, so... Uh, no, sorry, he's got the gas built on the... Yeah, uh, never mind. I was wondering if he was going to take another gas to <laughs> kind of uh, make up for the lack of a third, so then this drone building the extractor trick me. My bad. Never mind, never mind. Hey. It's all good. It's been a long day, Warder, you know. Like, have we cast eight series today? No. Have we cast nine? No. Oh. Yes, we've cast ten. We've cast a lot of series today. Yeah. Ten so it's, it's okay if you make errors, but I just hope it's okay that I make errors as well. It's not. And I yeah, expect the best you. Yuri. <laughs> uh, now I'm thinking of those uh, alert names. So thank you, Tobertal. Like, Yuri, Tanya, Yakov. Like, it's totally one of those. <laughs> There's the uh, Jerome, by the way, trying to become the hatchery just there. The Reaper is going to get away and just delays that a teeny tiny bit longer. So pretty hefty delay. Now the Queen's blocking the hatchery with that all in on it. That poor drone finally gets to be a hatch as the Reaper will go down. You know, I think young Yakov, all things said and done, 
has probably managed things a, like I, I don't know if this is his first rodeo probably isn't but he's kept his minerals decently low despite this happening because this is not one of those situations that you're like yeah i'm gonna go into this game and you know I'm, I'm gonna get blocked here it's it's definitely something that throws you off massively acheron is following this up with a double gas opening before the third so looking to absolutely pile on the pressure and we also talked about how the air distance is pretty close between these guys definitely gonna well there's a lot of potential to deal a lot of damage with this banshee which young yakov will get the scout on at least Yep, going to get a little bit of scouting information to be able to work with that. And obviously gets to see absolutely everything, so that's always great. It's always a big plus. And so do have the uh, cloak coming through, the Banshee on the way. Double Hellions popping up. Failing Ness is coming through. And we do have our lair starting from Young Yakov. So, yeah, he just gets everything ready. Again, he knows what he's playing against, so he can make good decisions. That is his current, uh, current motto. You know what I just thought about, Wardy? If you go ahead and call yourself Ratata, you might as well call yourself frickin' Magikarp. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I can't get this out of my head now. It's at just, least at least Magikarp I, evolves into Gyarados. Ratata evolves into a slightly bigger rat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'll be super honest. In my first, like, six-man Pokemon squad or whatever it was that you could have, I did have Raticate. He had yeah. dig for me. He was so cool. <laughs> well, you get, emotionally, you get emotionally attached to that first one you find, man. That's the thing. Yeah, well, I, I even, um, you know, I caught one of those frickin' Metapods, leveled it up so I only had Hardened, so I had to keep switching it out. Oh. But Butterfree was pretty badass. Yeah, Butterfree was sick, but it was just impossible to get early on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. De Tough definitely times. was. 1-1 one, one still so on the way. A couple of drones. Yeah, I, I, do, I do like this bounce back and forth, you know, uh, mm -hmm. for us. But Acheron, I, I like what he's set himself up for here. Like, they're both playing... A pretty good, solid TVZ so far. Is this just... Wait, he does have a third up at the wall, right? Because yeah. he does, yeah. Okay, okay, good, good, yeah. good. He's got a third base rock, and he cancelled the fourth base of his opponent, so that's obviously great. That's lovely, getting there. Active creep tumors, goodbye. So, uh, yeah, you reset a few of those, and... Yeah, Akron is playing well. I love the activity that he's finding so far. He's going to get himself another creep tumor. He's going to chase the queens down Ooh. for a kill as well, because why the heck not? And Acheron is popping off. No, he's getting so much done early. Uh, every time we said something good, we, we then look and it's like, oh, damn, he's got his tank stuck <laughs> yeah. in his face. <laughs> That's happened a lot today. Maybe more. Oh, and there's so many links in this base yeah, as well, Wardy. What have you done to him? No, I cursed him. It's the third, mate. You, you mentioned the third was in the wall and he moved it over. A couple of Banes are going to show up. I think we're going to be able to get rid of those before they connect. So, yeah, this is actually not that bad. He didn't lose SCVs here at all. So this is probably good for Akron because he actually gets to clean up a bunch of the army for free. And, I mean, that's scary. He's about to have 1-1. One, one. If he gets a push going right now, Young Yakov may struggle in numbers. He absolutely might. You're absolutely right because he's gearing up to get Hydra on the go. He's got, like, the plus 1-1 one, one finishing up as well. Young Yakov does have a squad of Lings out on the map that could absolutely deal damage on that newly uh, formed third, but can this Terran army be stopped? That is the question for Young Yakov right now. Yep, well, I mean, he is uh, going to have to figure it out. The tank's in a beautiful little spot there. Again, I love the counterattacks because I think, in theory, they're going to distract Akron and keep him busy, but Akron's dealing with them well. Doesn't lose SCVs again. Doesn't kind of take a bad fight over here while it's happening. Bailing speed's about to finish, but we actually load with the Medivacs anyways. He's just going to let the tank do a bit more work here. Now we unload. We get rid of the bands with the tank target fire as well. And these Marines, as they unload, should deal with the rest of the links. So Akron continues to make this a pretty decent fight for himself. He does. He does. But the one thing that I'm looking at here that absolutely is going to keep Young Yakov in this game. 1-1. One, one is finishing and the armory only just finished so that massive lead and upgrades that Acheron had it's fading it's fading pretty damn rapidly and his work count 53 young Jakob's getting himself into a really good spot now yep that's true if he keeps on holding it's uh, looking good for him he's about to equal up upgrades as well so that's not going to be a problem for the foreseeable future and uh, again he keeps on running by I love it just more links heading around the bottom although a few of them accidentally go and path through the rest of the army there so that's a shame but uh, the general idea of what Young Yakov is doing is great. And he's going to be able to get even more Banes up. The Hydra Den is finished. Those upgrades begin as well. So we get that prepped and ready to go. There's a few links show up here. And they're going to go after some SCVs. 
Oh, even more going. I mean, that's a lot of Terran, to be fair. Like, you're going to have a hard time trading nicely against that. But at that third base, core oh, blimey, this damage is absolutely stacking up. Like, Terran don't want to be in the situation where you're getting run by, you know? You, you really don't. But I guess that is one of the things about this map. That third base is so damn open. Yup. Yep, it is. It is uh, very... Oh, it, it's funny because it's open, but it's very hard to get up the ramp to it. Obviously, that doesn't matter so much for Zerg. But it's very difficult to, like, get your army up there if you're, like, a Terran or so pushing in. So, kind of makes it uh, an interesting third for sure. Let's just see our Marines and Medivacs continue over to the left-hand side. A couple more links getting picked away. The Banes are still chasing through. Medivacs loading up once again. I just saw a baneling blow up on that rock, but don't worry, young Yakov, we didn't really see it. Um, and now the drop goes into that natural. And there's quite a bit of Zerg to greet it, but is there enough? I mean, one baneling does get a pretty damn miraculous hit on most of it, but this is the kind of damage that Akron needs, and he needs more of it, but all the queens do greet it. Young Yakov, this lad, he is all about just throwing his army across the map, isn't he? Be it like harass or rumbies, things like that, but... He really wanted to send it there. Yep. Absolutely. Just going to be seeing the uh, the rocks, by the way, are <laughs> kind of a contest. We're going to try and clean those up so we can access that area. But Akron comes around the bottom left, and during this time, he knocks down a drone that wanted to be a hatchery. And again, now you have to split up a little bit as young Yakov and figure out what direction you want to take this in. Just going to see our Marines knocking down the creep tumors. 2-2 is about a finish from Akron. And to be fair, young Yakov did not immediately start 2 2, so it's another little timing window for Akron, but I'm not sure if he has enough units anywhere to really make one solidified push. Um, I guess he's just very split up, but if he does make one solid push, maybe there's a timing before 2 2's done. One major thing to talk about this game there's no fourth CC on the way for Akron. This is eight barracks, and the last three are all naked barracks as well. Like, so Akron is absolutely committed to this. Like, there's, there's no follow up to this. He needs this to do something and it is a very big 2-2 timing but look at young Yakov again he's in the natural here Wardy and I mean he realizes how committed this is I do believe but again that doesn't mean you're going to be able to stop it because that is a lot of Terran at his front door yep and a lot of marines tanks are going to get sieging the Banes are going to come through the Ling's still attacking on the other side a few more SCVs going down Tanks in a great spot, and we are just going to be seeing the rest of these Marines figuring out what they want to do. Got a whole bunch of Queens. This is beautiful for Akron. The position is great, and again, it was hitting just before 2-2. Now, finally, 2-2 finish. Lurkers on the way. Are we ever going to really get a chance to see those do much? Remember, these Lurkers are not upgraded because the Hive isn't even finished yet. We pull back, and we let the tanks and the Marines do the work, and that is beautiful for Akron as he is going to keep pushing in. It looks as though he's got this game number one on lockdown. The supplies are so close. I mean, look at all that Zerg in the bottom left, though, here. That's going to be kind of tricky. Taking out the third hatchery is a big deal. But all those units that was kind of left behind just to deal with all the run buys, they are now marching their way across the map. But we got to remember, it's not as if Aquan's rich behind this. 42 SCVs. He has to make something happen with everything he has. And granted, he's doing just that. But it, the finish line, it, it, it's right there. He's, he's on, on the nook of it, you know? Yeah, he is, just needs to figure out these lurkers. They don't have that lurker range yet, so they're not as scary as they will eventually be. Oh, he's got liberators too. He's got ways to push into this, man, as the lurkers going to try and dive on the tanks, which are all on siege, so libs need to just siege up. The tanks actually don't re-siege, which I think is the right choice there, because otherwise they would have just got killed. Uh, so good choice by Akron. Again, he's just trying to push himself over the finishing line. Like you say, he's not have economy on the third base any longer. He needs to get it done with this push. Yeah, you know, Yakov hold him up long enough. Again, the lurkers are terrifying, but... I mean, this run by is pretty tough, fine too, right now. Yeah, I mean, 3 3 isn't on the way. Look at Akron's gas. Like, this, I think he was kind of forced into this kind of situation. The SCV count, 25 remaining. Every second that goes by is just worse for Akron. So, even though he had young Yakov absolutely on the ropes, young Yakov has brawled his way back into this. You look at the workers killed this game 46 SCVs died, 11 drones. You're normally talking the other way around, but <laughs> young Yakov has played such a counter-aggressive game. Yep, 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 yep. I mean, look at it. It's uh, it's always been about the counter-attack. It's always been about the follow-ups. Never about kind of oh. fighting straight up, as we're going to get in again. Man, Akron is letting up the pressure, which I guess is fine because he's getting more liberators out, but he's going to have to go again soon because these run buys continue to be scary. and He's already on kind of low economy, man. 
also is against Lurk Tech. And this Lurk Tech is it's not known for being bad, you know? <laughs> it's uh, pretty damn solid. And Vipers also going to be joining the mix here. So those Liberators can be yoinked in. This is a good drop. I mean, unfortunately for him, this is the one time that Young Jakob's actually at home to greet it. But still, Young Jakob has to know that he's in good shape here. Like, as long as he isn't too crazy. Because it's 24 SCVs, 24 Wardy. That is such a horrible situation to be in. Yep, his economy is pretty much non-existent. It's got to be with the army that he's got right now. But again, getting that across the map currently seems like a difficulty. I do wonder what he's going to say is kind of the, the final line before he just sends it and goes. I mean, he, he's pretty much protecting one mineral line worth of mining at this point. Like, he, he really is. I haven't seen SCVs produced from him for quite some time here. And... Maybe he's like, you know what? Every SCV I make dies at this point. Like, why would I make any more? Like, you're right. He's going to send it, but there's now 12 lurkers. How many scans does he even have available? Like, it's a lot of liberators, to be fair to him. And his army supply is very, very big. Yep. Army supply is uh, is amazing for Akron. I mean, he's just going to go. Oh, Viper's obviously nice. They do not kill the liberator, though. So that's some Viper energy. I'm going <gasps> to say wasted the parasitic bomb potential is huge. The libs are going to siege up very far forward. The tank siege as well. I mean, this is going to be a messy fight. The liberators are going to get absolutely demolished. They do take out a lot of the hydras, but the problem is with knocking down hydras is that there's no liberators left. So knocking down the hydras doesn't have a knock on effect. That was a scary fight as Akron sets up on the left-hand side. Looks as though he's going to keep on pushing. Tanks are sieging. Liberators are moving. Well, a couple of abducts and those libs will likely actually not go down. The Hydras aren't here. Oh, I think Akron is still making this very scary, but the supplies are closer than they've ever been in terms of army. They really are. These Liberators are definitely a thorn in the side, but kind of squandered, a bit thrown away in the front there. And I mean, that fight before... He was really banking on that, just kind of cleaning up. But young Yakov yeah. was very quick to pounce. And now the Vipers wow. getting their damage done. The Rumbai is on the other side of the map as well, dealing, well, pokey damage, I suppose. Yeah, if he gets on the third base. <laughs> I mean, there's been SCVs on the third, I think you could jump on, but... Uh, um... he's, he's having a little gander. He's having a walk around here. So, okay, now he's on the base. There we I go. I think this is the nail in the coffin here. Nail in the coffin. Yeah, man, I was convinced Acheron had it when he killed this third base off. I actually honestly think he had enough to just stim into the Lurkers because they didn't have range. And so it sounds crazy, but I actually think in that moment, if you just send it, the Lurkers don't have range. You do a little bit of a pre-split. There wasn't any buffer for the Lurkers either, so you get on top of them quickly. I actually think he could have maybe broken through in that moment. And then young Yakov never gets the chance to add Vipers, have a good Lurk account ever again. But... uh that was how close and crazy a game it was. As uh, uh, Acheron does not get to take it down. Young Yakov holds on. Scrappy game, fun game. Hey, that's what we kind of expected from these two. And we get it in game number one. So, great stuff. That was a really fun game. And, yeah, we I, I didn't really get to talk about their play styles. Like, both these guys are chaotic. Uh, very different reasons, obviously. They play different races. But Young Yakov so much about Ling Bane, like so much, always thinking about these counterattacks and making it difficult for you. And not all Zergs play like that, not all Zergs want to, but if it is in your repertoire that you can do it, it's something nice to have in your arsenal. You've seen, you know, the greats like Raynor pull it off time and time again. Um, but Young Yakov did it very nice that game, got himself in a little bit of trouble quite a few times, but overall managed to solidify and, and get things done and dusted. Acheron very much put himself into an all-in position there just by being on three base only, three CC, and then eight barracks, the three extra ones being naked. And unfortunately for him, young Yakov just his ground. Yeah, it did very, very well to do it as well. So Delta coming up from map number two. Let's see if we get another scrappy game. I mean, that's very Acheron as well just to play that kind of like, I'm three base and I'm going to stay three base. I'm going to come and kill you. So, uh, it's easy to imagine him playing similarly. I'm actually going to start with him in the top left-hand side. The Red Terran player is indeed Acheron. And spawning her in the bottom right-hand side, one map away from clinching a 2-1, it is young Yakov. And by 2-1, I mean 2-1 in the group, obviously. Yeah. Which is a huge deal. It's a massive deal. Uh, I mean, can you... Oh, oh, oh. So where we talked about Akron maybe being mm. a feisty youngster, this is definitely a bit feisty, I would say. 
And you know what? You see this so much less these days. So much less. You do, but Acheron is probably one of the Terrans I feel like does this the most. I remember Acheron was always a big fan of, like, Thoraxing as well. Like, Proxy Thorax, the SCVs come and he just sends it. Um, this is just straight up T-Rex, so... Some Proxy T-Rex pressure to get us going. And uh, young Yakov, did he just turn the Overlord? He did, but I don't think it's ever going to go close enough to see those barracks without turning even more heavily. That is very unfortunate for him. You can... See... Oh, oh, oh! Oh! Oh my god! I tell you what, what a game, young man. Yakov. You know, crazy Ivan, eat your heart out. This is young Yakov. <laughs> That's a nice spot, mate. That's a nice a spot. huge scout. I mean, maybe a bit too late to pull drones to harass it or be annoying or so, but just the mental preparation you can make, knowing that this is now happening, knowing that this is online. I mean, that that in itself is a big deal. So Overlord does want to run because it doesn't want to get taken down by those Marines. So obviously just run to some high ground here. The SCVs are going to show up. Even a third SCV from across the map going to show up as the double bunker, the triple bunker. Going to go down. Yeah. Okay. Oh, mate. The, I think he's doing this because I'm in the game. He, like, this is a blast from the past. This, uh, I used to give Idran nightmares about this one, man. But Acheron, there's, there's one thing behind this. He also has a gas mining very, very early. Like, I think... <laughs> this is not what you want to do against this, man. No, I, that's just going too soon. You've got a spine on the way. I know it's going to be frustrating. You're never going to be able to get us around, but I feel like pulling the drones into it is, is almost never going to work. I think you've got to be a lot more patient against it, which is frustrating because like you don't want to be patient. You're concerned, but I think patience is absolutely huge right now. Absolutely huge. Like, if you are to pull drones against this, you have to be at the top of your ramp before the bunkers go down. Not like that. That was... Uh... Well, he knows it now, and maybe he's going to pay a pretty damn harsh price for it. But, oh, this is this is definitely a brutal one. Like, if he kept those drones mining, that's so much lost mining time. It really is. Now he's probably going to be able to break out, especially with those spines. And those bunkers, the focus in the hatch. That's why these lings aren't going down anytime soon. And that's what he came for. He's got his factory almost done back at home as well. Yes, he is going to lose pretty much everything here. All these bunkers will fall. None of them salvage. The Lings again surrounds on some of these Marines as well. Some of the Marines left behind going to just die to a spine crawler or so also. Okay. Okay, okay. Now what's going to happen, eh? That's, <laughs> that's the big question. I mean, I look at that in mineral income. It's been like 300 versus 1,000 for a little bit of time. Young Yakov's getting Ling speed on the go, but... Did those all three SCVs get home? They are. I'll tell you what, young Yakov's in trouble. A lot of trouble. Yeah, no, this is definitely not a pretty situation in any way, shape, or form. So I think you got to kind of rebuild your hatchery, go from there. Like you say, the factory's done, so the first Hellion's already coming out as well. And mm. so we just got ourselves a setup so the Lynx can't do much on the other side. We're all going to get Lynx speed, and the CC's not done yet from Akron either because... Three bunkers is expensive, and that's more than you usually build on a two racks. And so the the CC timing or the natural CC is just a little delayed compared to what it might have been otherwise. But of course, it came at the idea of you know being super effective by kind of walling off. So uh, you get some mm. benefits. Comes at cost. It certainly does. It certainly does. And right now, let's have. Okay, so I mean, it's going to be a lot of speedlings available, which is good. You know, I I actually really like this Viking choice out of Acheron because already it's a game where you know you've wounded your opponent. If there was an Overlord or two to pick off on the map, everything hurts. Everything really hurts. And he's going to be following up with four Hellions and a Medivac as well. So he's not looking to slow down this game anytime soon. He, is abso he absolutely knows he has a lead. And he absolutely knows that young Yakov has to do something wild to get back into it, be it be really really greedy like with super duper droning or some kind of all-in but as long as you are okay against both those things which the viking kind of helps against and gets to spot things for you he's going to be cooking yep no that's uh very true i love that we're going aggressive with the stim already in the second you know just getting both those racks back get stim I feel like you get on the map, you get aggressive, you just keep the pressure up on a Zerg player who is obviously hurting from the early game. Just don't give them the chance to get back into this at all. There's uh, a couple of queens popping out. Young Yakov just trying to restabilize. Third base up. 
he doesn't really have anything right now. He's got 12 lings on the map, so he's got to be really careful with his positioning. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Certainly does. All righty. Now, the dust has settled a little bit. I'm a bit surprised these Hellions aren't already across the map <laughs> with the medevac. Like, that, that's something where time is of the essence. Like, you really need it to be dealing damage as fast as possible. The sooner you deal it, the better. He's getting up a wall. Still no third CC on the go. I mean, I, I say that, but it's a very irregular game. But up to three barracks already. Stim on the go as well. That Viking's still looking for overlords. I think it's got two so far for its trouble. And that Hellion, totally, totally not spotted yet. Yep, this is actually huge. Just resetting the drone count a little further right now is massive because that's the one thing Young Yakov was starting to do, right? Get away his drones. Ho, 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 sweet Evo Chamber. And you're still going to lose a bunch of drones here, right? But that could have been even worse. So good Evo Chamber to help out at least. That is something. It definitely is. And dropped again. Got them all out. And I tell you what, that is... That's a welcome sign if I've ever seen one for these Hellions just to... Okay, this is that moment in the Matrix... Neo sees the cat twice and he's like, deja vu. It's like, you know, it's absolutely brutal. Absolutely brutal. I mean, Akron's all over this game and young Yakov, he, he's struggling to get a, a look in here. Yep. <clears throat> I mean, he is, uh... I mean, you know, Yakov's just kind of dead, right? Like, I kind of had some hope when he was getting the drone count up, but you just can't lose even more drones, right? You just can't lose even more. And the army of Akron now coming across the map because he knows how aggressive he can be. I mean, he's just going to send it across this bottom right away we go. And uh, I think we get the feeling that this is probably going to be a pretty powerful uh, push in from Akron. That's going to tie this series up, then. Yeah, I, I don't know how young Yakov can hold this. Like, as we stated before, he, he had to do something ridiculously greedy uh, or risky to get back into it. And Akron, just a good, solid two-base all-in follow-up after killing so many drones. Just 17. But but still, like the text there for him, and yeah, y young Yakov has so such a far distance to go in this game. Yeah, I mean he's he's dead man. Because the thing is, it's not like Akron's like, oh yeah, I want to turn back home and Mac or anything. No, he wants to kill him because okay, he's got a third CC on the way up, but he knows the opportunity he's got right now. So yeah, just gonna be seeing that uh, group of extra bands coming in. Young Yakov will do anything he can to survive, but I guess we'll see. No, absolutely. And what's what's going back home here? Is that a couple of tanks? All right, so maybe thinking, maybe a bit worried about some counter-attack play. I mean, after seeing the first game, you can absolutely respect that, right? Like, <laughs> um, a little bit of that, but just going to drop in to the main here. Not actually going to chase down the drones just yet. Now he's going to do a little bit. Baneling Train does come in, gets a few snipes on the go. Young Yakov is going to hang in here, just because it is a very important game, and... In you know, why not? Why not? I think as the games go longer, he probably feels like he's maybe the better player. And the fact that he's still not seen a third go down, he's got to know that Akron's eco situation is miserable. And he's, he's right about that. I think at the end of the day, right, if he saw a third base fully saturated already, he probably would be out of here a lot sooner. But if there's no third in location, you can still be in this, right? Like, your own third base is up, your fourth is building. Like, the third is very delayed from Akron, which is kind of why I thought he might be a bit more kind of, like, stick around and keep on pushing, because he did delay the third a long time to make this push happen. But, you know, he seems to be happy with what he's done and back it off. I'm not saying that Young Yakov is going to be right back in this, but it definitely gives that possibility. Uh, kind of, like, a little bit of life, at least. The Liberator is great, though, and the entire mineral line not mining is going to be pretty darn harsh. As Ling Bane sets up on the left side, Young Yakov setting up counterattacks, trying to find something here in the near future. Yeah, and Akron's taking his third base very carefully here. Like, after being all about the tempo, he's like, you know what? The way I lost the first game was a little bit sad for me. Um, just going to make sure that I don't take too much damage from this stuff. And, yeah, the... the, the, the what's, what's the word? The... the What's the word for, like, the play? The, the script has been flipped. Absolutely yeah. has. Where he's the one just dealing all the damage. Because 21 drones to zero SVs falling. Such an opposite story than game one. 
Yep, damage, damage, damage. I mean, again, just one of these scenarios where we just have, I mean, basically nothing lost all game from Akron. What he's actually lost is kind of wild. He actually gets in here. A lot of the armies across the map. So this is a really well-timed counterattack. Oh. The SEVs were stacked because they were trying to defend against the Lings, but the Banes showed up. And honestly, that could not have done better, I don't think, for uh, for young Yakov. You'll clean out everything on the natural. I, I mean, yeah, this really couldn't have gone better for the amount of units he threw in. 20 SEVs and a bunch of Marines and a tank is amazing. The problem is young Yakov still has no answer to this army over here unless Akron really messes up the micro. Yeah, I mean, there's only there's 13 Banelings on the field, 52 Lings against 61 Marines. Like, upgrades are fairly close, but young Yakov just doesn't have enough to throw at this, man. He really doesn't. 50 drones versus 52 SCVs now. Or 42 SCVs, even. Yeah. Just loses. I mean, again, you just can't deal with the larger army. The counterattack was great. I mean, dropping in the main base is a problem that he has to try and deal with as well. Has to run everything over here. He's got one more counterattack moving this time. I mean, third base, I think, is actually undefended currently for Akron. Is he does just lift back up into these medevacs. The lings are just there. Okay, there's a liberate on it. But honestly, you still go in and get some SCVs here. And once again, Akron's defense is kind of crumbling, man. I mean, there's a bunch more workers going down. My goodness. Oh, my God. He's down to 27 SCVs again, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know... <laughs> This is, this is scrappy, man. Like, Akron's making his life so difficult, isn't I it? Know. Like, so difficult. Oh, it just doesn't need to be like this. <laughs> no, it doesn't. No, he, it like really a, bun does not. a bunker would have been great. I, I feel like as well, oh, he's like. Oh, oh, I don't think this is it. Yeah, I understand wanting to break this position. There's a bunch of units in the main base, but the tanks are so well choked up. Okay, well, that, that'll do it. That'll do it. GG. Surely. Will it though? Will it? Will it? This is a messy I game, mean... honestly. Like, this is kind of messy on both sides. I think Akron is really intent on being on this bottom side when really, when he's killed this base, he should have just backed off, reinforced, and then hit the right side instead and just keep playing it like that. Because by staying down here, you're not immediately pressuring the Zerg, and that allows them to do things like counterattack and perhaps catch portions of your army, etc., right? So, it's definitely a, a big deal. He's been so unwilling to just play the game out stably, hasn't he? Like, even now, 30 SCVs, he's like, you know what? Let's not make any more, you know? Yeah, and, I know. I mean, I think he is going to win, but... Well, yeah, he, he's got so much army supply, he should absolutely win every time, but... Again, like, some of these kind of... Like, even if he just pulled the SCVs off that third base, right? He would have saved a whole bunch more. So he's making this a whole lot messier than it ever needed to be. Uh, Akron really just benefiting from damage dealt early in the game as, again, we have young Yakov fighting with every possible thing he can find right now. He really is, and feeling confident, like, I mean, uh, he, he can A-move across the map at this point. He's got enough, hasn't he? He a absolutely does. Uh, he's in the main base. Young Yakov still trying to fight, still doing run-bys as well, but I think he's greeted by a little bit of an army here. Will still kill a, maybe a handful <laughs> of SUVs, but lost his main. Young Yakov's a warrior, dude. Two bases. A hundred supply down. Still fighting. A difficult game to cast because in my head it's, been, it's ended about five times. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. Bly, eat your heart out. You know, I know that woman is up for Bly. Young Yakov's like, yeah. Bly? <laughs> you think this is a bad GG timing? Wait till Bly shows up. Yeah, oh, this is... Uh... This is fab, man. This is fab. Akron's probably like, why won't you die? How much do you have? And then young Akron's like, I don't have anything. <laughs> why don't you kill me? The whole game. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, kill me already, oh. bro. Like, you know, I'm waiting for you to make the move. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I mean, honestly. And that all started off with a triple bunker bay or yeah. triple bunker block at the natural. I, I was going to say, man, like, in my eyes, I look at this and I'm like, you know what? We really should have just, like, Done is as Akron is just kill him sooner because I feel like this gave young Yakov confidence. He's like, Man, I was so dead and I had him sweat, you know. Like, the fact that he, he lost so many SCVs, the fact that I survived so long, I take that as a bit of a confidence boost for young Yakov. So, we'll see. It's all signing for game three, potential for a long game, of course, big map. But uh, Akron definitely has been playing the very aggressive side of things. So, I guess we will see now this goes in a couple moments we just get everyone into our lobby and i'll sign you will round us out on the penultimate series of the day here akron and young yakov now tied one to one akron just needs a moment though so we'll have a couple moments extra before we go going into the series it was one that i was kind of unsure about like 
Akron's obviously very, very aggro, uh, very in the face. And I think he's making the right call by doing that, because it does feel like once young Yakov gets online, then he seems pretty content, pretty solid about it. But Akron's been very good about destabilizing that. Just as good as young Yakov's been good about destabilizing Akron's mid to late game, just because he's just not allowed it to happen, whether he wanted to get there anyway, but he's not allowed it to happen with the way he's been playing. No, no, that's uh, that's very true. It's been, uh, it's honestly been a very good series. It's just, I mean, a bit scrappy. This last game, you know, maybe went on a bit longer, but uh, yeah, the first uh, the first game was very fun. And obviously, again, just Young Yakov feeling like he had a chance at moments and kind of doing some things made it very fun as well. So, playing Hawk. Players to be ready is Akron, who is still missing. He said one second, and he's been like 20. Unbelievable. Terran players. Un un ah, don't, don't bring my Terran bros into it. This is a. Uh... <laughs> I think he just didn't understand what one sec meant. Maybe he thought, ah, yeah. oh, that's, that's two minutes, right? No, no, no. Yeah, one sec, man. I mean, every second that passes right now, he's making it look worse for himself. Okay, he's here. Never mind. He's here. He's we'll here. stop complaining. Calm, calm down, Wardy, all right? Okay, calm I'm down. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <sighs> Getting ahead hey, of Wardy. myself. Wardy, how do you feel about tomorrow? Tomorrow? Yeah, you got tomorrow? another full day with me. I know. I know. I saw this. I was like, man, two days in a row of Ben. It's like great. What did you... When you when you first saw that, were you like, crap? <laughs> no, absolutely not. I love casting with you, Ben. I mean, oh, easy. Buddy. oh, Very you, easy. you, 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 know you Geordie flirt, you, Ugh. you Geordie flirt. If people, you know, if people, have you ever had anybody listen to you and be like, are you from Sunderland? Yes, all the time. It's insane. <laughs> really? Yes. No, it's absolutely incredible. Like, because they not even. I've had multiple people actually pinpoint which town I'm from. Not even, like, city. Like, which town I'm from. Like, where I was born. And I was like, how? And they're like, I can hear it in your voice. I'm like, my voice, my accent is so, like, mild. Like, how? It's crazy to me. Wait, and they, they get it right? Yeah. Yeah, like, these guys are like, Wait. oh, I know exactly where you're from. They DM me. And they're, I'm like, oh, my God, this is scary. Wait, are you from Sunderland? No, like, that's the thing. Like, if they just said Sunderland, I'd be like, fair enough. You guess, like, a big city near where I'm from, right? But they, they like, I'm in a, from a town, like, near there. Like, kind of between Sunderland oh. and Newcastle. And they can tell which town Aha. I'm from. Ah. Ah. I mean, I was just joking. I thought, like, no, maybe I'm going to... No, people okay, genuinely okay, I... guess this. It's insane. I, I didn't know how those folk get along up there, you know? Because oh, yeah. somebody said... Are you from Derby? I could tell by your... I'd be like, no, I'm not from bloody Derby. So I don't know how you guys had it up north. Well, I, I think, yeah, if you if you tell a Geordie that they're from Sunderland, then they probably respond like that, like, oh, I'm not from Sunderland. I'm not a, you know, I, I think they yeah. probably respond like that, but yeah. I'm so bad with accents. Like, Me too. I, there was a... <laughs> yeah, there was, like... <laughs> I, I heard a Geordie guy talking, and I was like, oh, where where, where are you from? Uh, or where in Liverpool are you from? And they were like, what? <laughs> and I was like, god damn it. <laughs> like, I'm so, I'm so bad. That is pretty bad. Uh, I, love that you, I love that you know you're bad, but then you still just go in and believe you know. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, you know, sometimes it's a good icebreaker, you know? You just yeah. kind of say something, and you're like, I'm probably going to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but then we, then we can talk about it. I mean, good strategy. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, sometimes I'll never forget asking Kevin who the green guy in Street Fighter is, man. <laughs> and he, and he, just, he was he was so confident. He was so confident that it's the Hulk. I'll never forget that, man. I've I've never heard such lunacy. Oh, he actually, oh, he actually got the extract. Managed to, yeah, I thought he was blocking that with the SCV. Bloody hell. Oh, yeah, that was an all-time clip. <laughs> the green guy from Street Fighter. <laughs> Mate, the sad thing is I can't find that clip anymore, and I've tried oh, so. I know we tried. We tried to find out Katowice, right? Yeah, we, we tried it's to impossible. Find it it's like um, it's definitely in the ESL like media thing on Twitter, but it's like they have so much. Like yeah. scrolling through is just impossible, you know. But. If anybody out there can find this clip of Kevin, <laughs> Kevin saying, 
the green guy in Street Fighter is the Hulk. Like, I will actually, yeah, pay you. Five dollars. <laughs> five quid. Yeah, five. 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 <laughs> Good deal. Because, yeah, that is, you know, that is tear-inducing. Like, I, I yeah. <laughs> well, uh, this DVZ has been pretty darn normal. We obviously saw a little bit of harass with the Reaper and SUV trying to block the hatchery and so on. But other than that... It really is standard triple CC as well. So Acheron is playing the macro setup. Hellion's coming out. Tech Lab coming up on the barracks now. Looks like the Starport's going to swap to that Tech Lab for Banshee time uh, or Raven time. So, uh, yeah, just, just everything's turned up normally. Nothing really funky on the Zerg side of things either. Really is uh, good old standard for the moment. And this is the most macro centric opening that Acheron's gone for. Yes. Like three, three CC into like Banshee, Hellion. This is. Great to see that barracks in a very unusual place. If you do want to play bio, because mm -hmm. no, nope. second starport, second starport. Yeah. I know my Terrans, Wardy. I know. I, I the moment you said it as well, I was like, oh, actually, I think Akron loves a bit of second starport action sometimes, and that's exactly where you build it. You've killed the Overlord. You're going to build it right in the back of the base, make it as difficult to scout as possible. I love it, man. I, I love it. You said it's the most macro opening he's done, and Young Yanko's probably thinking, oh, cool, finally I get to play the game, and then he's going to get hit by double starport action. I love it. I call this one the pig killer. The pig killer? <laughs> Why? Yeah, you know, you know oh, after, after not playing for a year, Kevin's like, you know what, you're playing Basilis <laughs> Big Brain Bouts, and I'm like, yeah, sure, man, give me someone easy, and they're like, how about pig? And then everybody was like, pig's going to own you. And then I dished out the pig killer. Double starport banshee. Get out of my game. Pig killer. But this is three starport. <laughs> this is the pig, right, this isn't pig the... killer. Hey, oh, God, I can't even say that. Pig killer squared. V2. Yeah, this is pig killer V2. Like, yeah. this is this is crazy. All right. Wait, what, what? Oh, okay, okay. There we go. I was That's like, why is that banshee. starport lifting up? Mass, mass I like banshee. it. You like it? Uh, yeah, I've been casting the whole day, Wardy. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's great when you've been casting the whole day. What could possibly go wrong? Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, seeing something where it's just like, what the hell is this? You know, um, this reminds me. Who was it in freaking Gamers 8 back then? Maru Solar, the, the <laughs> three starport. Uh, BC build on two base uh -huh. on like three gas. Oh, that was dreadful. But this this genuinely could work. Yeah, this could be uh, this could be decent as uh, especially if it comes in as a surprise, right? And you're just like kaboom, all the banshees, and then it's very difficult to ever clean them up. I mean, if you have enough banshees, they can shoot through clean spores, whatever they fancy. So we'll see what Akron does. A couple of them going to show up on the bottom side now and hit that hatchery. But of course, seeing two banshees right now isn't weird. It's when all the extra banshees start showing up that you know you're in for a good time. Absolutely, and young Yakov, he is just... Anything that he sees, he's going to fight it. Like, anything that he sees. He's like, Hellion's on the map, off creep, let's go. And he's actually getting a good trade out of this as well, to be fair to him. Will he keep... He's oh. going to keep that alive, isn't he? Yeah. I tell you what, though, using a lot of transfusions to keep that alive means uh, that these banshees can come in later for the queens. Yeah, I was exactly thinking that, right? Like... Transfusion on the hatch is all nice and cute, but when you're not able to save the queens, you're going to be regretting that in a big way, so... Yeah, but again, how's he meant to know? Right now, that is absolutely the correct play. And we get ready to join these Banshees up together, and they are going to pack a punch. And they're about to have Hyperfly Rose, so they can all join up more quickly, and all push more quickly as well. And... you know what? Young Yakov is a Ling Bane boy, and there's no Hydralis Den. There's, how, there's seven queens on the field, and there's soon going to be ten banshees on the field. Like, this is kind of an unfair fight, and he's not done any super overseer scouting or anything like that. So he actually is so damn unaware. Like, he, he, he probably thinks he's against just regular mech right now, which he will be, but... Uh, you know, I, I just want some cool music right now, like, dun 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 <laughs> where are all those queens? Yeah, well, he, I actually, he absolutely wants to find the Queens, right? As we are going to see Ling Bane surround the Hellions, the Banshees are going to stand and fight Ling Bane. There's the Queens. That's what he's looking for, and he is going to start shooting them down. He is able to more or less just shy of the one shot, so going to lose one Banshee. The Spore's not ready here, by the way, that one on the upper right, so we're going to get rid of one of the Spores, go straight after the second afterwards, and this Hatchery will then die, so this will fall in the end, and all the drones are going to start falling with it. 
Blink counterattack, being uh -oh. counterattack. There's not a lot to defend back at home, I guess, is the problem. Cyclone's aren't ready yet, Ben. Uh oh. <laughs> oh no! Oh, oh this, is, this is what I wanted, Wardy. This is what I wanted. I think Akron is absolutely going to come out ahead, but, but at what cost? At what cost, indeed? Because him not repairing that wall, him letting this happen, like, definitely brutal from him. He's actually massing Cyclone's behind this. Maybe he's yeah. super scared about. Muders at this point? I, I, well, he's right I don't to be. know. Yeah, he's super right to be. Has he even scouted that spy yet? I mean, this is wild. Yeah, the Hive actually cancelled from Young Yakov when he realised what this was. So I don't think he actually had any clue at all. He was just going Ling Bane, 2-2, two, two, Bane's, you know, Hive as well. He was absolutely just looking to play into, like, Ultras or so. Realised what this is, he cancelled everything. He cancelled 2-2, two, two, he cancelled uh -oh, the Hive. Uh -oh. oh, yeah, the Spire's going to be fired upon. Oh, if you lose the Spire, that's everything he's banking his money up for. This is going to be extremely close to finish, and it's going to finish up. He gets the 13 <laughs> Muters on the way. Starts the Hydrogen as the follow-up. The Muters are big because they're a way to chase these Banshees down, and that's exactly what you need right now. Yeah, I mean, Cyclones aren't exactly great against Muters either. Look at that fancy upgrade. Hurricane Engines coming online here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get that uh, Cyclone uh, play sped up as these Banshees actually are just not being killed, so they're having a very good time. Uh, the problem is the Spore goes one way, the Banshees can go the other, and they will finish off the last. So the main base has fallen just before the Muters come in to save the day. And, uh, okay, there's still a lot of Banshees. We really need these Cyclones to clean up these Muters. We really do. Like, I'm a tiny bit worried, because the new Cyclones, like, they have more health, but their damage is, like, significantly worse. This is, uh... This isn't as straightforward as you'd think, but he's a bit worried. I mean, there are six Cyclones popping out at a time, to be fair. Getting an Engineering Bay online. Banshees as well on the aggressive. Ah, oh, this is StarCraft, mate. This is StarCraft. Yes, it is. I mean, just going to go after this. Hatchet pulls the Muters back to give you even more setup time as well. More Missile Turrets start to build. Akron maintaining the supply lead at the moment as this continues through. Akron is not about making SFEs, though. He's up to 53, and he's like, you know what? Let's go. Let's roll. And again, he's, he's, it's not as if he hasn't got money to use or he wouldn't benefit from more SCVs. He's just, he's not about that life, Wardy. He's a make your life more difficult, Karen. <laughs> yeah. He does anything that's more difficult to actually handle. Is, uh, we're going to lose one Banshee there, but you know what? That's another hatch that's dead before the uh, muters show up, so... And we are just killing bases right now. We get the base. We try and run. The Muters are looking to intercept. They went the right way. The Muters get the grab. One Banshee, two Banshee. Going down immediately. We've got three guaranteed. Four, I think. And now we have to split the Banshees away. So many end up dropping. Wow. Full cleanup here from Young Yakov. And that is huge just to remove this pressure from the map. I think this is a, a common case of thrower on right now. Because, <laughs> I mean, dude, look how many Cyclones he's got. I'm actually... I haven't seen this number of Cyclones in the new patch yet when it comes to, like, going up against Zerg. So I I'm genuinely curious how this is going to go because he has just more than allowed young Yakov back into this game with all this play that he's done. And you know what? I actually think... I think young, I think young Yakov's in a good spot now. Yeah? Sort of, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of feeling it for him. What if these Cyclones just go across the map? You think he can survive? You think he's okay? Well, you know, he, he might be okay. I mean, that's there's a so lot of links in this. Yeah. And there's... I mean, they're, remember, they're not as good at switching targets now. And remember, they don't have upgrades at all. These Damn. Cyclones... They suck. <laughs> they suck, man. They do really suck. And the Muters aren't oh, even no. in this fight. Ba Bailings looking for connections. It's <laughs> so many Cyclones. Yeah, more Cyclones show up. But honestly, the, the first group of Cyclones I thought were going to do okay, but... Yeah, just not able to do as much nowadays. The Muters come back in towards the natural. Young Yakov is getting control of this game as Zerg is taking the handle and he's steering it in the right direction. So, off and away we go as a couple of SCVs continue to mind about the Banshee Cyclones continue to the bottom. Again, Hydra's Lings and Bane's all coming up. And we just see Cyclones locking on again and that Spore Crawler in trouble. I wonder what that Fusion Core was for. Like, it's kind of halfway in production now, like he hasn't got an SV on it, mm -hmm. but I wonder what it was for. Yeah, well, we might never find out, as I don't know if we're actually going to ever see Young Yakov survive through this, Ben, because that's a lot of Cyclones. I thought they sucked on the other it's side, a lot but of the, cyclones. the sheer number is insane, right? He's up 30 army supply, so there's chances of not oh. if you lose a few of them like that, though. That's not pretty. Okay. you got to have faith in how bad they are, Wardy. Have faith, have faith. Have faith They're super bad. 
Yeah, so bad, man. Look at this. <laughs> I don't have They're targeting Overlord. And now the links come. Let's go, yeah. let's go. Well, the supplies are getting closer. Young Yakov is just streaming units. And I think the problem is Akron just can't reinforce this either, right? So that becomes a constant problem. And the less Cyclones there are, the better the Lynx surrounds are on them. So that obviously Mate, is a big deal too. This game's so close. I, I think Akron's actually going to do it, you know? No, I, I don't think I don't think he's got enough reinforcements anymore. You don't Surely think Akron's going to do it? I don't know. I, I, I actually, <laughs> like, I, I kind of started to feel as though he couldn't reinforce enough, but... It gets knocked down to two bases only for Young Yakov. He doesn't have a main. Maybe he does it. Or maybe I actually Young Yak. Uh, maybe I, I. I actually don't know. I'm genuinely confused. I think Akron wins this for sure. Now look at the supplies. Yeah. I mean, that is a big, big, big deal. And yeah. I mean, yeah, no, you're right. I kind of, I just sort wasn't... of felt like he was gonna start cleaning up the cyclones, but then we go back home. There's so many more cyclones again. Yeah. Madness. Yeah. It's been scrappy. Like, both these guys have been so committed to the aggression that the defensive part just not quite been all, you know, joined up nicely, but made for one hell of a scrappy series. Yeah, a great series. I mean, being super fun, scrappy, these two were very well matched for each other. That's the beauty against some of these 1 1 matchups, right? Like, you know, the players are just very much so meant to be playing against one another at a competitive level, and then these styles just match up great. Sometimes, you know, at the, the lower end of the pro scene, you have the, the pros who play, and they play like, they both play like very honest macro, and they end up in very long games because they struggle to like close out. Whereas these guys end up in long games because they throw everything possible at one another, kill off half the other guy's stuff, can't quite end the game. You know, it's, it's such a grueling affair. It's been extremely fun to watch. I love this series. I think this might be my yeah, favorite series all day. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, they've, they've definitely... And I wonder if they played, like, a longer best of seven or something, whether it would all be as like ridiculous, this? you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think it question. would be. Not a bad assumption. As uh, Banshee's going to try and take down another hatchery. The Hydra's trying to show up to be the response. Obviously, once the Muta's got dealt with, the Spire died earlier, so no more of those. I uh. tell you. And... Both of them have been very unwilling to quit either. Like, absolutely, if you get knocked down, doesn't matter. You've got like eight more lives left in the tank, you know? Yeah. Then, yeah but I, I do think that blue flame is uh, you know, I absolutely going to be brutal. I was going to say this before when it was like getting to the point where it was like Ling Hai, I was like, man, Hellions would be really good if you could just add some Hellions on. But then without blue flame, it's a bit questionable. And obviously, it was very much so in the go right there. Now it's. Uh... All will go again as you get uh, Acheron gathered up. And uh, he's going to have time to get Blue Flame, and then he's going to be even better off as we try to go lurk as a young Yakov. That is... I mean... <laughs> oh, this is great. Uh, like, okay, okay. So more SVs being made now, because he technically is behind in drones right now. I mean, he does have orbitals, obviously, but it's just three. Is he floating over his... Me no, no, he did make a fourth as well. So that's nice to get the planetary going. Still a lot of Banshees to worry about. Yeah. Banshees coming through. Extractor taking some damage. He's going to go down. The Hydra's still chilling on the upper left. And again, you got that uh, Banshee cloaking Oy. coming through and knocking down multiple Hydras. Well, that's nice until the Hydras fight back. I just clicked on one of these Banshees. I had 25 kills on it. <laughs> Amazing. That's actually fairly wild. Yeah, that's crazy. But Akron isn't being aggressive with the ground arm. Like, he ha there's still 37 Cyclones on the map here, Wardy. I think he's kind of... I'm, I'm not sure. Do you think he should have stopped building Cyclones at some point? Oh, uh, 100%. But I'm... I'm... I guess the point I was going to be trying to make was uh, I think he should have tried to finish him with him. Yeah, I, I don't know why we stopped. To be honest, I feel like we had enough clearly to keep going. And now he's going to send it, but I feel like this is not necessarily the worst time. But I mean, the lurker den is available, right? So we get some lurkers up. We play some lurkers. I mean, might be a challenge, question mark. You don't really usually see 40 cyclones running into lurkers, so... Mm. Like, does he have? Yeah, yeah. I swear he was making some tanks at some point, but 
those lurkers are actually going to be problematic. Like, a minute ago, we were looking at 150 supply Acheron against 100 supply Young Yakov. It's now not even remotely as bad, and Acheron again in this game uh, kind of forgot he could make SCVs. So he's at 44 SCVs with almost 200 supply. So his army's massive. And I mean, he is getting into a really good position here between the bases. Is there lurkers down in that south one? No, so that base is kind of forfeit by Young Yakov. Yeah, Cyclone's going to clean up over here. These lurkers. Oh, hold, position, hold, hold position. position. Oh, my God. Oh, How he's waiting so be? long. Oh. <laughs> oh, that was actually disgusting, man. The army supplies actually get pretty close together off the back of that. Don't get me wrong. It's probably still fine for Akron, but <laughs> that was actually an opportunity. Holy goodness. Oh, my God. He did that. Yeah, that was amazing. Wow. That was, oh, that was great, wild. <laughs> that's a great series, Wardy. It's a yeah. great series. Even even when the game is over, we have an amazing moment at the end. As Akro should surely just kill off now. There's only two lurkers left. He pushes on in. Young Yakov has nothing left to say, do, or anything else. GG's. And Akron is going to take the 2-1 victory. Oof. <laughs> that was awesome. That was, that was actually a wild series between these two. And I mean... It was super damn scrappy all the way, but uh, they both delivered a, a proper series here. And Akron was crazy, man. Akron really was crazy. And with that, he is going to go and put himself into a very good position, of course, because now he'll have a couple of chances to play into the playoffs. So good luck to him when he goes into Swiss round four later this week. And to Yakov, of course, who is now going to be fighting for his tournament life next time you guys see him. So good luck to those guys on that. We are left with one matchup remaining today, which is going to be between... This uh, Belai Kung Fu Banda series. So we're going to get that on the go. We'll go into this in just a second. It's CVP to round out the day up next. Thank you. 
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. One final matchup here today. It's been a good one. It's been a long one. Um, but we've had, we've had a lot of fun as we get into Gunk Fu Banda versus Bly. We get this set to go into the ZVP and uh, we get this ready to roll out. So, StarCraft resumes here. One final match. I genuinely don't know what to expect from this series, Demu. I have no idea. Me neither, man. I mean, it's Bly, right? <laughs> you can get a proxy hatch, and we absolutely probably will get a proxy hatch, but like, as far as players go, where, where they lie on like the normal scale, Gung Fu, more often than not, you can say like very safe, solid, normal Protoss, and Bly, absolutely not your normal safe or solid Zerg, is he? So this is going to be quite fun, the contrast of styles, but Gung Fu has been around the block, as has Bly, to be fair. I mean, these guys have been around for a long, long time. They're both, I don't know if they're both full time at the moment. I think they're both doing other things, but I think this should deliver a pretty spicy one for the end of the day. Yep, no, I, I think it should be fun. Like, Bly kind of came back a while back and started playing. Like, he always seemed to play for the regionals, but he seemed to play in a couple of extra things, like, recently. So it's been kind of fun to see that. And uh, I feel like so that kind of makes him kind of better than he has been in the previous regionals now because he kind of played some extra stuff beyond just these regionals for once. Um, and then Gung Fu, you always know he shows up and can look good as well. As we get ready to hop on into Gung Fu versus Bly. Game number one of this PVZ, it is going to be our final matchup of the day. And obviously, we expect Bly to be crazy. We expect Bly to be cheeky. It's just like sometimes Bly does that and then he can turn the game very long as well. So. I really don't know what to expect. We're starting on our side. There's a gold base possibility too. The opportunities really are wild right now. So let's see what we have in store for Bly Gung Fu Banda in just a moment. Bly is one of those guys that some players figure him out. And you, you kind of almost expected every player to have figured him out by now. But, you know, he's he can still make it work. He can still make it happen. Um... But he does have tricks and tells that give away certain game plans for him, which some players in the past have been so good about. Like, I remember Marine Lord at some point, like, there was banter between them. And Marine Lord was like, I, you know, I can beat you anytime I want, kind of thing, because I, I know what you're going to do. And Bly was like, no, no, I'll beat you. Then they had a best of 31, where they had to play, like, all 31 maps. Do you know what the score was? Yeah, 28 to 3. Yeah, exactly, 28 to 3. So, like... There's some players that have had such good reads on him. I was surprised. I'm surprised you knew that, actually, Wardy. Um, one of the worst. Thing? One of the worst casting days I've ever done. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. The first map, will win. We played Whirlwind map one. First game, kind of cool. 15 minutes. There was ultras and stuff. It's pretty back and forth. 
It was then 30 games of Marine Lord doing the exact same build and killing Bly at either five minutes or dying to Anidas at three minutes. Like, it was no. so bad. It was the worst series. Ever. Like, and obviously, like, for the first few games, like, oh, you know, this is still fun. But, like, 25 games in and Marine Lord, oh my god, guys, he's doing the same build. And, whoa, Bly didn't have units out and he died to the Marines. Whoa, like, it was bad, man. <laughs> oh, I. You know, I am so happy that you cast that because, yeah, I remember tuning in for a couple of games and there was like weird maps as well, like a beach with umbrellas on and stuff. Yeah. And I was like, what the hell is this? But it didn't and... matter. That's the thing. The maps were meant to make it fun and cool, but it didn't matter because Bly and, and, and Marine Lord just died and killed each other at the same point every time. So it didn't even make any difference. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, okay. So, I mean, Gung Fu's going to know that there is a gold base up. Right, right, right. I mean, I, did he spot this? I mean, okay, he's, he's coming over here just to make sure that that natural's never going up in this situation. But there's definitely some things where Bly will be like, you know what? At this point in the game against Protoss, I'm going mass muta, and it will just make a big swish. And time and time again, it catches people off guard, man. It's it's so funny to see. But this kind of situation, I mean, there's a reason why Zergs don't often go for this base as their first one, but. I wonder if Gung Fu's going to know exactly how to play against it. Um, he is a very, very decent Protoss, but... Oh, man, I'm so happy you got to cast that series, man. <laughs> yeah, that, that, make, that... <laughs> that makes your day. <laughs> yeah, was... that actually, you know... <clears throat> it was an O-Gaming uh, show match, so, like, they put it on, and that's why it was, like, Marine Lord. Um, there was mm. one other one that was also, like... Because 30... the worst thing was, it wasn't just best of 31, it was 31 maps, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, like, yeah... Yeah, I was that was crazy. We there was another one as well that wasn't quite as painful as this one. I think it was like Clemvis somebody, but man, I will never forget the Marine Lord Bly one. Yeah, that that <laughs> I, I just remember because Marine Lord, like you know, former really good stacker of two player, he was one of the like best foreign Terrans for quite some time. Just it, it wasn't a fair match, you know. It just wasn't. So the yeah. fact that it happened in the first place was like, absolutely <laughs> brutal. That is a wall, but. <laughs> Oh, that's fabulous. I oh. love I love long StarCraft days. Yeah, it gets to a certain point, you just like, you know, <laughs> everything just becomes a little bit more funny, right? Like a little bit more amusing. Yeah. Than it was in the first place. As, uh, these lings are getting way more probes than I feel like they ever should have done. Like one, sure. Second one, what? Um, and, and Bly also kind of didn't drone for a bit. Now he has droned. He's taken his third base. Obviously, he went to the gold initially as well. And uh, yeah, we got an Oracle on the way up. My Gung Fu. So he's he's playing pretty standard. Bly is obviously with Wait, the gold. Do you think? Funky. Do you think Gung Fu realized that that's not a wall yet? Because it doesn't look like it. Oh oh oh! I don't think no. he realizes. Is it not a wall on the left? I've had this before. No, no, it's not a wall. I don't if trust that uh, anymore. <laughs> if if you connect those two kind of buildings at a corner like that, it's definitely not a wall. Like I, I think. He didn't see what happened. I think that could absolutely bite him in the butt. That that's a rotty wall. That is. I actually had casted a game like this recently, where it was pretty much this exact wall off, and I was like, I, I had the same thing where I was like, it's not a wall, and then the lings never ran through it, so I was like, it is a wall, and then I was like, but I'm really not ah. sure it's a wall. He knows it was not a wall. Uh, yeah, I cast. Yeah, th he... This is why I'm so unsure because I've literally had this happen to me. I think like two months ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I saw a, a Reddit post the other day where it was like, uh, how is this not a wall? And given that, you know, I, I played yeah. Terran a lot in my life, I saw this and it was so obviously <laughs> not a wall. <laughs> he was using like a command center and like the corners were all like not touching a wall and stuff. He's like, how? And I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, get get me out of here. Oh, Oracles are going to activate and that. They're going to get themselves some queens here. We are running with these queens, but we're going to commit through the Spore Crawl to get at least one queen. Now a second one as well. We do lose an Oracle. I mean, we got a we got a queen, but a queen extra than we would have done anyways. And now we're going for the Resonating Glaives follow-up. It was really like Bly's very susceptible to this. But is this just like a handful of Roaches just to scare off his opponent so he can defend with it, or...? I don't really know. Because, I mean, he, he's, he saw those roaches pop, and then he's like, then I'm going to go for the Resonating Glaive. So, oh, I tell you what, Gung Fu is very much... I think he'd be a gracious host, you know? Like, yeah. come, come in my house. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, he definitely doesn't love and people now, out. No, definitely doesn't. Like, uh, yeah, this is already, this is beautiful. 
Beautiful. These two links even allowed Olivia to left alive. Well. Ha. <sighs> Well, that was that, Wardy, and we got more roaches on the go, more adepts on the go as well. I kind of like this setup for Bly, honestly. I mean, roaches in theory should always be good against adepts, right? Like, that should be what you want. We saw roaches just straight up kill an adept player after the adept attack earlier, so definitely don't doubt the uh, the choice here from Bly and what he's set up for. I think it should, in theory, be good. I'm just worried that Bly's always been down on drones, like he's always the one playing catch-up on the workers. So even if Gungu mm. doesn't do like a load with these devs, even if he just gets a bit of harassment done, I can see this still going very well for him. He's already getting his immortal count going, so you will have something of an answer to a roach follow-up. And he's killed even more drones with these oracles as well. Here are the adepts in the main base, and yeah, they're just gonna run from those roaches and go for as many drones as possible. I love StarCraft, man. Like this these last two series are absolutely what I wanted. You know, just crazy. And uh, you know, this is obviously isn't over by any means, but Everywhere I look, it's just damage is happening. I see an oracle shooting at extractors and stuff, and it's just it's just gorgeous. Okay, now speed roaches are done. Now this should not be able to get too much more. All things said and done, but you're, you're right. Bly is very used to playing behind on drones, and he's got to that point in the game where I think he's just going to start sending it. You know, like the the famous Bly creep highway is on the go. It yep. doesn't spread out like a like a. Oh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> ah, I love it. <laughs> Young Fu's just like, huh, I'm about to die. G. <laughs> G. Give him the G. 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 I That's actually do think he was dead, though, to be fair. Like, he had he had one immortal and one disruptor building. I think he dies unless the disruptor hits, like, a godly shot. He was definitely not living, Wardy. He was definitely not living. Yeah. It seems like such a like, weird time to get tap out, but I get it. I mean, I'm a, I believe. I, I believe too, I believe too. It was kind of fun. I, I still question that choice of the Adepts when he saw all those Roaches pop, because he kind of made the choice after the fact, and I know you gear up to it, but still very interesting. Yeah, I was uh, trying to rejoin the chat channel and wait for our invite into this next game as we get ready for game two. So Bly takes one off of Gung Fu Banda, and what if Bly makes playoffs? That'd be sick. <laughs> It'll be really sick for him, honestly, because uh, I mean... It's not something I expected at all. And the fact that he's like 1-1 one, one in this group, I'm just going to check who he played exactly, just to clarify. So Bly beat Akron 2-1, and then lost back 0-2. So, I mean, no shame in losing to Max Max, obviously. I'm just waiting on my invite right now for this. I guess you are too. Um, so if he beats Gung Fu, I mean, two very respectable players that you go up against and beat, you know? No, I mean, honestly, pretty pretty respectable uh, victories for sure, so definitely a uh, an interesting storyline. I mean, you, you mentioned, like, you get Bly, meet people who figure out Bly, but I feel like when you haven't played against Bly enough for a long time, you're like, you kind of forget how to play against Bly, you know? You forget all the things he can do, and it's, uh, like I said, that last game kind of feels like Bly was always behind on the drones and everything, and then it's like, oh, but I'm about to come and kill you, so thumbs up, let's go. <laughs> yeah, like, <clears throat> I mean... <laughs> Bly, Bly has a magic power, man, and I, I swear, his, his magic power is kind of like opposite memento, where he's not the one forgetting everything about himself, it's everybody else forgetting everything about him, you know? And it's just like, how do I play a normal game against this guy? And it's like, people just kind of throw it out the window, but yeah, I, I definitely think the way that Gung Fu played that game was very interesting. Need two minutes? Gung Fu, mate. Gung Fu. Gung Fu, bandit. Who does he think he is? What is uh, like, does he, he's like, crap, maybe I need to get my notebook out on Bly, you know, from 2012, find out how to do it all over again kind of thing. Actually, is there any result that surprised you a lot today or no? Result that surprised me today? Mm. I think it's been fairly straightforward, hasn't it? Probably Mana Beat and Battle Bee was the most surprising to me because I was kind of on the Battle Bee hype train. Uh -huh. But I mean, honestly, like, I wouldn't like, like, I think I said it at the time, I was like, I would have always picked Mana as the favorite, but I'm like this week or this last week, Battle Bee's really convinced me he's playing great. Um, that was not the case today. So that's maybe the most surprising. I kind of expected Shadon to beat Wayne, similar thing, just how they've been playing recently. So. Yeah, I think all of that Asia matches are pretty standard too. Oh, it's been a very mm. kind of like, like I could have read the results today and be like, 
yeah, cool. Like, I, today was a normal day of StarCraft. Some of the games weren't quite normal, but the results definitely have been. No, absolutely. I, I was thinking the same. It's also when you see some of the games that have happened, not necessarily everything is lined up how you'd expect it to happen, right? Like Young Yakov in a Acheron, but it was yeah. what you wanted. All right, and, and to Kung be fair, is back. To be fair, that series as well. Like I wouldn't have picked a favorite between Yakron and Young Yakov, so that was probably my in my head the one series I would have struggled to predict. Um, mm -hmm. So that was my probably the biggest fifty fifty in my eyes, and I mean it was everything I wanted it to be. So we take those. <laughs> I mean, it's not every day you see 40 Cyclones on the field, and then they're it's combined not. with, like, 10 Banshees as well. Like, that was the uh, most random Sky mech army I've seen in a long time, but got the win, got the win. And also, we got to see that Lurker Bomb happen. <laughs> that is very true, yeah. We had the, that the Lurkers gorgeous. making a moment. All right, well... It is still our last series of the day, and looking to make it our last map of the day is the Blue Zerg in the top left, leading by one... It is Bly. Absolutely is. And spawning over in the top right, as our red Protoss, it is Gung Fu Banda. Do you have any idea if that is what Kung Fu Panda is called in German? No, I've got no idea. I've got no idea either. Surely not. It's a, it's, it's a funny one. I mean, we've had worse nicknames in StarCraft 2. Have we? You know? Yeah, somebody called themselves freaking Ratata. We've, we've, we've been through <laughs> this today, Wardy. Ratata, of course. I see, I see. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, Gung Fu could have... You know, we've been to Pidgey as well. Like, there, there could be worse. The thing is, Gung Fu would be a pretty cool name. But then you're like, Gung, Gung Fu, Fu yeah, Banta. So. The, the thing is, as well, yeah. it's like, I hate typing it out because it has so many capitals in. And I hate not typing it properly. But then I hate having to type it properly because I have to like just capital G at the end of Gung and then the rest of it's just normal. I hate it. Like this is a pet peeve of mine when I'm doing tournaments. Yeah, I'm almost a bit sad that he doesn't have like numbers on either side or something like that. You know, like <laughs> seven Fu seven Banda, Gung Fu Panda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a little bit sad. Uh, who else? Who... Hero Marine and Marine Lord also have like funny ones to type. You know, because there's capital letters here, there, wow. and everywhere. Yeah, I gave up on Hero Marines, but I, I put it on like I just do the capital H and M now. I think he does as well. To be fair, it used I just to be do Gabe. Capital... Do Gabe. Yeah, make it make it short, sweet, simple. Big. What what is it with putting random capital letters in the names though? Like I never got this. I have a capital M in mine, but it's just yeah, because it looks that's cooler. the second. That's like a second like that's like part of the thing, right? Like to me, that made sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That made sense, Wardy. That this, one makes sense. This is interesting. These guys that put capital letters in the middle of a word, like <laughs> yeah, the, I don't get those it. guys like they. Uh, how do yeah, these guys, how do these guys get far yeah. enough in the world to play StarCraft? You know, like <laughs> they put uh, capitals in the middle of their names. They end up being great StarCraft yeah, players. Yeah. Doesn't add up. It's like you know, I've got a very good friend. You know, he has a capital at the front, capital at the last. Then he just puts an 08 at the end as well. Protoss <laughs> brain, Wardy. Protoss brain. What can I say? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, you're right, Steve. So Fairly, you see, you like, see Roddy in the chat, and you're just like, I want to wind this man up right now. Can't hold back. Took you it's, one minute. It's, it's it's too hard not to, you know? Like, he knows that I've already talked about a good old rotty wall coming in handy that a few links ran through, and then, you know, the Blanka story, or rather the Hulk story. The Hulk obvious story. Street Fighter character. Mm. <clears throat> well. All right, Wardy, back to the game, all right? You've been off game. topic for a while not, now. Not much has happened, to be fair, right? This is for a Bly game. Pretty much just as standard as you're ever going to get, so, yeah. Or there, as there's your update. unstandard for a Bly game. Unstandard? I mean... Well, yeah, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, I... So, one thing I've always loved about Bly, by the way, is the one... The single creep tumor highway that yeah. he has. I, I, I love it, man. Like, if, if you tell me which Zerg is playing, you can very often tell, kind of, Ooh. about how they spread creep. That's a nice little surround on the Adept. Yeah, he's going to get a kill. That's really nice. Obviously knocking numbers down already. I mean, he is still droning. A couple more lings on the way out. It just takes the numbers away a little bit for Gung Fu as well. This Oracle gets in. 
Queens from the main base not quite going to get the angle to catch this Oracle. There's nothing on the natural. Well, there's about to be one drone. I think the Oracle deactivated the Lings. Trying to get in here again. They do push the pro back. I wanted to build the third Nexus, so... Just trying to be annoying. Look at Gunk. He's like so paranoid. He puts a pylon down in the wall while he moves out here. Oh, well. well. <laughs> and to be fair, as much as much uh, grief as I give Bly about certain things, he always micros his units as much as he possibly can, you know? Like, I, I remember when I would play him, he'd be like, um, he'd be micro in a single ling to maybe get an extra hit on an SCV here and there, which, you know, would, would have no effect, but I'd be like, goddamn try hard, like, what, what's he playing out here? It would, it would irritate me, you know? But here he's got, he's, he's got quite a lot of lings, getting little bits of damage done here and there, just being a proper annoying guy and deflecting these oracles. I mean, the oracles are dealing a good bit of damage, but early Roach Warren as well from him. This is awesome. As uh, Oracle runs into the Spore Queen combo, so that one does not uh, face so well. Lair coming up, Roach is already producing, and do you think Bly ever builds another drone here, or do you think he's going to do something aggressive with this Lair Roach combo? Are you asking me whether I want to bet on Bly building it? I think Bly's going to build another drone, yeah. You do? Okay. You want to bet a sub? A sub? That, that does not seem like a fair bet. Is that. To, to ever build another drone in the rest of this game? I mean, it's Bly. It's a pretty good bet. I'm, I'm almost willing to take the other side. You're almost, almost willing to take the other side. I'm not. I'm not. I, uh, may, I mean, at this point, it's kind of looking likely. At no? this point, I should have took the sub. Yeah, but, you know, I'll, I'll let you off on this uh, one. Now, and now I'm, now I'm not willing to do it. Now it's too <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> well, I was just so shocked that you were into it in the first place, to be honest. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell you what, though. He's, he's really gunning for it here, isn't he? Like, if he can tap out Gunfu in a swift 2-0... That is amazing. Yeah, this is terrible, though. He's going to lose one Ravage. He's going to lose a second. The Queens are in the wrong place. The, the units Oi. did not come with it. And now we're going to see Corrosive Files coming down. Oh, the Corrosive Files just land on the Stalkers, though. Batteries are not really uh, doing their thing right now, either. So this kind of has been working, but I just don't think it's got enough strength to keep going. We need energy oh my for God. Super Gun Battery. Yeah, Gung Fu macro too hard. The absolute Achilles heel of Protoss players out there. They normally don't macro so hard, so they have the energy for the battery overcharge. Hey, he made more drones. Yeah, he made more drones as well, but because this got absolutely smacked down. This is why it wasn't a good bet for me, though. Because, like, if you make another drone at the rest of the game, there's so many scenarios where he does. It goes well yeah, enough, I mean, and then he adds a couple. Okay, now I see why you wanted yeah, to bet, mate. <laughs> like he, he runs into five, six shield batteries at the third, yeah. you know, just... I guess that makes sense. Okay. Standard. Standard stuff. Standard stuff. Four oracles out in the field, by the way. I know they're all, like, a bit battered and bruised here, but this game, 64 probes as well. Like, Gung Fu has weathered the storm so far, and yeah, amazing, amazing. This is kind of, um... Yeah, <laughs> this is kind of just uh, over, no? I mean, this is such a good position for Gung Fu. He's up 16 workers, he's up army. He's got himself plus two in charge on the way. This should be over. This is one of the games that Bly drags out for the next 20 minutes. So, right, like, he's just like, I refuse to die. Well, he's definitely not going to do the Gung Fu. The Gung Fu? Where it's like he, the, he sees an army. Maybe, maybe coming across the map and he types G and just leaves. That's not Bly. Oh, no, that's not Bly at all. No, 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 not at all. I mean, he's getting Burrow. That's Bly. You want him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is Bly. But what, what's he getting it for? Like, Are you, getting, are you not just getting infestation pit? Oh, yeah. Swarm House. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I don't think Swarm House and Burrow really go hand in hand, but sure. <laughs> of, of course. Naturally. You know, mate, this is the good old. You pull everything across the map, doesn't work out. The Burrow into Swarm House. So tell me, Ben, what's he going to Burrow? What, uh, I think the Swarm House, you know. He's gonna Actually, be like, to be ah, fair, I think he is the only guy that still burrows Swarm House. I think he, he does it sometimes. He just leaves a couple somewhere burrowed. Yeah, I mean, this map, to be fair, you go over to that north spot on the map and you launch them into the natural. That's a great, great launching ground for him, depending on what he really chooses to do. Yeah, honestly, like, I don't hate the choice. Like, I feel like this is going to give Bly an opportunity at the very least. He was already on a low drone count. That plays into how Swarmhose usually plays. So 
Yeah, the only problem is they are going to be seen by that Oracle and the Stalkers. Going to play oh. in position. No! Oh, it was the noble sacrifice, the Stalker. Mate, that was a great play by Gung Fu. I don't think it was intentional, but all right, we're freezing. Oh, we are frozen up again. Gung Fu. Oh, oh my God. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Game ah, he's back. He's back. Is this, this where we regain game for the one Stalker? Uh, actually, I think it was truly unintentional by Gung Fu. Oh, but yeah. It obviously it worked out amazingly. Yeah, it, I, I feel like he comes out of this. He's like, man, that sucks. He's like, actually, I'm okay with this. Oh, he's going to keep lagging. That works, too. <laughs> that works, too. That works, too. He does I have mean, a lot of money flowing, but he could just be about to warp in, so. He could also be just about to disconnect. Like, you, you don't know what that money means right now. Yeah. Oh, he's back again. He's back. He's back. He's back. He's back. He's back. Lovely. Wardy, if you could have a different nickname going from this point forward, what would you have for yourself? It has to be cool, by the way. It has to be cool? Yeah, not Pidgey. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> well, there it goes. <laughs> My choice is gone. Were you kidding? No, you weren't. <laughs> oh, I was thinking about what you were memeing on later, earlier, and then you... <laughs> I actually have no idea. Are you... You know what? Bly's creep spread this game is actually looking really good. It's everywhere, but it is a small map. Yeah. All right, way to take it away from him. Well, I mean, just you know, put it in perspective, you know? <laughs> You've got to be real about these things. You do, you do. The supply is a little bit deceiving, just because it's a lot of swarm hosts. Like, you know, they've, they've got kind of one job, right? Launch some locusts at some base and hope for the best. And I mean... Again, it is a nice map for it. Those rocks have been opened up, which will allow Gung Fu to march on down there and chase them down. But he's he's burrowing them. He's burrowing the swamp. Yeah, no, this is what he does. He just burrows them, hides them somewhere, leaves them. That's a very blithe thing to do. The locust landed in the natural, by the way. Units on the right hand side as well. You only lose three probes here, so that's not too bad. The road traveler comes through, gonna knock at the rocks, just trying to open up some space. But we've also got zealots hitting the fourth base of Bly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is this is this is also a blast from the past game, and we've had a few of those today, Wardy. Where it's just like, you know, this style for a while was all the rage, right? Like Swarm Hose, Roach Ravager. You know, you get about sixty odd drones, and you're just happy as Larry all over the shop. Those Swarm Hose are very much left alone over there is there any observers in the mix there's one obs in the mix right now where is that it's in the middle of the map just clearing up creep lots of stasis going down as well yep well gung fu gets to kind of come through the center bly but keep launching these locusts off and he is just going to send them towards the natural again just trying to put you know gung fu on a little bit of pressure the problem is those locusts are never joining in the fight so the army supply is never like that amazing there's a stasis wall there that could catch as well force field Stopping the slow banes. Somehow these slow banes are still finding their way towards that army. Rose of Biles! Oh. oh my god, they just hit the Colossus! The locusts expired. Did the Colossi die? No, they survived. No, no, one no. of them very nearly died. Now he does lose one. Oh my god. Zealot's on the fourth base as well on the left side. This feels like it might be a little bit of a slow death for Bly, unless Gung Fu just giga punches on in. But, okay, he giga punches on in. He just <laughs> blinked on top of all those <laughs> ravages. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> the slowest <laughs> death of all time. <laughs> Unless the Giga Punch. <laughs> yeah, you had yourself I, covered there, mate. <laughs> I, I did have myself covered, and I'm so glad you did the Giga Punch, man. Like, it's exactly what I wanted to see. By the way, those stasis. I think those roaches in the middle of the map have been stuck in time for all time over there. Oh, Giga Punch again. GG. GG. Uh, oh, you could not have said that at a better time. <laughs> <laughs> Unless he giga punches him, giga punch. <laughs> it was freaking. It, it was awesome. Oh, Wardy, we're officially down to just one game left today. One game I'm, left today. I'm still thinking what my nickname would be if it wasn't Wardy, but like, I've never had to think of a nickname because I just called myself Wardy. You know, like. <laughs> oh my goodness. It was my own. It was already my nickname. So. So, so you've never been put in this position before no not really i think you might be a pidgey i might be a pidgey <laughs> or a caterpie there was there was a time where uh we actually 
we had like a list of who was what Pokemon or who looked like what Pokemon in like the StarCraft scene. Uh, really? Yeah, it, this was a thing. Like, uh, Euthermal was a bell sprout. <laughs> <laughs> and he, do, can you guess who Pidgey was? Pidgey. I think Marine Lord looks a bit like a Pidgey, <laughs> but he's probably a Rattata. <laughs> no, Pidgey was risky. And <laughs> 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 and when you when you actually stop to look at Risky, you really think you like you're like, man, that guy is it's, such a pinchy. It's 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 all in the eyes, isn't it? Like, yeah. It really is. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Risky was the pinchy. That was funny. <laughs> I think. Um, okay, okay, I got one. If was there one for Rotty or no? no? I don't think so. I think Rotty. What would you say Roddy would be before I go? I have no you idea. Have I, I wasn't good at this. Like I wasn't the one that made the, you the have connection. To, yeah, I, you have to say something. If everybody was a Pokemon. Yeah, one of the original ones, though. Not one of these, like, I don't know, Diamond Blastoise 69 kind of <laughs> things. Like, uh, one that I might know. Maybe he's like a... Uh, what about like a Rhydon? I don't know. <laughs> I've got no clue. Uh, that's, that's, that's a, I was thinking more a Drowsy. A Drowsy. <laughs> A drowsy. Yeah, I thought oh. I thought Snorlax. Snorlax was too obvious. A drowsy. But, but drow drowsy, that's a sleeper pick. That's a fucking good one. Oh, part of my French. <laughs> oh, got to the last game of the day, and I was just throwing everything out there. Is in the bottom right. It is going to be how red for this player. It is Gung Fu Panda. I've lost. Absolutely my is. Found him. <laughs> Control one, baby. You taught me that. And spawning over in the top line, top left hand side as our blue zerg, it is Bly. Bly. <clears throat> I was trying to think of a Pokemon with very piercing eyes, because that would be Bly. Piercing eyes. Mm. Yeah. See, I'm terrible at making the connections. I just, I just find it funny when someone else did it. I think you might be Machamp. Match out? No way. I was uh, apparently I was Foratrust. Do you know Foratrust? No. You're gonna have to Google it. It's spelled like F O R R E, Trust. It's uh. I'd be like uh, execute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see it. <laughs> Believable. <laughs> oh, 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 oh yeah, Gia dude. Gia like, dude. Just <laughs> oh just my goodness! Head. Oh my goodness! Uh, drone right, on the, where, uh, where do we go? From, where do we go from side. here? Well, drones on the pro side of the map, but uh, Gung Fu just pylon blocked the hatch block. <laughs> That's pretty good giga brain, to yeah. be fair. I love it. I love it. That's actually super giga brain. I, I love that out of Gung Fu. Uh oh. Duh, duh. Duh, yeah. duh. He needs to kind of stay here now, though. This is. Yeah, this is. The drone? I mean. It's getting to a point where he could afford a hatch if he wasn't there, but, you know, too good, too good. Too good. All right, Nexus goes down. Hatchery at home from Bly. Game number three, starting off fairly in a standard manner for the moment. Let's just have our drone. Apart from the fact the drone tried to block, it didn't actually get to block, so we're actually going to get a fairly normal opening. Absolutely. And, I mean, this drone is quite adventurous, isn't it? Absolutely is quite adventurous getting a real good look in the base and i mean you, you, if you tuned in right now you're like wait there's a drone in my base like this <laughs> yeah. is it's, oh, it's oh, of course it's fly it's fine once you see the player names anything is uh acceptable you know absolutely absolutely all right drone finally goes down now all things said and done we have a zerg on two bases probably going to take his third soon Zergling speed on the way as well. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Yeah, Link Speed Twilight Council from Gung Fu straight up this time, so immediate Twilight. Honestly, I don't hate it. I think Glaives can do very well against Bly. Because Bly's build is not like super efficient. So like solid Glaives <laughs> timing can be really good. 
I, I like how you just spit that out. It was like Blaze could be good against him because his build is pretty bad. <laughs> that's what that's what that's what everyone used to tell me, man. They used to tell me all the pros were like, yeah, well, when we play Bly, we see whether his builds are good enough on the day. So we play Glaive's game one, and if it kills him, we just keep killing him. And if not, you know, then we'll play something else. But I, I was thinking, like, in in my head, like. Any build is probably quite good against Bly, but then you try all of them and it's like, <laughs> damn, you made a lot of units. Like, it didn't work out, you know? So it's kind of That's problematic, true. but <clears throat> four gate glaive, that is absolutely a uh, a kicker in this kind of situation. Like, no Roach Warren on the way just yet. No Roach as well, right? That's true. That's true. So it's just going to be the Adepts moving across the other side. That old Lord just chilling there, keeping an eye on everything. If he sees more Adepts, he'll know what's up. The Adept's currently warping into the main base as the Stalker will punch that Overlord back over to the high ground at the very least. Okay, Roach Warren just started here. Now, in terms of, like, magic Zerg numbers, you want to get it, like, before you go up to, like, 40 drones. So it's still in time to deal with this. Double Stargate behind it. Time oh. Machine Day, I tell you. We've seen some wacky old-school builds today, haven't we? Yeah. I saw, like, um... this. this did this i think stats did this yesterday in ESL open Cup Korea. yeah i mean stats was the one of the first guys pioneering this kind of stuff yeah no oh, he... and that was so long ago by the way so cool to see stats after having like you know that kind of eat where he made it which was a bit of a surprise then it's like yo boys top four gsl <laughs> yeah. <what up?" laughs> yeah he's like by the way i'm really good now we're like what <laughs> he's like no i'm really good <laughs> i really came yeah, out of nowhere so cool all right, lots of adepts coming across the map. Plus one Phoenix on the go here. This is just so cool. These adepts going to shade in the corner, but now there's going to be roaches out. So, I mean, you're going to fight, trade, try and be annoying as possible. Then the Phoenix want to show up. And obviously the Phoenix can help you against roaches as well because they can lift up a good chunk of those roaches and take them out. So, that's a cool little factor, cool little idea. <clears throat> this is definitely annoying. I mean... Even just the lost mining time, they're constantly bleeding out units, and oh my goodness, like machine guns taking out all these drones, and Jeez. really good target fire out of Gung Fu, actually. 12 drones killed, and now the Phoenix reveal themselves, by the way, to kill off the Overlord, so they are already going to reveal themselves, we're going to get a few more up, Let's see how many he's going to end up building. Absolutely, this, uh... Ho, 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 ho. Uh, like, even if Bly was to go across the map, like, the Phoenix number's gonna get high, and, like, you need a lot of roaches to just, like, win that war of attrition against the Phoenix that's just lifting everything up. I think Bly is hoping that Gung Fu overreacts to this. But, uh, I mean, these, these Phoenix do need to greet those roaches at some point or another. Yes, the, the Phoenix is just going to knock this Overlord. Yeah, the, I, I feel like you absolutely need the Phoenix to be part of the defense because you, there's nothing else that's good at defending against Roaches right now. Phoenix do spot the Roaches there, and Bly's going to back it up. So for the moment, I'm going to slow it down and chill. Okay, okay. Comes back home. So I don't think Bly really got the response that he wanted, unless if he just wanted these Phoenix to go back home to kill his units. But that doesn't seem like the best response to hope for. No, not really. <laughs> as now we're going to uh -oh, lose uh -oh. our Phoenix to the Queens as well. We fly down too close to the sun. And the Queens do get a kill as Bly moves into the Hydra Den. So Hydra Den on the way. 11 more drones to really extend that worker lead. And just going through attempting to get to a third base. That's where we sit here seven minutes into game three of this series. It actually takes a lot of Hydras to deal with this number of Phoenix. Mm -hmm. Like uh, quite, quite a lot. Because I mean, the Phoenix do deal with them very, very decently. Um... But yeah, it's going to be a lot of adepts as well. And the Roach count has been five on the field. It's not as if he has a super counter to all these adepts either. Uh, Roach count looking very, or rather, drone count looking very good for Bly this game. And Gung Fu's third, still not yet up. It's about to finish right about now. But still, that's a long time without good economy. Yeah, it really is. Three drones going down. The Phoenix going to go up around the back is. See yeah, our Roach is fighting. Six drones going down. Seven, eight, nine. Okay, well, the Phoenix absolutely putting a hurt on the Bly economy, so that works. And the Fear Deb's going to stay active too. We're just going to try and replace these drones as Bly is already re droning here. The Phoenix will get rid of some of these overlords as well. And nice again, Phoenix micro. Yeah, going to be able to pull all the hurt ones back, right? So great job by Gunk. We love what he's doing with the Phoenix. 
He's playing really good, actually. Like, um, he's doing a good job pulling the injured ones away back at home as well. He's evolving with his tech, getting a good army online. And again, these Hydras that are going to pop out, kind of all over the shop. These Phoenix are making real work out of Bly's base. Like, this is not the kind of game you want to be playing. And Phoenix, if there's one thing they want, it's tempo. And it's this kind of game where you can just keep bouncing around, keep having a good time. The only thing they have to do now is wait for a bit more energy and just go, go, go all over again. Yep, and they got to start doing that. 23 drones dead currently. I mean, you just keep going. As, uh... Tunneling claws and burrow. Yeah, I mean, it's the Bly move, man. <laughs> uh, just going to try and find ways to make stuff happen, but... I mean, I love what Gung Fu's doing, right? Tons of Immortals, so he's going to be very safe against the heavier Roach Count. The Phoenix can lift up below the Hydras during these fights as well. Right now, it feels difficult to imagine where Bly's going to take this army. Because investing, to me, like Burrow and Tunneling Claws, right now, to me, that kind of feels as though it's just not going to do enough. So, mm. I'm not loving I'm not loving that, versus, like, if you went for the Infestation bit straight away <laughs> and had that, you know, up a bit sooner, I would have liked that a lot more. Yeah, this this is definitely a nice game for Gung Fu to be in at this point. I mean, this army does pack a punch, but it's also fairly flimsy. Like, if he gets overwhelmed, but I say that, there's nine hives on field, two roaches. That's his army over there dealing with that Adept from by. Like, this fourth base is forfeit against this. And that Phoenix count, I'm not sure how many's lost this game. Keeping them alive is a really big deal. 47 drones have fallen this game. That's quite the number, isn't it? <clears throat> That's a lot of workers to be losing over the course of this. Now 48. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a tough game for Bly. Resources lost is where it uh, needs to be for Gung Fu. And like I say, he's had plenty of time to set up the transition behind it. Just the immortal count keeps growing. We're already up to six immortals on the map. So those numbers looking great. Question now, I guess, does Gung Fu ever want to kind of go across the map and be the aggressor? Or is he very happy just sitting back and chilling and letting Bly maybe attack into him? And if, if that's the case, does Bly attack into him? I mean, he, he's seen that his opponent has Burrow. Whether he's been looking at these roaches for these spikes appearing is another story. And I mean, you have to be pretty spot on with seeing this little shroud in the floor moving. But I think Bly is going to get away with a lot here because they... That's a fairly hefty number of roaches. I mean, an immortal, oh, a couple yeah. of immortals. No. Wow, they showed up at perfect time, revealed themselves. <laughs> that was the worst case scenario. Yeah, that was the worst thing Black could have done right there. <laughs> oh, that was actually just very unfortunate because he, he probably just was like, right, I'm going to pop him up now. And then he's like, oh, no, the immortal. And it was just too late. And then he's revealed them. And yeah, now this gets dealt with much more easily. The immortal is uh, having a bit of a derp out on Dancing. the Twilight. Yeah, he's having a dance. Yeah, that, that was Roddy in the club right there. Uh, okay, Bly is... Moving across with an Infestor, a single Infestor. So that's got a big job on its hands. I mean, even if you fungal this army, what do you do? Not well, much. I guess you just absolutely get plonked on. <laughs> you get plonked on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was the most optimistic Infestor of all time. It's like, yeah, fungal. Oh, damn, I, I died. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much what happened, right? Like, it, it just did not work out well at all. That's uh, just kind of sad, honestly, huh? Oh, wait, he's getting corruptors. Is hmm. he going? For, does he have a, a hive? Okay, there is a, there is a hive. No great aspire on the way. I mean, even if he did go for that, though, I mean, I, I I'm curious, curious. Yes, is the hydras going to get a couple shots off? Phoenix takes some damage. The zealots are going to get some shots in. Just seeing the, uh, well, I mean, this big army of Gung Fu, to me, I just don't think loses a fight. And the fact it's across the map now is obviously a very good sign if that's how I'm feeling. He's going to move up through the center with the majority of it. He'll have a few Zelda go up the left-hand side. I mean, there's a lot of Hydras, but man, that is a chunk of Immortals. There's Phoenix to lift up a whole bunch of units here as well. So if you just lift the Hydras up, you take the DPS out of this. Gung Fu Bando is going to come smacking through this army. And as you can see, we are just going to continue to punch all the way through. And uh, Gung Fu wins this fight very convincingly. Yeah, I mean, that Infestor earlier didn't really get its job done. It felt like a bit of a Rainer Infestor when he makes one. And he's like, look, guys, I still lose while making an Infestor. And it's just... But the riding was on the wall, wasn't it? I mean, Gung Fu just played a really, really solid game. And honestly, I do think... I, I was a bit surprised Bly won the first game in the way that he did. But it really felt like that little break that Gung Fu had. 
everything he did from that point on. Oh, it gives him a single G as well. <laughs> oh, I love it. The back and forth Gs. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. That is going to be the wrap up on the day. Gung Fu Bandit gets the 2 1 victory over Bly. Congratulations to him. Because uh, again, all of these matches today, everything that we saw over the past uh, seven hours, seven and a half hours, was all players at one and one. So all of these matches super important because it means that the next time they play, they're either playing to qualify to playoffs or playing to try and stay alive in the tournament. So it's a massive difference. And uh, yeah, a lot of people did secure those two ones. We, like you said, Ben, just kind of at the start of this series, it has been a very kind of a day full of expectations, right? We've seen a lot of matches where we're just like, yeah, you know what? That's kind of what we thought it would be. It really has. Like, I, I think a lot of players have played absolutely true to their styles. Uh, fortunately, I didn't see anybody, like, flop, you know? Like, there was, there was definitely some uh, scrappiness going on here and there, but it just made for a lot of fun games. Like, that young Yakov Akron series was really cool. Um, but in general, we've just seen people rise to the occasion as opposed to fall uh, under the pressure. And that's always good StarCraft to me. Yeah, no, it's been, uh, it's been really nice to see uh, a lot of that kind of coming through and everything, so... Yeah, big fan, big fan, and uh, happy to see that we will have more great games tomorrow, of course, as we come back tomorrow with even more action once again. So, absolutely excited for all of that. Should be another full day of games. So, make sure you tune in for that. Uh, I'll come back to us for a moment. So, yeah, tomorrow I think we're going to have a lot of the winners and elimination matches. So, we're going to send some players to playoffs, we're going to send some players home. That's going to be true across Asia and then Europe. It's the same schedule four best of threes from Asia. And then eight best of threes from Europe. It's going to be me. It's going to be Ben. It's basically just a redux of today. But more great games of StarCraft 2. Any highlights, Ben? Anything you want to say before I do some sponsors and wrap us up? I was going to say something about Pidgey. But no, no, no. It's uh, been a great day. Look forward to uh, casting more tomorrow as well with you. All right, matey. Well, we do just have a quick shout out to our sponsors, of course. Let's hop on over to the scene. And you can say thank you to Blizzard Entertainment, Monster Energy, US Air Force, and ESL Shop, of course. And of course, as well, do not forget that this is all building up to DreamHack in Dallas, where the offline finals will be. You can check out your ticket uh, purchasing options at DreamHack.com dom, dom? <laughs> dreamhack <laughs> slash Dallas slash tickets. You get 15% off with the code StarCraft. So make sure you do that, get your tickets, and book yourself in to be at the offline finals. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. We will see you tomorrow for once again a full day of StarCraft 2 as we continue with week two of the ESL SC2 Masters Regional Spring. We'll see you there.